Welcome back to the Asia League for Playday 5. Things are starting to shape up in a, I would say, predictable manner. Bleed currently uh, out on top. Zero losses, four wins, and probably looking to keep it that way for the remainder of the season, whereas it's a little bit of a dogfight in the middle. Let's welcome in two analysts uh, that... Hang on a second. You guys look quite familiar. Is that... Did you guys... Oh, wait. You guys are Jake and Guz from the Jake and Guz show. Oh, God. Yeah. Oh, wow. Guz. Is Jake so pretending nice to be to frozen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for it. I was waiting right, for it. You're yeah. looking very good today, uh, Rob, by the way. I just thought I'd let you know. Oh, really? I think it's, what is it? Is it the... I think it's the lighting. Yeah, I think it might be the camera lighting. Quality. Yeah, well, camera camera quality diff when uh, Wait, Jake's did you get got haircut, RGBs Jake? in the back. Oh, no, it has. Oh. Look at him. Oh, he's he... fresh. I, I thought he went to mute for a second. Oh, magic, look. <laughs> <laughs> Also, the sides are looking very clean. I like nah. that. I keep it Sorry. that way. But uh, what isn't looking clean is the mid pack of the uh, league <laughs> at the moment, gentlemen. Things have uh, things have got a little bit muddy. That's for damn sure. Currently, as it stands, bleed are all but locked in for playoffs. I believe Liquipedia has them as lo as locked in. I don't know whether that's fully true yeah, or they not. Are. Um, yeah. There you go. Well, uh, that's the magic of it. That's why I don't question uh, I don't question those better than me. But <laughs> Elevate are really just on the outside of the moment of locking themselves in. I, I think after tonight, guys, we'll have a very good idea. Yeah, um, I think there's definitely permutations to play out as to the top two. That's probably where there's a little bit more variation in terms of uh, what we're expecting after tonight. Um, top six for most teams will be pretty cut and dry. Um, but again, it's going to be reliant on the results tonight. Um, the matches for this evening should be relatively predictable. Um, yeah. So it'd be intriguing to see how the standings shape up after that. You know, probably the only thing I would actually... Uh, I, I don't generally do this, but uh, probably the thing that's worth dragging attention to is uh, Bleed's round differential at the moment. They are on four wins, zero losses, and zero OTs. However, Jolita, who have lost a game and gone OT, are only two rounds off of their exact mark. And I think that, that might just go to show where Bleed are at at the moment. They're obviously still convincing, uh, but there is still, you know, an element left to be desired a little bit in their gameplay. Xenox, is there any uh, any outlier here that you wish to talk about? Yeah, no outlier. I think the season so far in the Asia League has played out and panned out as expected, uh, mm -hmm. where you've got the bottom three essentially consisting of Daystar plus the two South Asia teams. Realistically, I know it looks maybe bad for, for Daystar right now being in the bottom two, but knock-knock, their next three games now are against Direwolves, 
then they've got Fury, and then they've got Jolita. Now, those are not going to be easy. The good news for Daystar is they still get to play Hasib Warriors. That's not going to be tonight. Tonight, they play Fury, but tomorrow night, they play Hasib. Win that, you're probably in to the playoffs. And then we see the South Asian teams get knocked out, as expected. Bleed, top, as expected. Then you have that log jam of Diwals, Fury, Jolita, and Elevate. And that's really just, you know, put a name in a hat, pull one out, and you, you can't really make an argument. No, and again, really prudent to note heading into uh, the last three play days for Fury. They play both Southeast Asian, uh, sorry, South Asian teams, and they actually versus Daystar. So the bottom three teams in the league is what Fury have in front of them. So you could say that their uh, that their points right now are diluted a little bit, but still two losses would not be great for them uh, given where we thought they were coming into this stage. Let's go ahead and start talking about tonight's games because ultimately these might start to shape up uh, much of the conversation. We start off with Fury and Daystar, uh, which, whichever way you lean on that one, I think it will actually be somewhat of an interesting game given where Fury is at at the moment. But then probably the, the match of the day. I mean, it's not even probably, guys. It's, it's absolutely match two. Yeah, match two is shaping up to be a real intriguing bleed. If they do win that game, pretty much 99% confirm their spot in the top two. So that's a really important game for them. Jolita, on the other hand, again, an important game for them to pretty much secure top six. They're pretty much already at this point, but uh, yeah. a, a result tonight would pretty much go a long way for confirming that. And you can excited to see where the two match up. Um, other matches that stand out, uh, it's kind of hard. The other three are, are <laughs> relatively one-sided. I will say though, that match three of the night has the potential to actually be quite competitive. Knock Knock have had some really good moments moments so far in stage one they haven't been able to necessarily convert that into longer term you think about the bleed game for example where they started off well and then petered out but i think against a direwolves who haven't been at full strength there's every world in which match three is actually quite competitive that was, that was well, a sip by the way not knock knock what i'm not even gonna speak knock knock versus oh is that his sib on border against bleed? Yep. okay my apologies i take that point back but I think my overall, my <laughs> overarching argument that Knock Knock have had good moments definitely does <laughs> ring true. It's you interesting because I was, I was a, a literally about to say the last two games for me should be the most one-sided ones because every yeah. single time, um, for those unfamiliar, it's Knock Knock and Hasib. They play the, the latter two games. I don't know if that's time zone issues or, or whatever, but they're always on for those later two games. 7-0, 7-3, 7-2, 7-3, 7-4, 7-1, 7-4. You yeah. get the picture. The, the only game that actually went to 7-5 for our last two matches, uh, match three and four, was Knock Knock versus Hasib Warriors when it went to 7-5. <laughs> and, and in fact, in total, we've only had one overtime this entire stage, and that was play day one, game one. So after that initial game between Jolita and Fury, every other game has finished in regulation. I'm not expecting that to change tonight, except maybe the Jolita bleed game. For me, Diables versus, versus Knock Knock, Gus trying to play devil's advocate, and, and rightfully so. I don't think South Asia has been horrendous, but unfortunately for Knock Knock, you know, they got beaten pretty comprehensively by bleed last week on Chalet. They really weren't all that much of a contest. They beat Hasid, expected to do that, but they lost to Daystar and they got 7-1 by Elevate. So Daystar for me has got to be the metric for South Asia teams. Hasib and Knock Knock, what are they like against Daystar? Well, they lost pretty pretty badly back on play day two. So that means yeah. that they're in a bit of a bad spot. Hasib versus Elevate, I think Elevate in a really good position. They destroyed Daystar last week, 7-1, bouncing back from their 07 loss to Fury. So I don't really envision those last two games to be close. I'd be very surprised that there's an upset there. And you obviously mentioned the OT at the very start of the play days uh, all the way back, Fury and Jolita. So who knows, Jolita might be in for upsetting the top two teams of the region at the moment. Let's go ahead and start talking about predictions because that's always a little bit of fun. I think it's really... It, it, you need to know that the Asia League is a little more decisive, uh, I feel like, than maybe I expected. I feel like games have definitely, as you've mentioned, Xenox has only won overtime in the entirety of the four play days that we've had so far. Put that down to, you know, teams either, you know, maybe underperforming or maybe some teams just... ...decisive league thus far, and I think that it will continue to pan out that way, given the teams and, and where they are. Yeah, uh, and so I, I know you you kind of throw your predictions a little bit in Asia League and clearly Rob and for, for fun and to, <laughs> to separate. But I think from dev to audience, you can clearly see there's one way 
sightedness in terms of our predictions tonight for a reason. I mean, these are dead set favored games versus, you know, and maybe the, the Jalita one, if you really wanted to be a little bit cheeky, try and get some good channel point ratio, that's the one I would suggest. Hey, Jalita on their best night could pull it off, but you would need bleed to be 10, 15% off. They go into that definitely as the favorites, but yeah, yeah. hard to envision South Asia getting a win tonight and Fury yeah. uh, should be far too good for Daystar. And you brought up the good point, Rob, as well. Like the last three games for Fury are in, honestly, they're going to be favorites in all three. They should be winning all three and that would set yeah. them nicely for, for the second seed. Yeah, absolutely. I, look, I, again, it, if if you continue to to follow the trend of what Asia has shown us so far uh, in the first four play days, then obviously things are going to pan out somewhat convincingly. But there is always that element uh, in in just APAC in general. You don't really know what team is going to uh, what team is going to show up on the day because. We've seen it before, and we may well see it again. A team that, unfortunately, hasn't had the greatest start, Fury. They have gone 2-2, two and two, whether you want to read into the overtime loss or not. They have not been as sharp as, I guess, we had once hoped, uh, Mr. Guz. But I still feel as though they've got well and truly the power to, to push through this and end top two. Yeah, for sure. Again, this is another game where we go in with the expectation that Fury should be fairly dominant. Um, they have, though, as you mentioned, had a couple of intriguing results throughout this stage thus far. Losing to Jalita and play day number one um, was a little bit concerning. We tried to brush that off. Unfortunately, they couldn't match Bleed either, but we know how good Bleed are currently. Um, yeah. As far back as the last play day, again, another very close result, although they were able to to get it over the line um, against Diwals. And also important to note that they actually had their coach standing in for that particular game. So we were actually gravely concerned that Fury could lose some more critical points in that matchup, which wouldn't bode well for their top two chance. Fortunately, though, they got all three in that game, which goes back to my prior point of maybe Diwals not really being up to par so far. Keeps them in that top two discussion and a regulation win tonight um, gives them about a one in three chance. So an important game to make sure they just get it cleanly done because if they do push to OT and still win, it does diminish their chances by quite a bit for that first buy in the playoff bracket. Honestly, that's probably the only part of this conversation I think that really has legs to it, Jake, is, is ensuring that Fury actually get all points from this and that it's convincing. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'll be honest, they can win and win ugly, and I wouldn't be too worried considering the games that they've got to close, Knock Knock and then Hasib Warriors, right? So you could have a bit of a poor night tonight, win 7-4, 7-5, maybe you don't play your best. I wouldn't be largely concerned going into the playoffs, provided they end sure. up in the second seed. They get to then play a best of three against anyone but bleed win that then you're in the grand final then you're probably well primed but yeah i mean you want to be winning and you want to be winning well and i think that mm. um speaks for pretty much every single team for them they got that big response over the last uh two play days when they took down elevate 7-0 and die wall 7-5 because yeah at the start losing to jalita then losing to bleed there was a, a question marks over this fury roster and whether or not they were going to be regarded as that second team and i i think that they should rightfully be probably leading that conversation once again when you take into account who they've beaten and who they've got ahead of them Absolutely. Well, who they've beaten, who they've got ahead of them. Unfortunately for them, it's Daystar today. I say unfortunately for them. I just like to, I, honestly, I, I, I ride this team. I'm, I'm all the way. I'm right or die with this team, Michael. I don't know why. I don't know what it is about Daystar. It, <laughs> it's just got me excited. I mean, look, to be fair, three players in the positive for EPS. When you look at, they're the, they're the second last team in the league. Fury, I think, only had one player above a standard 100 EPS. I don't know if that's reading too far into it, but this team still had, a, I, I guess, a decent showing. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely important to contextualize those numbers, right? Because Daystar had relatively close results week one and week two. They were both seven fours, one against them and one four. Um, in the last week, it fell apart quite dramatically. They had the one seven loss against Jalita and then backed that up with another one seven loss to elevate so it's pretty surprising to see their stats are inflated as high as they are three players above 100 eps considering they've had quite one-sided affairs um is a little bit perplexing to be completely honest um obviously they hijack and um are, uh, far behind mark at the moment unfortunately so we need to see they start collect themselves as a unit but they have shown, I think, um, you know, some good resilience throughout the stage. And that it was always going to be tough for them. They've been thrown into the deep end a little bit here in Asia. And it's a learning experience for them. And <laughs> yeah. tonight is going to be another good test stop. Yeah, by the way, always Jack. So six-man roster for Daystar. We've seen Jack and Cotley. Uh, Jack was last week, I think, if I recall correctly. And uh, didn't have the best of starts, admittedly. Um, I'm not too sure exactly the reason regarding you know whether they swap in due to performance based or whether it's like IRL issues but 
Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting for KZB, Neon, and Moomerins that they're all above that 1.0 rating or 100 EPS. What's even more interesting is Neon actually has a plus 5 entry as well, 8 and 3. So it's not as if he's just 5-0. He's also getting amongst it. The biggest issue for Daystar is they just don't survive. I think I mentioned this last week, but their survival rates are like 16% across yeah. the board. And so, therefore, they're not really ever going to be in a lot of winning positions because they're just not winning rounds comfortably if they're winning they're winning like clutches they're winning 1vx's and so therefore is that something you can do consistently probably not you're just entirely relying on these guys to pop off here or there and as a collective team i, I think for daystar the biggest thing they can try and improve on tonight is uh survivability play until the end of the rounds have numbers up otherwise if you're losing players early on you you're just going to fall apart yeah and guys your uh your head to head for tonight i9 versus kzb what's the thought yeah, I mean, I was just looking at uh, primarily played operators, and as you can see, uh, both I9 and KZB playing vert both on attack and ugly defense as well with the Solus um, on that half. And you can see they're actually quite evenly matched in that regard. Um, KZB actually edging out with cost, so a little bit more consistent. 55% for I9 is a little bit concerning. Now, obviously on that vert roll, you can alleviate some of that pressure because you're doing other work elsewhere. That doesn't necessarily show up on the scoreboard, but yeah, we'll be keeping an eye on these two. Again, they're not really going to be the big star players in the match, but the groundwork that they're able to achieve can be quite important and in fact actually for kzb at least on siege gg rating he actually is leading his team at the moment so yeah. he'll probably be a little bit more influential than i9 in this match but yeah certainly keeping an eye on both of them going head to head and just a reminder throwing back to uh week one for those that were here and watching kzb actually started out quite horribly to the stage <laughs> didn't really get uh going in their first play day but uh we did have word from behind the scenes that kzb will be the player to look out for going ahead for daystar maybe just you know nerves it you do play against some of the biggest teams that uh you really have in asia so this is a uh, a great opportunity to go up against one of the greatest in i9 let's go ahead and start talking about the vetoes jake i mean realistically again i, I don't know if i want to sugarcoat it too much but i don't know if it matters what map we really go to fury will have the favor yeah, I mean, potentially, Fury's loss is coming, though, on Oregon Skyscraper leads me to believe I think they're going to get to something a bit more open. And, it, well, I don't think that is the case. We do go to Skyscraper, so redemption time. In fairness, they did lose this out to Bleed of all teams and actually found three attacking rounds in the first half against Bleed. Looked good to begin, did Fury. So maybe a chance of redemption for them. Um, Bank got banned out first, by the way, as that's a map we have not seen so far in the Asia League. The only other one is actually Night Haven Labs, also banned out by fury so i'm not sure if that's a case of poor map pull or just wanting to hide particular maps uh for two maps i guess uh, yeah it's region wide um but yeah so far it's been the chalet show six times play we get it banned out at the last second by daystar uh we'll head to skyscraper which will now after this game be the second most played map for three plays <laughs> yeah, which is wild because Chalet is just so far ahead of the actual meta at the moment in Asia. It's six times uh, we've seen that over the last four play days. It just, we can't get away from it. Guys, uh, concerning signs at all? Um, I mean, the only thing I'll note is that Daystar, again, those last two losses that they had, the 1-7 backed up um, by the other 1-7, Jolita Elevate, they both took place on Chalet. And in fact, the game before all of those, their only win for the stage that thus far was back on Skyscraper. As mentioned, though, you guys contextualized it pretty well. Both maps are very, very popular here in Asia, so it probably doesn't uh, subvert expectations all that much. I will just note, though, KZB listed as MVP in that matchup, so expecting him to do well here on Skyscraper. All right, well, we are ready to rumble. We'll go across to Devin Manny to run you through Skyscraper. Hello and welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Rob. Yes, this should be a real solid game, but a tough one for Daystar. Mandy, there's no doubt that Yuri are the favoured team here, the back-to-back -back champions from last year. Their form hasn't been fantastic. They could potentially ride and cruise a fair few easier matches throughout the rest of their stage in order to guarantee themselves the top six, but that remains to be seen. As for Daystar, just looking for their first big win over one of these big top teams. Of course, they've only got a single win thus far uh, over Knock Knock, but taking down Fury here would be an amazing upset for Daystar. Yeah, absolutely. I think Daystar have just had this goal of coming into the league and trying to look as competitive as possible. Um, at the moment, it hasn't really shown that much on the scoreboard, but I think they've got some good ideas cooking in the backgrounds. But honestly, I think the desk has phrased it pretty well for Fury. It's 
pretty hard in this league if you're not one of the top four teams to not qualify for playoffs. It is a rather um, evenly split league right down the middle of your top four teams and your bottom four teams. And I think the distinction is quite clear. So for Fury at this stage to not be able to make playoffs, I think it would be pretty shocking. Yeah, very true. But uh, a loss to Daystar here would certainly make things difficult. Fury started their reprisal in this stage with their 7-0 over Elevate just last week. Then they got a good 7-5 over Direwolves. Uh, last week was hell in a cell for Daystar, though. Two 7-1 losses to Jolita and Elevate, and this game is not going to be too much easier. Uh, however, starting on attack, I don't know. Historically, you would say that that would make things even more difficult for Daystar. That said, Mandy, I had a look at the stats for Skyscraper in Asia League so far, and it's actually a dead 50-50. That is with a fairly small sample size of only 22 rounds, but I would like to have some hope for Daystar here on Skyscraper. Of course, they did take down Knock Knock on this map, and let's see if they have done their prep to take down Fury. I'm trying to think realistically for Daystar, what's their opportunity looking like to actually make that top six and then go into playoffs? And I think it's fairly possible for them in this stage. They're currently sitting in that sixth place position, as I understand it. Um, not only that, but they've got her Seed Warriors at some point during the last couple of play days as well. I think it's the second last to last play day that they've got them. So I think there's certainly this opportunity here for Daystar to try and collect up that sixth place. And I think in these matches like this against Fury, which are such titans of the region for these guys, it's probably going to be more about closing the gap in the round difference than it is about claiming the win. If they can claim a win here, it would be pretty miraculous yeah, and amazing, especially that. against Fury, um, who are, of course, SI attendees. But I think realistically for Daystar, it's continuing to be focused on the process and trying to look competitive. Yeah, very much. Well, we know Skyscraper is a solid map for them, and for Fury, kind of the opposite. Uh, of course, Fury have lost this map, but uh, as Jake said on the desk, Fury had a really solid go of Skyscraper against Bleed. Even though they're only won four rounds, they looked very solid in that game. Now, Fury starting on the defense. Actually, going to change things up a little bit, Mandy. We usually see Tyrion Karaoke first up. It's Exhibition Office to kick things off. And, uh, well, the Azami's been banned out. The Fenry has been banned out. So it does restrict a lot of the very powerful operators on this map. But the Mira has made her appearance. Despite getting a little bit of a nerf at the end of last year, she seems to be as popular as ever. I think she's still part of that, like, pool of really strong defenders where uh, as long as you have it and you still need to bring something on the attacks to deal with it. Now yes, you don't necessarily need to bring in a ranged hard reach anymore, you can just bring along one of the operators that can drill into a wall like an Ash or a Kali uh, or something like that to go and deal with it. But yeah, I feel like Mira in her instance, even though she has been nerfed, is a little bit more consistent to deal with and that's about it really, it's still worth bringing along. It doesn't look like Fury have gone for that much of an extension across the map in terms of roaming. They're just sort of uh, sitting back on the bomb site, playing the trick game off the back of I-9 on the Bandit. Not only that, but they've got the Mew to go and support that as well. And that's going to allow Daystar all this control over from the other side of the map. Now, the Monty is going to help out a lot in this scenario because it means those long lines of sight aren't going to be as good for the defense, especially when you've got a big Monty shield protecting you. And that's where Crit J is currently sitting at the moment, trying to capitalize on those angles. Crit J does have that Elamine still in pocket. He comes across that Monty. Seems like there's been a solid read here for Fury. They've moved some of their util. Here comes the first Elamine. It does knock hijack shit away for a brief moment. And he gets funneled into a goo mine as well. So yeah, here's another goo. Quite awkward for him, really. A lot of traps to slow him down. And this has been quite a slow push. Critche now changing a reinforcement. Reinforcing over that rotate. And Geisha, and here come the initial picks. Dark and BG, man. Find both of theirs. No response as of yet from Daystar as the man advantage is now furthered. Finally, something for Neon, but he will need to do a lot more than that. He's really feeling the pressure. All these angles available to the defense. Momo does find one pick below and looks to regroup now. But things are not looking too hot here for Daystar. 2v3, though, is potentially possible. A bit of vertical play from the Bark. Hard to see how Daystar get back into this. And realistically, with Momo looking for this lurk, it needs to be on the back of some kind of, of frag. And really, it's on Fury to make sure they're not giving up any ones. The Fuser is still outside on that balcony. I don't think either of these Daystar players will get into position to be able to fetch that and look for a plant. As the Bulletproof camera pings out Momo's location, 
This is very awkward. Of course, a mirror window stopping him from moving any further forward. I got to feel like this round is all but over. 25 seconds to play as Fury can simply wait for the onslaught to come through. They start desperately looking for something, but no kills will be gifted. No unnecessary plays from the Fury roster. And EMP is not going to deal damage, and Fury will not be baited. What a crossfire. Three ways from Fury and Critch A farms the final players. In the end of the day, it was quite a formal and easy round for Fury. All right, yeah, there we go. Solid one for Fury there on the defense. I think just holding out onto the bomb site, Daystar, I think, taking a lot of time to go in for the sweep across the map. And then by the time they actually had hit the bomb site, uh, they struggled a lot at getting themselves back in again. I think you might have lost me there for a little bit, Dev. But I alas, did. Are I you am back? back on the broadcast. Yeah, we are all good now, I think. So, yeah. cool, awesome. Yeah, I Love think that. Fury looked pretty solid in that one. I think by the time that the Monty had actually made his yeah, way in towards the bomb site, there was just such a lack of time for them to be able to capitalize on the sweep. It ended up being pretty one dimensional in the end. Uh, they just needed to hold on to the crosses coming over from that dragon and terrace side of the map. It's pretty easy crossfire when it's pretty linear attack. And I think ultimately for Fury, they looked very comfortable in that defense. Yeah. Indeed. I wonder if the Monty is going to be a regular occurrence. 20 seconds for it to be picked off of, and as I say that, Hijack decides to go at the Ace instead. I don't know how I feel about this Monty, Mandy. I, I love the shield rework. I love the way that it, it's really enabled very good Monty players to, to play it in a way that I think is a little bit less gambly compared to the old way where you yep. could like hit fire and stuff. But I don't know if I feel like it's the magic ingredient against Fury. Like The number of traps these guys are bringing is, uh, is so oppressive. Yeah, I don't know. I think I'd have to agree with you on that. I feel like Monty's got to be one of those tried and true, tested types of operators. You got to be playing a lot of scrims and uh, I think be really developed on that to play, you know, alongside of the intel that comes through. And I think for Daystar, in their experience and probably how long they've actually been playing at this tier one level, I think it can be a bit tricky to play around. Whereas I think for your more developed teams, it is a little easier to develop the ideas around it. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay, Lycolis is going to jump straight out onto Hijack, who I think was placing a Claymore down just not double window, and Lycolis must have heard him take him out, and yeah, absolutely just went for that jump out. Yeah, the wow. Claymore activating after he did that jump out. That is just so him funny. In the nick of time. That's pretty crazy from Lycolis. I can't believe he jumped in before the Claymore lasers activated, because that yeah. means that the Ace managed to like put down the Claymore, but there's like one second, half a second before the lasers activate. Puts down the Claymore, dies, and then Lycolis is already in before the lasers go out. That is just unreal. That is... I've, I've got to say, I'm loving the more aggressive Lycolis we've seen these last few playdays, right? Like, he even said it, it was the last game where they've had to play with a sub. He decided to just go all in and play hyper-aggressive. And it seems like Daystar are not ready for this. That was a long angle, actually, from BG, man, up above. Daystar are sadly looking just far outpaced at the moment in this game. It looks like Daystar wanted to go for something direct onto the bomb site here in karaoke and tea room, but it didn't quite work out for them. First of all, the jump out, not only that, but Neon trying to get control down below wasn't cautious enough of the vertical line of sight that BG men had from the hatch. Uh, not just that, but all the construction that's come down from the defense as well does mean that a lot of this ground floor isn't as safe as Daystar probably think it is. Nevertheless, Neon is going to be picked up and he is the buck, so he can make full use of that skeleton key. But with a lot of caution, right? Because I9 is here right on the other side. He's got a line of sight inside of uh, the room adjacent to him as well. And one onto the top of the back stairs. So it's pretty dangerous if die stuff. I9's in a great position. He's playing the perfect operator. He has been flashed out, though. Is there an opportunity to capitalize on the timing? It doesn't look like it. He can continue to use the smokes. Dark is also supporting, detonating that Vulcan canister at that external door. Time is bleeding. Daystar don't have a way to capitalize on this position of I-9. He's sitting there ready with SMG-11 in hand. Daystar looking very unknown as BG Man swings and finds another. I-9's now getting aggressive down below. He knows about this box position. Daystar have done just about nothing. Neon's gone down all up to KZB on the balcony. And uh, yeah, there ain't, no, ain't nothing that he can do. There's no chance. He's just out here. One versus five. Try and get at least one kill. Come on. Oh, there you go. There's the feed. At least he gets the KD up, but oh, that's dear. all he will fight. <laughs> Yuri can oh, very dear. easily win that on time. 
Yeah, well, yeah, solid one there for Fury. They completely shut down the idea that Daystar went for. Honestly, once again, they've looked comfortable two rounds in a row now on the defense of Skyscraper. That time around, Daystar tried to, tra tried to change things up. They didn't want to go for a sweep, instead trying to go for something more direct, but that was completely roll read uh, by Fury on the other side. They were totally ready for that off the back of the jump out, the vertical. They held on for a long time with the combination of the Goyos and the Smokes over on the back stairs as well, which of course, when you are doing a direct take, that is the main choke point for you to be able to translate your push from the ground floor upstairs again, right? So holding on to that power position for as long as they could, but the utility that was on board was really all that Fury needed to do to waste the time and secure the round. So Daystar, two rounds in, both of them have been pretty pitiful to be frank. What do they do with that tactical timeout? Obviously ED, their coach, uh, former captain of Direwolves from quite some time ago now, made his return. Uh, he will be speaking to the, the guys and I, I don't know, like I, where, do you, where to begin, Mandy? Because it's just so much was going wrong with Daystar. Like you're getting jumped out on, uh, you're getting shot through angles, through hatches that you're not aware of. There's so many minute things. It's not like Daystar can even get to the point of their planned push. That's a good question. That's a pretty early tactical time out to be taking as well. Now we know that ED is on the line there. And so they phoned in a friend and they've realized, okay, uh, we need some help. And in my opinion, for Daystar, this is probably attention to detail, I think is the big thing here. A lot of their ideas are like, you know, on like a big picture level, probably not that bad. But the execution of those ideas isn't done so well. And in a game like Rainbow Six, where if you're not paying a lot of attention and your execution isn't great, it can really punish you. Um, and I think, yeah, especially on a map like Skyscraper, where every step of the way of the attack, like literally every single stage of the attack is so tricky, you can't just be letting go of small details and making silly mistakes. So I think ED to go back and compose these guys again and say, just watch out, have a, a real think about what you're doing and being more cautious about it. It's probably important here for Daystar. Yeah, I think that'll benefit a lot particularly on this bomb site, right, Mandy? Because Fury have just won the two really defender side of bomb sites on this. Now they go to Kitchen Barbecue, historically. Very attacker side. It is the tertiary site after all. Day start, the way that you lose a round that's on a, a, an attacker favored bomb site is from like, aggression or, or being susceptible to those kinds of plays that we saw. Day start fall to last round. So if they can reel themselves in a little bit, they should, in theory, have a pretty solid chance this round, and they do need to build that momentum because you know, in the next two rounds, Fury are going to go back to the primary and secondary bomb sites. So in order to avoid like a 5-1 potential half, I think Daystar actually needs to capitalize on this tertiary bomb site. So they still look like they're changing their approach a little bit as well. So they, they haven't fully dedicated themselves to one side of the map or the other. It just looks like they're trying to probe uh, trying to probe out some of these weaknesses in the defense. So, for example, that Flores drone going out in the castle early on, all the way over in reception, that's going to allow a point of entry later on in the rounds once they go and translate their push into the ground floor. So what they're doing is just preparing themselves for the execute a little bit further in advance. Meanwhile, though, Momo Rin is going to repel himself up to the top floor. So it was Jack, so is the rest of the team. So they're going to try and converge on these remaining roamers in the top floor, try and flush them out of these vertical power positions before they can enter into the bomb site. Well, they know about this guy in karaoke. BG man here. Scope in hand. He knows that there's likely a play behind that Monsi. Critche is actually dancing around ready to support. Manages to get out of karaoke. So, seceding so some control, but still looking to hold on to this top floor. Critche seemingly aware of a lurk happening. I believe Momo Rin's moving from Samurai. I mean, I don't mind this from Daystar, but it's very slow. Like, all this control has been given up by Fury, and, and yet they still haven't capitalized yet. There's still a few players here on the top floor for Daystar if they want to try and deal with this. I like this backstab going on from Neon as well. I don't think they actually know that he's there, and he could be catching Critche off guard here, all the way in the back of Tea Room. There goes I-9, who's just been down from a cutoff all the way on the rappel on the ground floor, and that could potentially open up the bomb site here. Unfortunately for Daystar, though, they're starting to lose this roam game. Now, I-9 has been confirmed, and yes, there is a threat onto the bomb site. Hijack. Marches on in. There's a player upstairs watching karaoke. That'll deny any vertical angles. But what can BG Man do here? He can still potentially deny the plan through the vertical angles. He spots the Monty and takes him down. The diffuser on the ground. And things fall for Daystar. Another player hits the dirt. And finally Dark finishes the round off. Oh, Fury completely happy and satisfied with Daystar taking map control, taking the site because Fury can mop it up in a retake. 
I could see what the thought process was there for Daystar. They realized that they'd capitalized off getting a pick onto the ground floor inside of the bomb site. That was the only anchor that was there. And they thought, oh, cool, the bomb site's free now. It's unguarded. Let's just go for it. And not only that, but they'd managed to flush out the play inside of karaoke as well in the meantime. So that at that point, you're thinking that's a good opportunity for them to actually get uh, inside of the kitchen or inside of the room adjacent to the kitchen, rather, then go get the bomb down. But by the time they'd made that decision and made that happen, the rest of Fury were able to go back and retake inside of Karaoke and then play that line aside. So I like the way of thinking for Daystar, but probably not thinking a step far enough ahead. At that point, you probably need to leave someone upstairs, play that cutoff, actually anticipate that retake to come on through if you want that strategy to go and work and try and get the bomb down on that bomb site, right? But Fury finding a lot of space on the retake in the top floor essentially allowed them to just shut it down from above completely. Bullets are raining down from above, and it was all just over for Daystar. Yeah, and... I don't know, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, Mandy, but I don't know how Daystar get back into this. They've used their tactical timeout, they've attacked a tertiary bomb site. We need to see a radical change for them to have a shot here. Yes, yeah, Skyscraper's defender sided, but the stats don't lie. 50-50 so far in the Asia League. You really expect Daystar to have some success here, and now they're going and attacking Fury's best two bomb sites. In order to avoid a 5-1, they're going to have mm. to really fire up here, and I... Just haven't seen enough from them yet. Yeah, it's this I would, is probably yeah. one of their roughest games so far. I would hazard a guess. I I would have to agree with you on that, right? Like the maps that they've played before this, essentially like chalet, chalet, and chalet, right? So yeah. that's a completely different map to be attacking compared to skyscraper on chalet. It's one of the maps that you could argue is almost attacker sided because of how easy it is to get into the map. There are so many cutoffs that you can play. There's a lot of good entry points. Once you get in the map, hard breach is not like that much of a necessary evil. There's just a lot of options for the attack on Chalite, right? Whereas on Skyscraper, every single step of the way is challenging. There are not that many good entry points. Once you get inside of the building, so many choke points that are hard to cross over because a lot of the walls on the inside aren't destructible for soft breach. It's just, it's quite a challenging map in every single form. And for Daystar, starting out on the attack on Skyscraper, they just don't look very strong. And I think that Fury just feels so comfortable in the server right now. Yeah, you know how comfortable? Comfortable enough to do the full round the world tour and go to a fourth different bomb site in four rounds. So master bedroom and uh, bathroom has been chosen here in Daystar. Even then, like half the round is gone and they've made fairly humble progress thus far. We've got Jack on this lurk, but he has a drone ahead of him, but he's worried about a flank and I mean Fury is pretty much just battering down on the bomb site with a little bit of control above and Momo Rin's gone down. So I don't know what to say. Daystar... This is the bomb site you should be winning. If not Kitchen Barbecue, it's got to be here. Even the Lurks are being countered here by the Legion. I9 has found his one pick. Jack really needs to find a reply. This is a tough one here for Daystar. Yes, they've taken right up half the map, but this is the point where Skyscraper kind of comes into play and punishes you with all these really hard choke points to go and handle. I9 here is pretty safe in his position, and I don't think Daystar know that he's there. Meanwhile, oh wait, hang on, Critch is all the way in the top floor, he's just tried to retake Mercedes. That's pretty aggressive, KCB punishes him. After this round has been people pulling out goo mines, BG man does trade. Now BG is no longer covering I9, and there was a drone on I9, so... I don't know why Jack isn't just going for the swing. Because it looks like I9 is tempted to go for the flank, BG! He's come to support! Reload. It's a freebie! Oh, it just goes from bad to worse. The day start, two versus four. Neon has finally taken control above, but 20 seconds to go. And never mind, that control was a mere illusion. Dark is still hiding upstairs and finds him. Hijack is sitting outside the building, 14 seconds to go. And there has never been an inkling in this game that Daystar was looking like they could win a round. And now Fury have won four different bomb sites. Hijack, yeah, keep on farming that KD. It doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. Fury, lock in. The full tour, four different bomb sites, four convincing rounds one. It's pretty grim, isn't it, Dev? Hey, it's it's not looking good, especially in that last round. I felt like that last round was the most unconvincing one we've seen from Daystar so far. Yeah. At least in the round prior to that, it looks like Daystar had a plan and they were trying to execute it. In that last round, they looked pretty lost. And frankly, Fury just knew exactly what was going on. Now, whether it was Game Sense, whether it was Intel, or whatever it was, maybe the goo mines just telegraphed the entire round that you pointed out pretty astutely through the mid-rounds. Fury just knew exactly what was going on, and they feel so confident at the moment that it's just flowing through them, and they just decide to pick their battles against Jaystar, who just do not look ready at all for the re-aggression from Fury. Yeah, look, Fury are back into it. 
Remember the very first play that they were playing Shalita, they got match point and then lost 6-8 on Orokin. Like, that was a huge upset in its own right. Last year, Shalita, back when they were uh, under the no-cap uh, 6 banner, they really struggled. Um, it was quite uncharacteristic considering the pedigree of the players on that roster, and they took a win over Fury. We started to worry. We thought, oh, you know, is this not the Fury that would double back-to-back -back -to -back champions last year? And then they went and lost to Bleed as well. Now, that was a little bit less surprising, but still concerning based on the fact that Fury historically do have a pretty solid head-to-head -head against Bleed. We finally saw Fury get back in form, 7 0 Elevate. Now, a lot of people would have picked Elevate in that game. And they had a good win over Direwolves, and now this could be almost as a much of a convincing win as we saw in the Elevate game. Like, Fury uh, have not even broken a sweat as of yet, and Daystar, it's uh, grim signs. They've been 7-1, two play days in a row, and it looks like it could be a third. Yeah, I mean, my bro like Hollis is 4-0-0 at the moment. Like, that is pretty... Yeah, He's damn, gnarly, you know. this guy. This this guy is supposed to be your support player, sitting <laughs> on the bomb site, playing the anchor. He gets an attack, he plays Thermite. Lad is 4-0-0 right now. That's like, damn, that's a big change for Fury. And uh, yeah, everyone looks super comfortable at the moment. The only person going negative at the moment is I-9. It's probably because he's been the more aggressive player and it is allowing Daysar to get some exit frags late on in the round. But like, essentially, every single player of Fury right now just flowing with confidence. Yeah, here goes I-9 again, who uh, is looking for blood once again. Oh, I think he's just gone straight past the player. Theon is inside right. the bathroom, sitting right next to the bathtub on a drone, and he's just watched him go past him. I-9, brother not good <laughs> it's not good to be fair two of i9's deaths have been feeding in like 4v1s so that's what i'm I saying that's what i'm saying I, yeah it's he's given getting them a little bit exits. he's given them the <laughs> exit frags which might you know buffer a little bit of confidence like it's the only reason why kzb is currently going positive is because of exit frags but yeah that wasn't an exit frag that was an opening kill that i9 just got a little bit complacent um, but daystar have mostly like they haven't had very well-formed pushes. They have doing a lot of lurking and a lot of waiting for players to walk into their lines of sight. However, it is starting to work. Yeah, 5v3, a oh, lot of damage, but the shoddy does not confirm the kill on Lycolis. However, BG man's gone down. Lycolis cannot hold up, and Daystar finally win the first round of the match. Damn, they won one. That's exciting. Um, What did they do to win that one? It's a good question, just Dev. held down lines I... of sight and waited for players to walk into it. <laughs> Yes, I don't want to be too brutally honest about that, but Fury, mm. come on guys, you know, like, yeah, that's a bit ambitious, I think, to sit there on the ground floor and try and take the fights onto them straight away. Daystar are still players, and they can shoot back at you, believe it or not. So, um, yeah, I think Daystar have been essentially gifted that one, I think. Like, they found the two on the ground floor from then on out, it was pretty easy to translate it into the top floor as well. Uh, the one sole anchor in between the bomb sites. I think it was BG Man died on the bomb site in a crossfire as well. So, yeah, Daystar able to convert a man advantage. Honestly, pretty good. Pretty good. Very happy. Yeah. Oh, if they can keep that up, then that's great. Of course, the onus is on Fury to stop playing. So, I don't know what the word is. I, I don't know if I want to say aggressively. I just think that, like, you know, don't, don't make moves if you don't have to, Fury. Like, don't overcommit. Don't assume that there are. Uh, are not people sitting in a lot of these spots because Daystar really have just spent a lot of time like getting a player into the building and just like holding a line of sight or lurking around. And if Fury plays to kind of counter lurk a little bit more rather than playing into their hands, then Daystar will struggle because we haven't yet seen Daystar tested at like the actual like converting uh, like a 5v5 execute. We've only really seen them have success by, by lurking for picks. So at least for Daystar, it's the first round they found. It's the first little inkling, the glimmer of hope. Let's see if they can capitalize that and cap off the half with their second attack. Monty's an interesting idea to bring back for Hijack, especially with the, the prevalence of lesion at the moment. Uh, I'm a little nervous to see what Hijack is able to achieve with this one, but nevertheless, we'll see how it all pans out. It does look like they are looking to go for a direct in into this karaoke and tea room bomb site. Oh, is that a trick on the other side from BG Man? D why did only half that Selma go off? Oh, because the EMP reactivated. I mean, oh, like the what? EMP effect is down. So the, the baby EMPs only last, what what is it, like four seconds total? I'm not sure and exactly so how long they last. I, I actually yeah, can't remember the exact to... time. But by the time the second half of the Selma was going to go on the wall, it actually reactivated the bandit charge that had been baby EMP prior to that. So 
This is only a line of sight now for KCB. Now, if you want to make Monty work, you can't just have a line of sight. You need to have a walk-in hole. And with only one Selma charge left, it's a little tricky, which is probably why Hijack is completely rotated off that instead, and is going to go to the top of Bastos. There's a Vulcan canister here. There's a smoke. It's not easy. I9 is going to blow... Oh! Oh my god! I thought he was going to blow the Goyo, but it doesn't matter. He's blown Jack's head off. Now tempted to get aggressive on the Monty. Got to be careful here. The Monty can win the fight in a close range engagement. I9's gone down, but Dark is there to come and support. So, oh, jeez. Yeah, easy for Fury in the end. Good job getting nice and aggressive on that Monty. And poor Hijack was left all alone. Now it's a Momo Rin and KZB. And Fury are just having a laugh at the minute. Like, even tempted to get aggressive and swing this guy on the window again. Both of these Daystar players just looking for picks, but I don't expect they'll get much. Um, this is pretty grim to watch, Tev. I don't know what you think about this one, or whether you would agree or not, but it's pretty tough. It, it feels like at this point, Daystar are getting locked out of the map almost in its entirety. I mean, not being able to get walls open, not being able to make an entry. I don't actually think any one of these three players that have died on Daystar have actually died on the interior of the building, right? Or they've barely died on the interior of the building or something like that. So, yeah, I think for Fury, they just look in their element right now. They're willing to play these runouts, jumping out of windows, even though there are nomad charges there, because Daystar just don't look composed on Skyscraper. And these goo mines have been so frustrating to deal with. Okay, here's a big oh. one. Okay! So oh, 5v2 becomes a 3v2. It is happening again, but there might not be enough time in the bank here for Daystar. Running straight through the smoke. Dark will take him down. KZB's low HP. And the 5 one half is confirmed for Fury. Game face is on. They've barely even broken a sweat. Yeah, this was pretty tough for us to watch here. I think Fury look like they're absolutely in their element. They just know exactly what's going on in the server. Um, it's pretty telegraphed, I would say, from Daystar as well. And they've got a lot of ways to deal with it, especially having your combinations of like your Goyos, your lesions, your smokes. It's not really something that a Monty will feel comfortable pushing into. That or you need to play the Monty micro really well, where you're able to actually bait out that utility from happening through the early rounds. You can then push on through the mid round. It's all been wasted. But Daystar don't look super competent in being able to do that. And I think Fury have just been able to sit there, wait for the time to tick down. That round, that round literally went down to the last second or so for Daystar to actually be able to even get up the stairs into the bomb site. So yeah, Fury just, yeah, look totally in control right now. It's actually the second round that ended thanks to the timer. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know what that says about Daystar. They are very slow. And as soon as they meet some kind of obstacle, if it doesn't go their way, which, by the way, there was only one round that Daystar found the open in that half. They just stall out and they don't really form up a push. It's rough because they also took their tactical timeout so early, right, Mandy? You know, third round in, they lost that even. They lost two tertiary bombsite rounds. Uh, Fury now moving on to the attack. And the only, I guess, glimmer or hope here for Daystar is the fact that now they have moved on to the favoured side. But you know, it could be, very well be the case that Fury ends up giving Daystar their first 7-1 oh, loss. Oh, going in. Sorry, the third 7-1 loss, three playdays in a row. But as you've said, I-9, tip of the spear, he's making this very quick. Yeah, they look confident. Um, and they look like they're doing something pretty direct here as well. Monty and Osha, so double shields on board. And this is just Oh, hijacked. nice! Oh, that was great from I-9 and BG Man together. Uh, sorry, from Dark together. Using the Zofia to actually animation cancel the Clash shield and then being able to shoot... Uh, shoot them in the legs. That's hijack going down super early on, all on his lonesome, no one there to support him at all. That means that I9 has got free reign completely on the buck down here to play the vertical as he pleases. Not just that, but BG, Man, and Critch as well on the double shield. Operators can start making the way in through this top floor too. Completely uncontested so far. Nades being sunk in through, but really it's, you know, it's, this is looking like a fairly decent position here for Fury. Very much so. They've got the numbers advantage. They've taken down one of the most frustrating operators that could have stalled out the Monty. Oh, interesting. The Tuberau is actually trying to lock the Monty in place. Well enough, it does. I don't know if that actually affects the Vulcan Canister Ooh. at all. But anyway, Neon has found a really nice angle and taken down Lycolis. That's a big player to take down. No pressure on the window now. It does make things a little bit awkward. I don't know what BG Man's play is here. It, clearly, they're trying to execute into karaoke eventually, but got to deal with this player in Geisha. 
I think they've got info on the player inside of karaoke, which I believe can be vertical from down below from I-9, but they've decided not to go for that, and I think that play is full enough from that position regardless. Never mind, Dark and I-9 are going to try and rejoin up with Crit J, who's on the Monty, who's going to try and allow them some safe passage into the bomb site. There is a rotation hole inside of B going from the top of the back stairs. They've caught out the flank as well of Momo oh. Rinse. If they can translate it from here, it'd be good. KZB, though, is down below as well, and he's caught out BG Man on a backstab. It's actually a full rotate, a full flank. Two players still downstairs. That does open the door. Daystar C4 misses. And I9 forcing that plant down with Dark on flank watch. And Crit J on enti entry with the Monty. It's going to make this very difficult now for Daystar. 3v2 advantage. KZB finds one, but it's traded on back through the vert. All up to Neon now. Great gun in his hands, but I9 is simply better. Fury at the drop of a hat have found match point. That was a bit of a scary round there for Fury, especially with all the flanks that came through in the mid round from Daystar. But they converted that one, I, I think, with confidence and composure in the end there. They dealt with the flanks pretty well. Yes, they had to throw some bodies at the problem, but they made the trade to work in their favor. And because they realized that so much of Daystar had vacated the bomb site, that allowed i 9 safe passage in through the rotation hole, back behind the bomb, and finding a safe place to get the diffuser down as well. So Fury capitalizing on the opportunities that had been granted to them midway through the rounds, and then converting it from then on. The retake was successful for Daystar, despite a pretty valiant effort on the flanks going down there in the ground floor. So nevertheless, Fury, look, will continue to reign terror in the server at the moment. 6-1 for these guys on the attack, and it doesn't look like anything can stop them. Yeah, I, I want to know who cursed Daystar, but this could very well be their third 7-1 in a row in this league. Uh, it was Jolita first that uh, smacked them about and then elevate, and now this game has been... Quite a one-sided affair. Fury looking very much themselves. The only round they lost was, quite frankly, a throw, Mandy. I think we can both agree on that. Like, I don't know yep. what Fury were doing on that uh, exhibition defense, but well, let's see Daystar's defense of this bomb site. Let's see if they've got the confidence to commit to some of this aggression. Let's see if they can find Fury's number. Let's see if they can find some early picks. I like this from Momo. He's looking for an early run out, but may not find anything. From the lineup that Fury have got, it does indicate to me that they are looking for something direct into the bomb site here as well, of exhibition and office. They don't quite have the right upper lineup to go for a sweep here, and instead are going to lean into this, this Galaz setup. Uh, Thermite as well is going to open not only the breach, but the wall adjacent to that to try and deal with the mirror as well, that type of thing. So they really need to just sit here by their time and work the bomb site slowly. There's not going to be a trick on the other side from the bandit of Neon, so this single housing wall is going to get opened up nice and early, and that's going to allow a cutoff and prevent players from playing inside of office, but most importantly, playing inside of Dragon as well. I wonder what the intention is for the Glaz here of Crit J. There are only two smokes in the lineup, and just on my Colossus Monty. Some of the mirrors have been spotted. Good drone work early. Fury just poising outside the bomb site, not overcommitting to anything as of yet. I'm not sure why they're not concerned about the run out spot as well. Crit went for that peek there. Oh, here's I 9 down below. Easy opening pick. He has the read, but oh, there are three, three players <laughs> hunting him down. Dark's able to find a trade, but immediately traded back again. The entire of Daystar went hunting. And that does tell Lycolis that maybe there's a chance that he can get in. He's got to be careful. The electrification will spell death for him. He goes for the sprint. He's going to take down Jack. In fact, BG Man finds the headshot there. 2v2. Numbers even again. Fury looking very solid. BG Man has the long line of sight. Lycolis has the diffuser. Oh, a missed shot. A flash might be the cover that Lycolis needs. Jumping on inside. Oh, bit of damage done. Is he able to cover his teammate now? A flashbang may enable this plant. All Fury needs for now, but no instead. Oh, they're going hunting. They look to go aggressive. One impact is a big threat. BG Man almost gets the angle he needs. The second player from Daystar is ready and waiting. BG Man just holding the line as the plant is going down. Daystar have to make the first move, and they do. Lycolis is down. BG Man. 1v1. Low HP for the game. So he relocates a drone. His teammates can call off that. And they'll have seen Neon now. They can tell him that he's round in the corner. He fakes it. He reads it. But he doesn't land the shots needed. Both players, one bullet from death. Who lands it? Neon needs it to save the game. But Lycolis, nerves of steel. He lands the shot. And Fury 
dominate 7-1. Daystar in shambles. And Fury never looks like they broke a sweat for the entire game. I mean, maybe when they got into that attacking half, they had to do something slightly special to try and get the bomb into the bomb site. But both times, able to play the objective. Diffuser got into the bomb site, looking comfortable as ever. Fury can take down Daystar pretty easily on Skyscraper. A massive win for Fury as they will rocket up the standings and have a very healthy round difference thanks to such a dominant result. Unfortunately, though, Daystar, man, what's going on? That's three play days in a row where they've dropped the ball and not even looked competitive. It really feels like this is a, a, a league where we've got five teams that can really hang and compete for playoff spots and then three teams at the bottom uh, which are really struggling to fight with the rest. Daystar, immeasurably disappointed, but Fury will be very satisfied as we toss it back to the desk. Yeah, that's uh, unfortunately I am now well and truly off the bandwagon for Daystar, guys. It's I, it's really tough because I am a firm believer in underdogs. I'm a firm believer in the story of the up and coming teams, but unfortunately in that match, I mean maybe this might be a little harsh for me to say, considering you know I'm not a caster anymore, I'm not an analyst, but they looked lost. Yeah, uh, uh, to be fair, Skyscraper is one of those maps where it can really expose you as an attacking unit if you do look a little bit um, lost or lacking confidence. If you're playing against a good team, it can really expose those weaknesses. And unfortunately, we saw that didn't really flip much defensively. So it's another 7-1 loss for Daystar. That's now back to back to back 7-1 losses for them. And I mentioned yeah. that heading into the day, I thought there was maybe a chance they'd be a little bit competitive, maybe spruiking it a little bit as a potential overtime, which would have been really good for their top six chances not to be. And now it's pretty much a battle between the bottom three as to who's going to make it through to the playoff bracket and who gets left behind. And Jake, we said at the start of the day, uh, probably the most important part about the standings is the fact that Fury are yet to play the bottom three teams of the league. And I mean, if this is a display to, to go off, I, I think that uh, we're, we're right back in that top two conversation. Yeah, I think they're going to be peaking at the right time going into the playoffs, being able to take on these teams. They made very short work of Daystar. I'm not surprised. I don't think anyone should be. I did maybe expect Daystar to be a little bit more competitive, but as soon as I got into the green room, First thing I said to Gaz is uh, Fury defense, skyscraper. This could be 5 1, and it was. Uh, and from there, Fury is just far too experienced. You can't really ever ex envision that they're going to allow Daystar to get back into that game. So it was really going to be difficult from the onset. Had Daystar started first half defense, they could have at least gotten to maybe three rounds, and we could have been talking a different story. But yeah, unfortunately for Daystar, I think they are, and we've said this a couple of times. They're in that South Asia bracket, but they are a little bit above South Asia. So it's kind of like South Asia, Daystar, and then the rest of Southeast Asia. Yeah, it's definitely a clear divide at the moment. Top five, bottom three. Let's speak to Lycolis to get his thoughts on the matter. Lycolis, uh, look, an interesting game. You guys obviously smashed them. Uh, yeah. But I want to ask you, what was your read on Daystar coming into today? Um... We giving them, giving them, um, we didn't really just like, like play our, our own game. We give them a chance to either play, I think it's like Chalet or Skyscraper. And how we went to Skyscraper, maybe they have Leo and confident that they could beat that on Sky. So, so they bring us to Sky, but as soon as Noda restart on the defense, was like, okay, it's going to be easy. We, um, like get more like at least four rounds. In the round, in the game, mm -hmm. that was, yeah, we just play our default uh, defense, and they just most, most of the round they just doing like the the, the thing team just did it, but it's hard to like attack, right? So how we lose was the round that they have like some some fans setting up on office. Other than that, if, like, like default was a default, you know. So we can't come on the top. We were just like kind of better on skyscraper, so we did. Like Hollis, I know you've still got two play days to go, but are you and the team looking to do anything different, preparing for best of threes in the playoffs? Um, we probably didn't prepare anything fancy for the like incoming best of one main. Probably gonna have uh, something for the playoff best of three. at least. We want to like go to boot camp. Uh, coming soon, we could like go there when the when like we play on the playoff so we could play a more better coordination yeah. 
Oh, that is, I'm not going to lie, like Olis, you are breaking up on us. And all I heard was the word boot camp. So I hope that it goes well. Like Olis, usually I'd give you the floor here, but it's it's cutting up so much. We might actually let you go on this one. Uh, we wish you the best of luck in the league and hopefully we'll be speaking to you tomorrow. Okay, see you. I hope I'll do it again tomorrow. Thanks, Bye-bye. Ciao. Ah, wow. I could not hold my laughter in. <laughs> I don't know why there was there was something about when, when he first started talking and it started jittering I was like oh maybe it's me because I'm having some internet issues today and then it just kept going I was like no that's not me so uh, I mean, excuse me for my unprofessionalness the, the thing was like Hollis was giving some super in-depth answers there it almost got to the point where the, where the interview was going to be longer than the bloody match and uh, yeah, unfortunately he was yeah. like lagging out a bit but um, yeah, yeah I mean big confidence builder for Fury tonight obviously and for the boys mm. um, I, I wish I had the opportunity actually to ask how do you actually reflect on this match right is this a game that you even bother looking back at or is it just so dominant that you can't just focus forward I, I would assume probably the latter but I don't know what their process would be, but obviously a big positive for them either way. I, I guess, you know, the beautiful part is they've got two more games where you're going to be able to ask that exact same question because I can't, <laughs> I cannot imagine a world in which, uh, you, again, this is, I want to be careful so, like to not uh, be too harsh, but after what we've just seen Fury do to Daystar, it, it's hard to imagine a world in which they won't do it to Knock Knock and Hasib Warriors. Uh, just given, you know, they are now coming into the the better part of their form for the stage, Xenox, it, it's a little bit scary. I, I, I would uh, hedge my bet. Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, that's a very easy assumption to make. I think Fury are an incredibly experienced roster. Shake uh, off the cobwebs, then get going has probably been their mantra. Sure, first couple of games w wouldn't have been to their liking. A loss to Bleed is fine, but they... Would have liked it to have been a little bit more competitive. I mean, even then, 7-4 is not exactly like they got, you know, stomped or anything. And I know he lost to Jolito, and they're having a pretty good stage. It's really not the end of the world. So they've turned their stage around. I think they're peaking at the right time going into the playoffs. Certainly, uh, the way that I envision, it's very much looking like it could head down to that Fury versus Bleed for that spot to Manchester. I'd be... Uh, surprised if it's not that particular game all depends on seeding of course but um with the games that fury have still to play it is increasingly more likely they will finish second as the tournament yep. goes on yeah well they now jump up to 10 points and you know still six points on the board for them so it's going to get a little bit interesting in these last three play days but that's all we got time for for the first matchup don't go anywhere when we come back the asia league continues Consulate. I think this is Bank and this should be Lockers basement. Oh, Bank. Okay. Wow. Ah, uh, shit. Okay. Ah, uh, yeah. Sky. Oh, I think it's a skyscraper. Skyscraper is Bank. Oh, this is in Chalet, I think. I remember the rock and the wood. Oh my god. Wow. Okay. Who even looks at that? Oregon, Oregon Bunker. This is definitely Oregon Bunker. I remember this is Oregon in the... Anka. Oregon, yeah. Looks like... Oregon again is the... resource there. This looks like... Oregon. Oh, this is... Same, Oregon. Um, the laundry stair. Laundry stairs? Yeah. It have to be bang, but if it is skylight or stop, I think it's going stop. Bang stop. Stop trading room. I forgot this name. Yeah, stock, stop room. Yeah, second floor stop room. Uh, bang CCTV room. Oh. I have no idea what this is. This, I think, this is bank as well. But. 
Bank, I think garage. The bank, garage. Yeah, night heaven. Oh, yeah, bank. I I have no idea about this map. No idea at all. Is this even from R6? I'll just take a guess, bro. Skyscraper or something? I think this is skyscraper. Well, it was skyscraper. Uh, this one is gonna be border. Bathroom or teller or something. Ah, uh, this is border. Uh, toilet Zhonghou. This is border in the toilet and the teller Zhonghou. No idea, but I believe from the pattern of the right side corner, it should be border, right? Uh, this one is gonna be border again, and I think it's gonna be a uh, office. This is border office. Yeah. At least I got the map. Uh, it's a trophy. It's a trophy at the Oregon Trophy Room, right? Wow. Uh, this is clubhouse. It's a clubhouse bar. Um, this one. Um, I think it's clubhouse, but I think it should be in bar. No. This is Clubhouse Meet Room. What? Halfway? Uh, fish room? If I'm wrong, it's gonna be in breath. I think it is in cafe. The freezer. Yeah! Wow. This is cafe. This is Oregon, and I think it's game room. Yeah, this is game room. This is uh, Oregon Games Room. Oh, the Games Room, Oregon Game Room. Football is like play thing, yeah. Easy, yeah. I think classroom. No. Yeah, cha. Let's go for classroom. Oregon classroom. Wait, it's not for the. I think it's Oregon. Oregon again. This should be for the Armory, I think. Border Armory. Ah, it's Border. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, it's Border. Okay. Mm, not bad, not bad. Welcome back from the break. Hopefully, Guz can keep his composure, oh, uh, even with some waffling in the background, mate. That's just how it happens. Look, we've got match of the day coming up right now, and potentially Xenox. Uh, there might almost be more rounds in this game than uh, any other of the games tonight, all included. It Look, to be honest, I think that this has the potential to go OT, but maybe, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I'm reading too much into it, Jake. Maybe. Maybe a little bit. Maybe. Can it go to overtime? I think every game tonight can go to overtime. <laughs> the percentage no, difference is... No, fine. you don't. No, <laughs> well, you don't. There's No, well, there's like a 1% chance the last two go to overtime, and there's probably more like a, I don't know, 30%? No, 20% chance this one goes to overtime. You know, that's the way is you it, could is, summarize it. So what you're telling me is there's daylight between these two teams. Is that what you're trying to tell me? Yeah, well, it's not Daystar, that's for sure. They, they got absolutely bombed <laughs> out of the service. 7-1 by Fury on Skyscraper. Get him out. Uh, but for Shalita and Bleed, it's match of the night. Huh? We don't need to tell you guys that. It's very clear. Um, the question will be, what can Shalita do against Bleed? Bleed are in some really, really impressive form right now. Um, you could yep. argue, I mean, 7-3 last week against Knock Knock on Chalet certainly won, weren't at their best, like their very best, but um, what their very best is, when you kind of look at their last two matches before that, Die Walls and Fury, 7-4, 7-4, uh, respectively on the defensive side of maps of Skyscraper and Clubhouse, did quite well. Now, the only thing I would argue is that they started on defense in both instances, so you do get that very minor little advantage by getting 
to start on the defender side. I'm curious what it'll be tonight against Jolita. Do they find a way to end up on another defender side of map and begin defense? Because it does relieve that mm. early game pressure. Well, hopefully they, they're they going to need it because Bleeder are certainly out for blood. Uh, Jolita, the roster that coming into this stage, again, we genuinely thought we're going to be contenders and so far they have been guns. Yeah, I mean, it's been really exciting to see this roster come back. And for me personally, the expectation, quite honestly, was probably just to see them make top six. I wasn't really sure where to put them. However, they've put in some really competitive performances and they've also been dominant against the lesser teams. The same can't really be said for Bleed, who have had a couple more hiccups getting into matches, whereas Jolita, for the most part, have looked really switched on from round one. So you intrigued to see how they go. As for Bleed, obviously, I'm probably being overly harsh they've been incredibly good and it's yeah. a flawless record every single win in regulation plus three uh plus 13 rather round diff only two ahead of jolita as you mentioned previously yeah. um there is a potential world in which that actually does matter so over time would be very yeah. intriguing for that particular storyline as well yeah, I think that Bleed have certainly come into this stage with a lot of fire and, and, and fury, if you don't mind me just mentioning another team. and I, I genuinely believe that it doesn't really matter how close these games are with Bleed. For me, Jake, it, it's more about how they're looking in the server, barring maybe the first four rounds that we saw of their entire stage. They have looked rock solid. Yeah, they certainly have, and uh, their, their very best is by far and away the best in this region. The only team I think that could stake any kind of claim to being a direct competitor and have any chance of really, you know, dethroning them from that number one position in Southeast Asia would be Fury, based on them going to majors and SIs alongside Bleed. Of course, that's no longer the case now for Stage 1 this year. Two slots down to one means only one can go, so there is a little bit of that competition. It does mean there is also a bit of that stress that can be relayed over to Bleed. There's that pressure. There is only one slot there isn't you know okay well if fury beat us in the best of three that's fine we'll just beat everyone else that's no longer the case so imagine a grand final between feud and, uh, fury and bleed can bleed lose that kind of game absolutely as we saw a couple of times last year as good as they are and as good as they've been that would be a danger match and they've got to make sure they're in the best shape going into the playoffs because of it we look at reaps right now but he hasn't been statistically their best player hoven actually has a very slightly higher rating than him by 0.1 so uh, very interesting to see and i think that's simply just down to his cost which actually is only 58 percent rob that is actually very very low like we're talking bottom 30 percent of the league low so I, I don't know really what you could say in regards to that. He's just not consistent enough. But if he's going to pop off, he's going to pop off a lot in one round. Well, I think that that's actually been the discussion, hasn't it, guys? It's, it's literally been Reaps is either all or nothing. I think even, was it maybe Mentalist who said that? He's either yeah. he's either finding you three kills or he's dead and you've got nothing else to show for it. I mean, if we've got the head-to-head -head, uh, graphic ready, I'd love to jump straight into that because it actually highlights my point quite well. Um, Reaps and his cost is relatively low at 58%. Um, so if we've got it ready, just throw it up. Um, and I'm looking at um, him against Mr. Punch for this particular instance. If you got it ready, a... just, just throw it up. Because <laughs> they both have a 58% <laughs> um, cost. Despite that, Reaps is absolutely smashing him in terms of, of yeah. rating and uh, kill potential and impact in rounds. So whilst the cost is kind of a little bit funny, um, the fact that it is so low, it goes to show that when he is on, he has just a massive impact. It's uh, it's the Reaps effect. And I think that if he'd been on any other team, it actually would have been a little bit more challenging to have that discussion. But the fact that you see so many players in Bleed have the impact that they do. I mean, you look at their EPS across the board and literally every player is positive, I think barring one. Uh, it, this is what you wanted to talk about though, guys. Yeah, exactly. Uh, those cost numbers, again, very, very similar between the two, but it's reaps who just absolutely smashes ahead in terms of kills and eps and impact in these rounds slightly different roles so it's not like to like in that regard but i just wanted to find an example of two players who might be a little bit hot and cold but you can still if you're the better player reaps in this instance be more impactful inside of the server and that's something that we're eager to watch in this match i mean if you go uh like for like jake who are you who are you taking out on top jolita their best day or bleed I don't even know why you're asking me that question. Move on to the next topic. 
Well, see, there's this magical thing, Jake. Um, I don't know if you know this. Is it it's filling? called Phil. Huh. Um, I it's, knew it. it's, I love me it's some It's the Phil. book of Phil. It's it's the book of philosophy, mate. Is it the it's, P H I L Phil or the F I L L Phil? No, unfortunately, <laughs> Phil is a good bloke, but Phil is uh, not fun to do on a broadcast. No, absolutely not. Uh, look, at the end of the day, it's Reeves, right? He's got that star factor. There is why I call him Keanu Reeves. He can clutch up. He can get multi frags, one VXs, good entries. But is he consistent right now? And I'm talking just like right now, probably not to the level that we've seen him before. But everything else I mentioned are massive positives that others on this roster can't necessarily bring. Who else is getting mm. them entries? I mean, Tursla's the only one, the one that's positive. Plus two. Reeves is plus four. I mean, Hoven, as I mentioned, is being technically slightly higher rating. He's not an entry player. He's actually minus four on the entry. And therefore, for me, yeah, absolutely, Reeves is the, the standout. The good news for Bleed, though, is that it's not Reeves or Bust. Um, need to get that pretty clearly out there like if reeves having a bad game they got more than enough talent as we go to the map vetoes and uh we are going to be heading to clubhouse did kind of touch on it there very briefly that was a, a game that was played very recently bleed over direwolves on this particular map they started on defense if the graphic is to believe uh, they will be on defense again to begin this so um yeah mm. interesting that uh, bleed for the third time against their uh, you know, very direct rivals, Fury and Direwolves and now Jalita are getting a defensive side of map on defense to begin. How does that happen? Three from three? I got no idea. But whoever does their vetoes is doing a tremendous job. Yeah, well, I, I think that uh, this is probably, uh, in my opinion, guys, this is the, the map that I genuinely would want have wanted to have seen uh, this game go to. But w do you have a read? Oh, do I have a read? Um... Mm. I suppose for Jolita, it is a little bit unfavorable starting out on attack. Again, clubs only been played twice, but it's very defender-sided, and that trend follows in other sub-regions of APAC, so they are going to have their backs against the wall. Um, if they were starting off defensively, I think I'd favor them slightly more. Again, considering that Bleed have shown that at times throughout this stage, they get off to slow starts, and Jolita probably one of the best poised to actually exploit that. Won't be the case, though, in this matchup. I'd be quite concerned if Bleed don't get off to a good start um, here on on clubhouse of course not every objective is equally weighted and things like cash cctv has definitely fallen out of favor for defense and in fact are even attacker sided in some regions so that'll be an intriguing curveball to follow in this match all right well uh, let's not waste any time let's get straight over to clubhouse Devin man to run you through it Thank you very much, Robert. Yes, club, one of my favorites, one of the staples, one of the classics, and this could well be a classic matchup, Mandy. Bleed have not truly been challenged as of yet. Jalita were the ones to take down Fury in their opening game. They took down the kings of Asia at the time, the reigning champs. Can they take down Bleed as well? I feel like the match against Fury being in week one's probably got a bit of an asterisk to it. Fury didn't look super activated um, early on in the stage, but I think as the play days have progressed on, they've looked a bit better. Whereas I think for Bleed, they seem to have looked pretty good from the get-go. Like, yeah, there are a few like scary rounds against the Sea Warriors and the like, but for the most part, they look pretty strong going into it. But yeah, uh, I think for Jolita, this should be quite a challenging one against a Bleed who looks pretty warmed up at the moment in the match, or in the game, at least. And uh, yeah, I think it'll be a tough one, especially starting out in the attacking club. Very true. Now, Bleed, they... I don't know, they have historically loved this map, even if they haven't won it a lot. So obviously they won it just last week against Diewall 7-4, but the real big games I'm thinking about, when I think of Bleed Clubhouse, I think of them playing Space Station, Virtus Pro, and W7M at the Six Invitational. And these guys nearly beat W7N on this map. It was actually a 7-8. Uh, they uh, almost won that series. Had they won that 15th round of that Clubhouse game, they would have actually beaten Virtus Pro in the playoffs, which is unreal to think of so these guys they're no slouches on club despite them having technically a, a negative win rate on it it's quite a contrast to jolita who have just played essentially you know, mid-tier local asian teams on this map so they may well be in for a rude awakening coming up against a team like bleed who have so much international experience playing clubhouse fan face is gonna go by us for the start of this matchup both of the combination of Thatcher and Thermite is going to slip through for the attack. Not only that, but you've got all your ranged hard breach and uh, static hard breach as well on the Thermite that'll go through. So for Jolita, at least opening some of these walls, playing uh, the micro battles on the side of the attack should be made a little bit easier against Bleed. 
not only that, but too, Brow, being banned out as well will mean that getting open some of these walls will be made even, even easier than it was before on his army as well. But what that means is you've left in uh, a, still a lot of strong defenders there. Like, you've still got your Fenrir's in, which can be quite challenging to deal with on this map. You've also got your Cades and your uh, Bandits in as well. So I'm anticipating these guys to be able to play the trick game on the other side. And that's probably what we're going to have a look at early on in the mid, uh, early to late round. Need. I just wonder how much we'll see our Rome game out of bleed because they do love to play quite aggressively this team and they're, they're smart enough to know how to play like the passive setup focus game and I'm sure we will see that in the late round but when the Valkyrie and the Solus are on the board and especially the mute I assume some of these mute jammers are put on the roam uh, this could well be quite an aggressive hold and I would love to see that. Jalita, obviously a very good roam clearing team, and they've got some solid operate. Wow, is that Blitz going to be stuck, Mandy? Yeah, I think so. Wow, that's a big pick. I like it. I think that should be a fun one for Jalita. Blitz, Ying, you've got Jackal as well on the side of Mr. Punch, so probably the player that's going to be cutting off if they're looking to do a rush onto the bomb site here as well. A couple of Jalita players are going to spawn over on the garage side of the map too, and... This could be easy access in through dirt. This could be easy access in through oil if uh, IDFC decides to drop here. Loading mag. Doesn't look like they're going to overcommit to the idea, though. Yeah, well, it's a challenge because Bleed obviously going to be very good on this roam. They've got tons of setup for it. The mute counters the blitz. Like, you can't activate the, the flash within the radius of a mute jammer, which sounds very strange, but yeah, <laughs> little known interaction. Uh, and what's more as well, like... Solus gets wall hacks on Blitz. Like when he's holding his shield up, um, the Solus can see him through walls. So like Bleeder actually even got some counters for the Blitz here on this roam clear. I assume Blitz is going to be used for the roam clear. Yeah, it certainly the looks Jackal like it. Jackal also assists. This Jackal on the board does make me think that they're not going to go direct into the bomb site, and they actually do want to get control of the top two floors. And for the most part, it kind of looks like they've already achieved that with a couple, you know. Two minutes to spare, essentially, in the round. All five players of Bleed look like they've comfortably jumped their way back onto the bomb site. They've completely vacated these top two floors, uh, despite having the lineup, sort of, with the aid of the Solace to go and do that. So, One, two, yeah. three, four, five. Yeah, you're yes, right. Yes, we can count to five. Yeah, I think <laughs> Jalita have definitely achieved what they set out to do so far. Yeah, but to be fair, I don't think Bleed are upset as well. Like, they've got a really strong fortified position on the site now. Half the round is done. These hatches are still going to be a little bit difficult to open up. Yeah, there are ingredients to do so. Ah, but, they have uh, no EMPs. Yeah, no mini EMPs well. either. So that moto hatch actually might not get opened up. Uh, is there a... Okay, so here the impact's going to slow things down, but we've got two more impacts now. Blue hatch is open. Where's the other electrical? I assume it's on the church wall. I think so. No, oh, it's not. Okay. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, sorry, it is. Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Wow, very good. Just got deployed. Yeah, so I guess yeah, Jalita are going to be forced here into some kind of kitchen execute. I think they can achieve it from this position, to be honest. They've got... I mean, the Blitz should throw a spanner in the works as well for getting that entry down through the hatch. The translation is always a pretty tough period uh, once you want to go through that for the execute. Not only that, but they've got plenty of smokes and flashbangs to try and use uh, to cover some lines of sight as well. So I think if this is a well-thought-out attack, a what? they could go for it. Hoven, though, has gone through all the way in the top floor, and it doesn't look like Jolita, no. There's only 30 seconds left to go. He could do some real damage. Uh, he could single-handedly win this round. Even just the fact that he's got presence here might make things very difficult. There is a vertical angle player down below. He spots out one in the kitchen hallway. He takes him down. Oh, a second one for him. There is a trade, but it may be far too little, far too late. The plant is going down from IDFC, and it's confirmed. Now, Mark, up above, must secure a post-plant victory. Good angle. Good amount of damage as well from a player there. But Mentalist moving up the stairs, lands the critical shot, and Turdsta can confirm that disable of the Diffuser. A massive retake there from Bleed. Not just the massive retake, but massive flank, man. Hoven all the way in through the top floor, managed to sneak past all of the drone work from Jolita. I suppose all five players are alive. No one's there watching flank drones. Lonnet's probably even active on the flanks, right? So Hoven fully capitalizing on the opportunity to make his way all the way through the top floor, back down the main stairs, and catches them straight in the chaos of trying to drop down the kitchen hatch. That is not the time that you want to be flanked if you're an attacker, right? So Hoven finding the perfect timing uh, on the execute to come through and essentially win out the round for Bleed. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I, I'm really impressed by both teams that round, to be honest. Like, the only thing that I guess you could point out and be like, what was going on there was that flank. Like, how did Hoven get allowed to, to flank up? I assume he had Valkyrie cameras somewhere. I don't know if it was in 
maybe garage or in secret and and if he used those valkyrie cameras to allow himself to get to the top floor and then go for a big flank um but yeah i think without hoven jolita well could have won that round like they managed to get the plant down uh and they had maybe like some form of a post plant position had they not lost those picks to hoven so yeah despite bleed kind of i think having a really solid setup and wasting a lot of time with that fullback roam. Uh, yeah, Jolita had a really solid goal, but I think this is going to be a very exciting game, Mandy, with I agree. what we've seen even just in the first round. Yeah, for sure. I totally agree with that as well. I think Jolita made a pretty valiant effort to make that execute work too. We pointed out earlier, there was a ton of smokes on the board for Jolita, and there was no warden on the other side for Bleed as well. So they actually, despite being in the numbers disadvantage, once they actually went for the execute, they still managed to get the bomb down, Dev. And that makes me think that like maybe if that flank hadn't come through, they actually might have been able to play the objective there pretty well, especially with the remaining players on the hatch, the Blitz kind of like running awry through the bomb site. There are a lot of good ideas there for Jolita. And honestly, Dev, I would have to agree with you totally. They did a good crack at that. Well, we are just having a technical issue as you guys can see on your screens. This will not take very long. Uh, as you can see, we can have a look at the game. Maybe we can speculate a little bit. Obviously, Mandy, pick phase is not over as of yet and the timer is still paused, but we can have a look at uh, what Bleed are looking to set up. Also look at their cameras. So Jim has been tentatively picked here, and we can see the operator lineup. They could potentially still change this, but I think that they're probably locked in more or less. Um, and we're seeing that Solus come out again. This just feels like such a natural pick for a player like Turdstar, who's always looking for playmaking opportunities. I think this is a great one for him. And even though we didn't actively get to see its impact last round, perhaps it could have even assisted in enabling that flank from Hoven by checking... If you're in blue, for example, you look up into lounge and you can see whether there are flank watch drones active, whether they're being watched, and enable a flank like that. The other thing is like claymores as well, right? If you've got a claymore on the oil ladder or not, that's potential flank opportunity if they haven't gone and taken garage there as well. So yeah, I think I agree with you. There are a lot of ways in which Solace can be used, especially through that mid-round intel to go not only figure out where the execute's coming from because you can see all the drone work, you can see all the utility, but then to also enable a flank like that as well. Solace is very versatile operator, Dev, as we've learned yeah. since she's been introduced into Pro League. Very, very powerful, yeah, very, very, very powerful. versatile. But in the right hands, of course. And I think, yeah, Turd is one of those players that I think will naturally yeah. fall into that role, like you've been saying. Let's take a lot of skill. I'm just glad that Turds has got something to play that's not bloody Mozzie or Warden, eh? <laughs> it, was a bit, it was a bit of a two-trick pony oh, back in the day dear. with the Mozzie Warden 1.5s. And, uh, yeah, the Solus, uh, I think, just makes so much sense. Solus kind of feels like uh, Valkyrie's cousin in terms of, like, the playmaking potential. Like, I used to be yeah, a right. big Valkyrie main. And uh, the reason why I enjoyed it so much and why so many players are drawn to a, an operator that gathers intel like that is it just enables uh, your creativity. Knowledge. Like, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, you just you get that info, whether it's like, oh, this room's flea, I'm, I'm going to make a flank, or I can see they're pushing from here. Uh, you know, not having no information is a form of information. Like, when you know, or ne negative information, I don't know, you could probably phrase that better. Negative information. It, oh, that's yeah. good from you. I Thank quite like you. that. Are so either negative information or anti-information? Anti that doesn't make any sense. I like yours Sheesh. better. Yours okay, negative better. information. Yep. You check, like, you see, oh, there's no one on drone out here, or there's no drones have entered this room yet. Like, that gives you the ability to make a play on the yeah, back of that. Yeah, I mean, so. that's essentially what pre-placed drones are, right? They're like the yeah. absence of defenders being in the top floor is that there is yeah. no one playing the room, right? Negative information. Damn, that's Sheesh. smart. That's good from you. I like that. Okay, here we go. Jolita are going to look to attack Jim and Bedroom. So that bomb site was being stuck out. And they've all started out over on the CCTV side of the map. Not just that, but we've got the Thermite in hand of IDFC. He's a bit wary that Mensless could be tricking on the other side. So he's not going to place the exothermic charge down just yet. He's going to wait for his teammates to be postured up for the entry and to prevent that from happening. They've got the drone in. They've realized that no one's tricking it. That wall's going to be opened up nice and easy. Uh, how much are they going to commit to actually clearing this as of yet, though? Are they going to go and try and just get the other wall open first? Attackers have located a bomb. By the way, no Maverick. We talked a lot about Maverick recently on Clubhouse. Um, as you said, Mav and Thatch are both in. Option was there. But elected not to go for. That does mean that there's only one hard breach on this lineup. No secondary hard breach is brought. So IDFC does have to be ultra careful that he doesn't lose his exothermic. They're actually not going to be open the con wall here, Andy. Like, they only had two charges. They had to choose, like, CCTV, Jacuzzi, con. Like, you only get two of the three. 
I have a feeling that Jacuzzi might be too much of a necessary evil for them to not open here. So yeah. it seems like IDFC is going to rotate over that second exothermic charge to um, Jacuzzi wall and get that open. Now what stands in the way of him getting that wall open is a castle barricade, um, preventing his teammates from being able to shoot the bandit charges off the wall. So for now, Instead, it kind of looks like they're going to posture up to actually go for a map sweep instead. Sapper's over on the balcony. He's put some pressure out into Con. Now, with the absence of the cutoff, he's instead just going to try and use this window and the soft walls, who is right as well, to try and isolate that player inside a cache. Reeves is getting Reeves. really aggressive around the balcony. Yeah, and he does find a pick as well. Meanwhile, IDFC's gone down to a C4. So, not only are Jolita struggling a little bit, but hang on a second. Hold that thought. Mr. Punch what has made the... his way to the top of the stairs. There's no one watching. There is a bait, and yeah, well played, actually. The castle just rat -a some bullets out. Does bait the switch, and then Mentalist on for the swing. But a poor round from Shalita, all things considered, as Reaps finds his second, and it's flawless. At the end of the day, a dominant performance from Bleed. Shalita looking lost from day dot. Mm, Bleed looked a bit too comfortable, I think, on that defense. It felt like Jolita went and flip-flopped on what they wanted to do there in the mid-rounds. It looked like initially they wanted to go out and clear through cash, but then not sending anyone in through the garage entry made me think, okay, they're not going to go and dedicate themselves to that. It looked like they were then going to go and flip their attack and try and get Jacuzzi open. But then instead they changed their mind, they put pressure out on Con. And at that point they had like two or three plays loitering out on the balcony. That enabled Reach to get aggressive and get his pick. Mensa's got one on the C4, I think that was the one play that was actually doing the sweep. And then from there on it all kind of just fell apart. Bleed just looks pretty comfortable, slowly picking apart that attack. And Jolita looked pretty lost, they didn't really dedicate themselves to anything. Yeah, I know. I saw red flags in the operator line on Mandy, like... Like we yeah. talked about, one hard breacher. Uh, there was okay. also no, yeah, no util to clear the castle barricades as well. Like you're basically going to be smacking them for the most part. Um, it's, it's a risk yeah. as well. The the one hard breacher because like say you've got mirror on the bottom side, right? As well. Like suddenly you don't have range hard breach to go and deal with that mirror. So you're just relying on like an ash charge sinking in. But then you also need ash to clear castle barricades to go and shoot the bandit charges for the wall initially, right? So you're basically starving yourself for a lot of utility. The lineup that they've gone for. Now, whether they chose deliberately to go for only one hard breach because they knew that there was no mirror in the last lineup or something, I don't really know. But to me, that's, that's a bit of a gamble, I would say. Oh, God. Yeah, a lot of things that maybe we, when we see Bleed defend Jim Bedroom later in this half, we can dig into it again. But uh, yeah, for now, a lot kind of went begging in that round from Jolita, which is sad because the first round was so close for them. Now they have a chance at attacking CCTV Cash and... Credit to Bleed, they've actually done something a little bit interesting. We noticed there in Lounge, there's a mirror window facing into Garage, which I personally, I don't think I've ever seen before, maybe many years ago. We finally see the Maverick come out, and it's actually enabling this deep angle from DCH on uh, the Repel. Mentalist does not have a scope on the mirror, which is a very strange choice. It means that you're scoping quicker, right? That's Oh, is it yeah. run quicker? Sorry. Is it run no, quicker no, it's, or scoping it's quicker? Scope, it scopes in about, no. I think it's 10% faster, but 15% um, faster. But yeah, I mean, the iron sights on Mirror's Gun are not that good in mm -hmm. my opinion. I have a feeling that the strategy is going to work out relatively well for them, to be honest. Mr. Punch here is going to go for what looks like a garage take, getting some early info. Not only has he spotted out the play inside of Rafters, but he's now also seen the Mirror setup as well. That spells a little bit of danger for Jolita if they want to dedicate themselves to this push. Now, the exothermic charge to the wall will mean that CCTV wall is open, but from here on out, they've got a pretty deep, big decision to make. So they then go and dedicate themselves to clearing out rafters yeah. and face the mirror, or do they then go and flip their attack? Pretty hard one. This is, yeah, it's a good question, and I'm not sure what the answer is. I mean, for now, they are seem to commit to rafters, but Mr. Punch has really taken a lot of damage to the goo mines, which. Quite frustrating. Uh, great read from Hoven picking Elysian. Uh, he's the perfect operator to play that Rafters position. Oh, oh no, that's whoopsies. frustrating. IDFC is going to get blinded by that, but here comes one. Mark is going to get taken down, but not out. He actually jumped directly into side. DCH is just going deep, but he doesn't check his angles, and he dies. There's a good trade. IDFC getting in with some flashes. It's up to him and Sapper now, as Mark is still on the ground. Right at the top of red is Reaps there, waiting. Fighting his time. IDFC goes down, and it should be pretty easy now. Despite that initial numbers advantage coming through from Jolita, Bleed are looking very solid and they have info on both of the last two players now as well. As Reaps and Turd shape up together. Ooh, oh, good deep brave. angle. He's going deep for it. He's not going to try and revive. He's just getting with the pistol and oh no, Mark went down to the goo mine of all things. No. 
It could have been a close round from Jolita, but yeah, pretty devastating to lose it like that. Oh man, I really thought that Jolita had it there in the mid round for a little bit, to be honest, Jeff. I thought like somehow they managed to find the timing on the player in the rafters, simultaneous with the site entry, but somehow Bleed were pretty composed there uh, on the retake, the remaining two players, Reaps especially in top red. Yes, even though all those Yun Cantels did get sent out, he somehow managed to find a blind spot from the blinding and was able to take down the remaining two players that were inside of the bomb site. So Bleed's still looking pretty postured so far in this matchup. 3-0 on a scoreline on defense is nothing to scoff at. They've done really well here so far. But overall, Dev, just such a strangely paced round. They really tried to seek this opportunity. And I think ultimately, Dev, over committing to the idea a little bit. I think once some of these players had fallen down, it probably would have been a good idea to maybe like back off. Um, from dedicating themselves to that site push and, and try and recompose and go for something else. There was still plenty of time on the board. But Jolita, yeah, uh, I think over committing to the idea that they went for there. Yeah. I am puzzled. Oh, well. Yeah. I'm, yeah. We've seen good things from Jolita in this game, which is nice. I just want to see some of that translate to the scoreboard uh, because yeah, this is a solid team. I mean, I'm a little bit biased. I just. I love, I've always loved like this old roster, Sapper, Onigiri obviously who's now substituting, but like this is such a classic team and I want them to do well. Obviously I want Bleed to do well as well, they're probably Apex's best hope um, internationally at the moment, but uh, this should be a tight game, it should be a good game and while the rounds have for some, to some degree been pretty close Mandy like that, I want to see that transit into results. I think Chalita don't look completely lost in the server. I think that's a pretty good sign for these guys. Okay, that's pretty scary. Turd is right there. When someone was just repelled right next to him. I have a feeling that Chalita will probably not know that Turd is there for the whole rounds because this is a very unlikely spot for them to drone. Not only that, but Turd on the Solace can even spot out where the drone work is going down as well. So the more time that passes here, the more lethal that turtle will become in this flank position. And we have seen Jolita previously fall to a pretty lethal flank from Hoven all the way from the top floor. So, you know what? You fool me once, whatever. You fool me twice, yeah, you know, it's not looking so good for Jolita. Very true. So, I think by this point in the previous round, Bleed had fully forfeited the map and Jolita had got that info. I think that we haven't quite established that as of yet. Jolita still have quite a lot of work to, to do here. But at least, like, they actually brought the EMPs this time. Realistically, they do have the tools to address this. Oh, they're actually going to drone it. <gasps> no way. <laughs> they that pretended so, they didn't, that, though. They bluffed like, they, it as well. They definitely saw that him, they right? They definitely saw him. Absolutely, yeah, they know he's there. Wow, that is some diligent drone work. Surely RDFC gets it here. Or Turd's just going to sit just there waiting. and wait. Oh, I, I mean, think they just have to push him out somehow. Oh, oh no. Mate. Here oh. we go. <laughs> Turd tried. I mean, not the greatest oh, use God. of the Solas, but hey. Oh, it was God. a fun little exchange, Mandy. You spotted it very yeah. early on. And uh, yeah, they got it in the end. What is going on there? Interesting. Why, why is he shooting around the cage? Charge, do you know at all? I personally do not. I do not. Okay. I'm once again puzzled. Okay, so there's 30 seconds left. Now, the one thing that Turd has been able to do, even though he's died, is waste a whole lot of time. And so now, Julita have to scurry along for an execute. I think the kitchen hatch is open now, so if they want to try and translate it for that, they can. But instead, they're going to go for a triple wall. This is way too late, Dev. 20 seconds to play. Lee looking very ready for this push. Julita, you're going to have to be explosive. You're going to have to make this count. DCH with the fuser in hand. Reeves, oh, he's almost got this angle. There's a big pick for Mr. Punch, but Mentalist is still immovable on the site, and Bleed have, well, simply withstood and allowed the timer to bleed down to zero. Nice attempt from Jolita, but, yeah, just far too little, far too late. Absolutely. Even though Turd did eventually fall in his roam, what it did do is it forced Jolita to actually, you know, divert their attention and go for the roam clear. And yeah, while well, it was done pretty handily, somehow RDFC didn't actually lose his life. He gets the 90 degree flick onto the player um, of Turd. By the time they actually hit the bomb site, there was only about 30 seconds left to do it. 
not only that, but in my opinion, Dev, they probably made the wrong decision there. I don't know whether it was like Kitchen Hatch was remained closed or something like that, but then coming down from Moto and then trying to make a triple wall push work when they hadn't got a, gotten open the wall, they probably didn't really have the utility to initiate an entry from going down either. It's pretty puzzling to me, the way that Jolita have been playing and reading into these late rounds, and Lee just looks so comfortable when it comes to the execute. Oh, very true. So what can Jolita do about it? Like, they've pretty decisively lost, I'd say, two of the four rounds in this half and had a real shot at two of them as well. So where to move on from here? I mean, realistically, losing any more rounds of their attack would be pretty grim. I don't know if you feel the same, Mandy, but yeah. I, I feel like Jolita has to come away with two attacks. I think it's a round by round thing at this point, right? Like, yeah, for Jolita, yes, ideally they don't go down to like a 5 1 or a 6 6 0 from this position here on out. They try and win out too. Um, we often say that two attacks here on club is the pass mark. Is that what we say these days, or do we not say yeah, that? Yeah, probably. Uh, I mean, it depends. It really depends. We had a really attacker sided club game in OC the other day. Where I don't want to talk two... about that one. That was. Yeah, a, that was. Yeah. That, so I don't I, think I, I'll ever... I don't like, know what to say. I don't think my brain will ever recover from the cells that I lost in that game. That is what I'll say. I don't know about you, Dev, but like that was a rough one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Yeah. All right, so... Jolita, what have you got for this round? This is Jim, right? I'm pretty sure this is Jim, yeah. unless it's Bar. Yeah, okay, good. Yeah, I was worried it was Bar for a second. I was going crazy. Yeah. Turn is spawn peeking. So, uh, of course he is. It's Turn. <laughs> Out of this cruisy wall. Is there anyone there? Someone there? I think so. Damn, that oh, was so there. underwhelming. I was so excited for that. Oh, they're all here. <laughs> that is how it happens though, Mandy, right? <laughs> like you go for your spawn peak and sometimes you're like, oh, never mind. Guess what? We have two hard breaches this time. Three hard breaches. They went from yes. having one to having three. I quite like. This is good. You know what that means? That means they have a lot of tools to pick apart the entire map. And that's good because they've actually all slipped through the ban phase. And there's a mirror on board as well for Asfi. So they've got plenty of this like range hard breach. They, actually, they don't really have a lot to do with this. Hey, it's really just the Selmos. They need to be pretty careful about that. But alas, yes, opening walls is a good thing on Clubhouse. And that Selma has now counted the mirror window. For the most part, the mirror itself's actually not been destroyed, but. We see a full crouch hole underneath it. Let's make things a little bit awkward. Hoven's going to try and fall back. Unfortunately, the Jolita weren't able to cut off any of these players falling back through the, the connector external wall, which is yet to be breached, despite having three hard breaches. And now we see external jacuzzi opened up. Leader's still not too unhappy about this. They still have really solid position behind that mirror window for one. So while they've managed to open up the exterior of the map, the interior of the map is now a problem. And a problem that they don't really have that many tools to fix, in my opinion. Attackers I don't know how many Selma charges G DCH has got, but getting this mirror uh, dismantled in Mensless position is going to be pretty tough. He's got one more, but he's on the wrong side of the map to do so. To me, this has to be enabled by the flashbangs, right? Sap has got them cooking at the moment, the Candelas. And off the back of that, they need to somehow convert this into a pick. Do they know something I don't? There's nobody in here. There's no one here. completely bewildered. Yeah, Jolita are starved for information. At least they have time. They don't have numbers, but they do have time. There's an opportunity here for Sapper to get a wall bang, but he doesn't know about it. In He's actually taking a big kill. Hoven finds the double, though. Where is this trade finally comes through? But IDFC is left all alone as Turnster manages to take down DCH after his entry. Now a 1v2 for a very low HP IDFC. Newest player on this roster. Let's see what he can do. Diffuser is on the ground. Is he tempting with the pistol? I'm not sure why he'd go with that. Didn't want to reload. He already was exposed. Now he's got that reload done. It's the 556. Five, but Turnster is holding the ankle and finds his head. Five rounds straight for bleed, Mandy. And yet another close round. But close doesn't mean anything if you can't rack up anything on the scoreboard. Yeah, really puzzling one there for Jolita. It kind of felt like they went into their tactical timeout and went, okay, we're struggling because things are staying closed. And then they all went half breach, but they didn't really know what to do with it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I don't know how much you would well, agree with that. Well, they didn't open con. Yeah, they, they that's didn't what open I'm con until. Like, yeah, you know, the order of operations, it kind of wasn't there, even though they had the equation, you know? 
And yeah, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, it is. So if you want to play really basic, like step one, open up CCTV. Step two, open up Con. You can even open up Con first if you want. It really kind of doesn't matter. Even do the thing that I think it was Bliss did at SI, where you have the Maverick open up the line while someone's actually holding an angle on Con, so you might even kill someone on the cross. And then you start to address like the CCTV slash cash slash top red hole. You counter that mirror. You start to put the pressure on. And then yep. when people fall back, you could potentially kill them on their retreat. Uh, there's just so many better ways to do that, and that's without even making things too complicated. Very strange. Very strange things are going on in the camp of Jolita. Now, whether this is just down to the fact that maybe they weren't expecting Clubhouse, and so maybe they're not as well drilled on this map or something like that through the veto. Maybe they haven't done enough dry runs to have made this work, but a lot of the decision making that they're going for here has been quite puzzling, to be honest. And I think in that essence, Bleed have been given a lot of wiggle room on the defense, which they've like fully capitalized on in every single situation. Like any sign that there's a hole in the attack, they've just filled that hole instantly. And that's like, that, that's sort of just what Bleed do. They're, they're such a fast paced team that you can't really give them that wiggle room. Otherwise they'll take it and then they'll shoot you. And that's been pretty bad so far for Jolita. Very true. One thing about Bleed is they always have their guns up. Like you, you never catch Bleed without their guns trained on an angle or without them ready to swing you. Yep. Speaking of, Sapper can't even walk past the Holies May without taking a quarter of his HP as damage. Really solid setup here. Reefs is even protected with these castle barricades down in lounge, and he's got a BPC to use as well. Now, Mr. Punch is a pretty solid operator, being the sledge to counter these castle barricades, but it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Okay, so Maverick on the board does mean that the wall can be Mav tricked open, which is a good start. What's Turd holding? What angle is he watching right now? Is he contesting the bridge? Can I do not know. I oh, think he's, he's just he's on, a camera. on a camera. Yeah, right, okay. Okay. I thought he was contesting the Mav holes. <laughs> brave. That could be a fun one. This feels way too passive for me, for Jolita. We need to see a, a more proactive approach to address this setup, especially Reaps, who's still very fortified here. It looks like, once again, they're going to try and sneak in to deal with Reap. So Sapper's all the way down here inside of oh. me, and he's just gone and backstabbed him completely. But never mind, there's a trade immediately that comes out from Mentalist all the way at top red. There is a bit of presence out on the ground floor, but then translating it from the ground floor to the top floor is the tricky part. When you've got a BP looking at you, and you've got two players in rafters, Garage is pretty dangerous here. At least that Bulletproof has now been destroyed. Mr. Punch is making his way up through secret. DCH is now in Garage. Oh, a player's oh, just going to jump God. over! He does find one before he's traded dropped. on back. But <laughs> realistically, Mr. Punch should be able to trade this. No! Turd finds him. Six and one. Untouchable is this man. He doesn't need the warden. He doesn't need the mozzie. Give him Doc and he will farm. Now Mark and IDFC in a 2v3. But Mandy, they have made good progress. Finally, they have cleared out Garage. But numbers in deficit. Oh! oh. Wall bank! But it's the Doc and Turd can just revive himself. All the way back up to full oh, wow. HP. Back under cover. Flash could enable this. IDFC needs to cover. It's Mark with the diffuser. He doesn't have the ability to vault over through the hole. He's got to jump through this window here. Mentalist, he's taken out. IDFC right, needs it. to be good for another, but Turdstar, he's not done. Diffuser now in pocket. 15 seconds. Turdstar holding behind the green box. He knows he doesn't have to peek. IDFC's got to land both of these two. He knows where the last is. And he will just have enough time to get this diffuser down. Asfi oh, must him. clutch up for the perfect half. The plan confirmed! Jolita! IDFC, the rookie, he clutches up. Finally, Jolita have found their first round. Oh man, poor Asfi. They're on the one versus one situation there. Eight seconds on the clock it means that they can just get land the diffuse in time, what ADFC could, and he could pop up and get the kill as well. And somehow when Asfi actually entered into the bomb site. He didn't actually know where the plant was going down either. But yeah. the thing that bothers me the most about that is that the instant trade didn't come through, right? Like the player behind the green box has just died. Where is the repeat to go Should for that trade? Should be swinging immediately I, I mean, on that, right? I know that's a bit of a nitpicky thing to say, and you could easily make the argument that there was little time, so maybe he could have just played the time, which is essentially what he did there. But yeah, Jolito with a big comeback there, honestly. Those those two players there being able to isolate the player on top of on top of red with the flashbangs, making sure that the players in cash weren't part of the equation once they took that fight there. 
They took the 2v1, got into the bomb sites, played the trade game, and then somehow IDFC manages to win it out in the one versus one. <laughs> this was the most peculiar part of the round for me. They both Wait, jumped at the same why time. did they do that? They committed to the double drop, and you know what? It worked out for Turd, but it didn't work out for the round. Yeah, it realistically should have worked out for the round. I mean, this was just a 1v2 clutch from IDFC. Not much more to say there. He really stepped up. I think you hit the nail on the head there. Like, Asfi needed to swing as Turd died. He needed to swing the Condor at that exact moment. Not doing so was what cost lead the round, essentially. But yeah, Shalita finally had their first. But I just want to give a moment to appreciate how good Bleed are. Like, even that round. Like, everything they do, they do together. Even look at the fact that Reeps yeah, died sure. at the bottom of red, right? And you've already got Mentalist, Mentalist coming down track. red stairs. Yeah. yeah, like he was already coming down red stairs before that engagement happened because he was preparing to support his teammate. And that's just how this team works. Like everything they do, they do together. Let's make a plate and try and kill the player bottom garage. Yeah, let's both jump off Raptors at once. That's the kind of synergy that is the marker of a really, oh, really Sapper. tough team. Sappa, oh, he's got to time this right. He does get the kill on Hoven. He loses most of his HP for it, but a kill is a kill at the end of the day, and that's a huge amount of util bled. Wow, I mean, that's so random. I could, Hovind's probably turned around and be like, what on earth has just happened to me? That is criminal. Meanwhile, Reaps is going to try and take down some of these players over in the ground floor. Turner's is going to go for the pinch over uh, from the strip side of the map as well. They have got info uh -oh. on the player inside a bar. DCH, the foot is sticking out. Whether he knows it or not, he knew absolutely nothing, as uh, Turd can take him down from the other side. These goo mines have been constant. I just heard one, I think it's Reaps. Yeah, he's pulling it out now. But he has already deployed his util on the ram. The auto breaches and stop the floor. Very good. I don't know, I feel like Bleed's actually in a really solid spot, man. He, despite losing that opening pick, DCH went down for nothing. All the hatches are open, over a minute to go. Really solid, well, maybe not all the hatches, but you know, this stock one won't last long. And they're already bleeding out some of this util on site as well. Canisters. I think decision making period here is pretty important for Bleed to be able to convert this one. It does look like they're poised for a kitchen hatch drop, especially having cleared out the entirety of the back of Arsenal uh, from that vertical as well. And having turned positions here inside of Dirt to make sure that, you know, he can play the crossfire from when that blue push comes through as well. So the fuse has actually been dropped on the ground from Aspie. They're gonna go to look for kills first. Attackers recover the Turd's position has been revealed, but Reaps has also found his pick. So this is very awkward now. Oh, Mark, be careful, mate. Be oh, what no. are you doing? Oh, no. What is going on? The fat finger. Oh, no. He's going to die because of it. And Sapper now has to clutch up 1v2. He could get info on this plant if he used his gadget, but he hasn't as of yet. Oh, massive impact. A 4K on the round. Sapper. This guy's insane. He's aced up and he's kept them alive. Jalita. You've got one man to thank, and that's this guy right here, Sapper the God. I can't believe what we've just watched, Dev. I actually cannot believe what we have just watched. Sapper somehow manages to find an ace. He does the most random run out onto Hoven. Probably had no idea what he's just died to until he did a 180, <laughs> got off his drone, and was like, uh oh, there are Solace on the board, hey. Then somehow Mark gets on his camera in the middle of a gunfight and then Sapper clutches it in a one versus three. Th that could not have been a more chaotic round if you tried to script it, Dev. That was crazy from <laughs> Sapper to f somehow find an ace in that situation. Yeah. Yeah, Sapper's a god. I don't know what to say. He's, he's insane. He has just stolen a round that should squarely have been bleeds. I also don't know what was going on from, uh, was it DCH? Who, who was it that was in the site underneath the uh, underneath the kitchen floor that trying was, to contest yeah, it that, that just gets Mark. on the camera? Fuck, oh, yeah, man, bro, what's... Yeah, those fingers. Oh, yeah. God. Don't hit that button by accident, man. Oh, man, it is Struggle Street. Yeah, I mean, this kill first to start things off. Hoven's probably like, oh, no, danger. And then he's on 1 HP for the rest of the round as well. Yeah, like, he how got has, four kills on yeah, one eight. How oh, has Sapper painful. found four kills and no one is looking at him? Like, wow. I mean, impact skill, fair enough. And then Aspie's just not looking at him because he can't even go read. through the rotate. Yeah, that's crazy. Sapper's not even that pumped. He's just kind of <laughs> laughing at that as well. That was awesome from Sapper. I love to see that. A bleed to their next round and they're wasting no time whatsoever. Hoven's already in the building on the Brava with the entry. Asfi's coming to support and he's opened up a really solid line of sight. This is just what you expect out of Bleed. Like, they're so fast, they're so well coordinated, they already know their plan. 
uh, and the round has barely even started. It's beautiful. Already putting a huge amount of pressure here on this CCTV side when their bomb side is over in Jim the bedroom. I quite like the introduction of the Brava as well from Hoven, especially when you're the likes oh. of, you know, the uh, Maestro's in play. So Terra's just found a kill onto Sapper, maybe feeling a bit too overconfident from his ace in the last round. The Claymore. Easy first Who pick. Who's that Claymore? I have no idea. It looks like on the balcony somewhere, right? Oh, yeah. There I think it was... Was it... Oh, okay. Well, Asfi yeah. took a lot of damage. I assume that Sapper got a few bullets in before he died. Oh, it must have been... Yeah, okay. They had two Claymores here, I guess. Or they put another Claymore down since because he jumped out and then saw the Claymore there, so... Interesting. Yeah. Very, Very interesting. interesting. Alas, what I was saying was I quite liked the idea of the Brava into the Maestro as well. I'm not sure how quickly they managed to identify that, but I think fairly good counter for this situation as well. And the bring along double hard reach too. And also Ash, so plenty of stuff to deal with mirrors. I feel like at the moment for Bleed, they've got all the tools that they need to break apart this defense slowly. As you say that, they've opened up the con wall looking at Ash and have a deep angle into sight. It's waiting for someone to walk by and get a kill. He's checking. There's no mute jammer on the wall. Mentalist can open that up seemingly for free. This is having a phenomenal game, by the way. Ooh, is that an impact? A lot of damage, actually, funnily enough. Mark has been taken low and now finished off. DCH finds one. What are you doing, Mr. Punch? Getting very aggressive. DCH has gone down. IDFC versus the world. That's the first. We've seen big clutches already from Sapper last round. IDFC now has to do it this round. The Mentalist swings and finds him. Bleed cruise their way onto match points. Very clean attack there from Bleed. They didn't, uh, you know, they didn't overcommit to the sweep across the map. They did what they needed to get the garage entry and make sure cash is completely vacated. But then from there on out, they flipped over their setup, made sure they had con control, go on with Kajuzi, deal with the mirror, go for the execute from there. That being said, Jolita did get a little bit over aggressive, I would say, in some of their peaks through the mid round there, which probably enabled Bleed even more so to convert that one into the late round. But I would say overall, Bleed, I think, fully utilized every single piece of their utility to slowly break apart that top floor bomb site, And that made Jalita feel really uncomfortable on the defense. It maybe they felt like they were forced to go for the peaks that they did in the end. But either way, they were pretty ill-advised and Bleed punished them for it. Yeah, Bleed are just so good, man. I don't know, I, I really enjoy watching Bleed even when they are kind of farming, just because they're yeah. so good. They're really good. In their current form, they are hands down one of the best teams in the world. And you're going to have the snobs from from Europe and, and North America be like, these guys are like, mate, they, <laughs> they could be top eight at the next major. And I would not be surprised. Like, there's the level of fundamentals you see out of this roster. Really solid team. I'm not saying that they're going to beat FaZe Clan the next time they meet, but I also wouldn't be surprised if they continue taking scalps off of these big name teams, right? Like these, sure. these guys are so good and they keep that form up in their local league as well. We see so many teams struggle locally, uh, from mainly from other regions. Like a lot of the big teams have had a few notable losses, but like you know, these guys, they're in great form. They 2 0 Los at SI. They were one round off of beating Virtus Pro. You know, they beat Team Liquid. They got a map off of W7M, you know, the world champions, heard of them. One of the only teams to do that. And they come back to Asia League and they continue that, that level of form against these teams that simply cannot keep up. I totally agree with you that they're a force to be reckoned with. And I feel like we can dive into this point about, you know, them being in their local league and being strong a bit later on. But for now, I think the round is playing out. So I don't want to delay this too much <laughs> because this is a pretty interesting setup that Hoven has got going. So he's using Aspie's shield to see through the glass into rafters. And he's using it to it. shoot down some of these my gadgets, try and find a pick. Not only that, but he's also Capital. So if he wants to sink some of his utility, he can do that behind the safety of his teammate. Ooh, Ooh that's dangerous. Expose himself for a brief second. And that does tell us that Delita are watching him. Now, can he make this work? Oh, he no, he gets down and there's no one to back him up. Mark has managed to stay alive, but here we go. Mentalist has come there Great to entry. support. Classic bleed. Not to allow this to trickle down. However, Sapper has had a good reply. Now, Hoven has been picked up, but the Goos are still at large despite the Legion going down. Big C4 from DCH. This has been a phenomenal reply here from Jolita all up to Turd and Hoven. Hoven's in a really awkward spot now, low HP. Turd's is still farming 11 and 3, looking for more. Don't ride it over until it's done, Mandy, but this mm -hmm. has been a great round from Jolita. 
Oh, nice pick as well from DCH onto Hoven, who is already pretty low, and that leaves Turd in the one versus three. Now, there is a player in Rafters. I don't know who they are, but don't peek. They know. Turd knows. Oh, he's in the Shadow Realm, though, so he goes for the peek. It's actually Mr. Punch on the other side. No, it's not. It's DCH. Both the MP7 brothers. And Turd thinks the better of it, because he can't quite get rid of that Fenrir gadget, and is going to either go onto the roof and chill out for a bit, or make an attempt at this 1v3. And he fails. Yeah, Mr. Punch can take him down pretty easily. Good read from Mr. Punch. Well played there from uh, from Jolita. We saw a good active defense, didn't we, Mandy? Like, yeah, lead is so active. clever and uh, and creative on their attack. I really like the idea of using that Monty shield as a bit of a, a mirror window, but yeah, obviously didn't work. Really active from Jolita. There was some good utility sunk there from Jolita. Once they realized that the rafters push was going through, they had not one but two players there, one on the window, one uh, on the longer part of the rafters. And um, yeah, from there on out, they also sunk some good C4s as well from within the bomb site as well. So yeah, ultimately there for Jolita, just things going the right way. Not only that, but I think they even found some kills on the vertical um, as there were some players in the ground floor too. So just making sure that they both the time and held onto the lines of sight that they could comfortably play. That's something more, a little more defender sided. And yeah, cl a clean round there from Jolita, although it was a good idea from Bleed. Jolita looking a lot better on their defense than they did on their attack. Perhaps, maybe with the exception of that gym bedroom round. I don't know, maybe maybe that's a big call to make actually, because even the first round of defense, they only won thanks to Sap's ace. Mm. I think Bleed are just so good on their attack. Yeah. It's a pleasure to watch. Um, and that was really the only yeah, convincing round we've seen for Jolita so far, I would say. Both of the other two they've won were on clutches, a 1v2 and then a 1v3 or 4, right? So, yeah. maybe Bleed need to keep an eye on, on this, because the majority of rounds they've lost this game have been to clutches. Maybe that's one of their few weaknesses at the moment. And it sounds strange to be knocking on a team that's currently 6-3 up, but like that's where Bleed are right now. They need to be looking at the tiniest little improvements that they can make, because that will make the difference between you know, making main stage or not making main stage at upcoming majors. It's how do we lock in our 3 versus 2s, our, our 4 versus 2s, our, our 2 versus 1s, the minute fundamentals they're already so good at, but there's always room for improvement. Ooh, speaking of. Ooh, that's quite nice. Detail. I do want to piggyback off your point that we were talking about for Bleed earlier as well. I, I think they really are a force to be reckoned with, both locally and internationally. But something that like Hollis was like sort of mentioning in his interview, I know we didn't get a lot of it, but it was that the quality of Rainbow Six that they get here in especially the BO1 phase and even in practice out of the Asia League is not like that high. And something that he was saying was that when he gets to the best of threes, he's actually genuinely looking forward to having like better games of Rainbow Six. And I think for Bleed, they can wow. be sort of skill caps in their situation, being locally here inside of Asia. And I think it's important for them to not only maintain their form here in Asia, but also be learning things that can be applied internationally as well. And that's a really hard balance to hold when you're in APAC. Anyway, there's been some really good stuff here from Jolita, meanwhile, on the defense as well. Not only has GCH managed to trick the wall while the Castle Barricade was open in gym, by the way, but they also haven't managed to make the entry work on the other side of the map either. So really nothing is going well for Bleed right now. Jolita are holding on. I mean, credit to Bleed, they played this pretty well, but Jolita was just one step ahead. Like you said, DCH actually managed to trick both walls. Firstly, he did over here on CCTV, and then he had a good read that Bleed wanted to go and rotate and get Jacuzzi next, and he actually ran over, despite there being a Lion Scan no, no. active, and got back to site in time to trick that second one. Really good timing. He even called his teammate to come and help. Sappa has now lost his life. I don't know, despite the early round going against Jolita, it might actually be possible for Bleed to... Hey, good on this, Mark, though. He's still alive. He's looking for another one, and he's taken down Asfi all up to Reaps now. Mark has really farmed this round. He got half his kills. More than half his kills well, have come from just this one round. Big play from him. Your leader have actually strung together three defenses now. Perhaps all is not over yet. Very solid round there for Jolita. They had really won out in the mini game battle on Clubhouse there, playing the trick game, not just on the CCTV side of the map, but somehow he rotates all the way to the other side of the map, like literally to the other side of the top floor. And then also wrote, manages to trick the jacuzzi wall. Not only that, but he tricks the jacuzzi wall while the windows are both open that are leading into him doing the trick, but somehow there are no plays on the attack to take him down from there. So he finds the perfect timing to take down the exothermic charge. And from there, Bleed just looked pretty lost. They didn't have anything open for them. They had to go for a last-ditch swip on the other side. But then even then, the entry didn't go their way. Somehow, 
Jelita able to find the opening pick and then translated it from there, even though there were some pretty scrappy trades going on back and forth. Really good run from Jelita. Yeah, good enough that Bleed have actually decided to take their tactical timeout. Now, remember in the first half, it was after losing four rounds in a row that Jelita took theirs, and they actually lost the next one. So that was really desperate. I think for Bleed right now, they're still, they're not quite desperate yet, but you really don't want to be losing any more rounds here. You should be able to lock out the full three points from this game. And critically for Bleed, it's just about getting back on the horse when realistically there's only been two rounds that they convincingly lost. The other two that they lost were clutches. So Bleed should be able to look at that and say, we just need to tighten things up a little bit. Uh, of course, they are going on to Church Arsenal, which they had a really solid attack onto, and then Sapper just ace clutched. So if I am in Bleed's shoes right now, I think that I'll be pretty confident with the majority of the push. It's just about tightening up a few things. I would have to agree with that for Bleed. They need to retain the composure here on the attack. And attacking on Clubhouse can always be quite challenging, um, especially against a team like Jolita, where at the moment they're playing a pretty proactive game on the defense. They're trying to be active through all points of the round from the early game to the late game, and they're not wasting any of their time or space. It can be quite tricky. And I think for Bleed here, yeah, taking that tactical timeout just to reset mentally and completely say like, okay, guys, we're dying to silly mistakes. Even though they're trying to break apart the map methodically, they're not doing it methodically enough because they're not doing it step by step. They're not waiting for their teammates to complete the previous one before doing the next one, right? So taking that tactical timeout is a great opportunity to reset and go back into it. Well, it starts with a roam clear. Last time we saw, I believe it was, was it DCA trying on the Legion? And he was the one that was, his feet was spotted in uh, bar through the... Yeah. Barricade in uh, in pool. The last time he died really early, but Sapper got that active kill with the Solus. Um, so bleed. Our experience of dealing with this roam clear, um, but you know a lot can go wrong as well with it as we've seen. The leader are the ones that have really made the most changes. No more Solus, notably. Bit of a flip of some of these operators. Good late round Utah with the Goyo, the Smoke, and the Fenrir all really leaning into that time denial and entry denial in that late round. Some good drone work so far from the support players on the side of Bleed. They've identified that the entire top floor and what it looks like now, the ground floor, is completely vacated by Jolita, who have all fallen back onto the bomb site. IDFC is going to hold onto the blue stairs for a little bit longer, trying to juggle around some of these dread mines and uh, prevent Bleed from getting the early control here. But it is a pretty dangerous spot to play, and you can be cut off from what you're He wants to fall back pretty early. Meanwhile, though, on the side of Bleed, it's time for these guys to start making some good work out of this mid-round. Getting those hatches open, playing the vertical from Reefs, which with the auto-ram drones, they should be fairly easy to do. But yeah, so far, Bleed doing some good motions through this mid-round. Out go the ram drones! We've seen this a lot recently, and it's just beautiful to watch. And on top of that, we've also had the hatch getting worked on. Now, Sapper is going to actually impact trick that... Oh. No, oh, he's... Oh, he's getting impacted at the next set, perhaps. He only just opened up the hole. Is he going to impact? Mean, there you go. There's a good one. That's pretty dangerous. Reefs, Reefs is, is contesting him. They can find a kill out of this. Either side, that would be huge. Okay, a third Xkaris does detonate. If we can have a look at the full HUD, we can see how many are left. So this is the last set. Or second last set. Oh, Ooh, don't Reefs. shoot them off. Ooh. Yeah, really don't shoot them <laughs> off. Now, fortunately, there are enough. No way! No Reefs should have died there, but Mark didn't <laughs> land the shot he needed. Reeps gets away with his life and finds a kill. Turdster, oh, he's lurking. He's going for it, man. Look at him go, bleed. They've got a two-player advantage. Turdster's position revealed. Looking to make this execute work. Turd is kept at bay. He still is alive, and he's looking for this deep angle. Flashes go out. Hoven straight drops down into the fire, but he finds a kill on the back of it. IDFC looks to replace the position as that plant goes down. DCH, he's taken down the backstab from Turd. IDFC 1v3, but that plan has not gone down as of yet. He could clutch up again! How do they keep getting away with it? Thank God, Bleed! Thank God in the 1v1 they got across the line! Holy sh shenanigans! <laughs> what was that from Bleed? Oh my God. 4v1! It was a 4v1! I know, another one that comes down to a one versus one that Aspie's involved in as well. Oh, that poor guy has just been cursed with the 1v1s in this matchup. But Bleed, the reset was what they needed. They take that tactical timeout and they worked that map super quick there in that last round there, Dev. I know that ended in a super chaotic way, but like, I'm 
trying to give someone like, a bleed here. They're doing good, you know? <laughs> they, they do great, but man, bleed, you guys are amazing. Like, legit, world-class team. Yeah, amazing. You don't see many teams that good. But stop giving me a headache in these 4v1s, 3v1s, 2v1s. I swear to God. Desk, please take it away. Yeah, close uh, close end there. <laughs> I think that got us all on the edge of our seats. Just uh, That just goes to show the uh, the beautiful nature that is a game with Jolita in it. Uh, Xenox, what have, you, what have you read into on this one? It felt like it was going to be a, a near-on onslaught. That could have been, that very well could have been a 7-0. Yeah, I mean, it was trending in that direction. I made a very short-handed comment to Gus, and I was like, where were these games when we were up until four in the morning and we were looking at, like, a, about finishing 20 minutes ago? But, no, honestly, at least good for Jolita. They were able to bring it back, and they were able to at least save face. Um, they don't win it out, but still, at least it doesn't look like the, the beatdown that I think it was trending towards. I think, in the end, it's Defender Club, Clubhouse, right? I mean, that tells the full tale of the tape. Yeah, I, it's funny to watch that game play out the way it does because I think Dev put it perfectly, Guys, There's not much you can really pinpoint uh, for Bleed, but just apparently clutch moments. They're just, they're getting overzealous. I, I, what is it? I mean, uh, the, as Fri has mentioned, just kept getting caught in these particular scenarios. There was the first one up above CCTV where he baited his teammate and then lost the clutch, and then there were multiple ones after that. The very last one, though, he was able to get that swing, get the clutch. I, if Bleed lose that one, that probably could have been the round that kind of broke the camel's back, really, because they had multiple, yeah. multiple rounds where it was very close. Um, either very close towards the very end, or they were just never in it, um, such is the nature of Bleed at times, but... They got that one across the line, and uh, ultimately, I think the plaudits go to Jolita for you know continuing to fight in that match despite things looking mm. grim heading into the second half, and then obviously to bleed as well, and just being able to close it out and keeping that record running. Jake, what's your take on Jolita at the moment? It feels like we've we've had enough games to see uh, you know the full force. They've they've obviously taken it to bleed. Granted, probably could have been closed out a little bit quicker, but where where do you feel like they fit in this league at the moment? I mean, it's difficult. Are they below Fury? They beat Fury all the way back on Play Day 1, which feels like a lifetime ago. I probably would put them just that tiny smidge below Fury. I think maybe in a best of three, you could argue that they're more than capable, but arguably Fury have probably shown a little bit more internationally and also locally that you'd put them above them despite that Play Day 1 overtime win. Yeah, I mean, they're not really like far off it, right? I mean, at the end of the day for Jolita, um the the issue for mine is they also haven't really beaten a whole lot of other teams they lost to elevate now they've lost to bleed so it really is only that overtime win against fury we'll know a little bit more about them probably tomorrow when they take on dire wolves that's the kind of game you've got to be winning if you lose that then you've lost to dire wolves bleed and you've also lost uh to elevate the only team you would have beaten is fury so i think that doesn't probably then bode well for them going into the playoffs yeah it's just wild that that could potentially happen. I mean, with the, we're, that's a that's a stretch, obviously. You know, we're trying to open this conversation up a little bit to, I guess, hypothetically look at where Jolita fit into this. Uh, it, it's tough to say, especially after a match like that against Bleed. Clubhouse is just, it's so brutal on the defense. You know, barring if uh, anyone watched those last night, barring those last night, it really is just such a brutal map to start attack on, especially when you're already going uphill against the best team in the region. I think, guys, there's, I mean, as if there wasn't a doubt coming into this league, but I mean, are you, are you certain that they're the best team now? Yeah, I think it's very fair to say um, on a night where the late round's tidy, they're going to look even more dominant because you could see in terms of their ability to set up def you know, just default attacking patterns and clear positions and get space, etc. Not really an issue um, and defensively sound as well for the most part. It was really just the late round and Jolita having a knack for finding themselves back into pretty stupid and ridiculous positions. And obviously Bleed will know that. And uh, if that's tidied up going forward, they'll continue to be number one. All right, well, uh, I, I'm not sure whether we're going to get an interview yet or whether we're waiting for one. So we can just open this up a little bit, Xenox, and uh, just try to give uh, give the players a little bit more time to, to get sorted. <laughs> Moving into playoffs, uh, you know, we are kind of talking about the fact that we don't have that many flaws, but very, very clearly you can wound them is is that enough to warrant the conversation maybe outside of fury actually being able a, a team actually being able to contest them 
Uh, yeah, I think the Bleeder are a great team, but they certainly have their flaws. We've seen that previously throughout last year and somewhat to also begin this year. They're not infallible. Uh, I don't think they're the kind of team that, are, for instance, you can't be. They're probably more than capable of dropping a map or two go come playoff time if they have a bad night and then you lose that, it can probably snowball. I will say, though, I think Bleed are probably in the best position they've ever really been in in terms of mental. They look like a really strong, coordinated team across the board. All five players typically play well. There's no weak link, so... I mean, it's really difficult to play devil's advocate against Bleed. We we keep saying, and we've been harping on all league long, they are the number one team for a reason. They're the team that are favored to go to Manchester. It's just a matter of, will they stumble a little bit like the start of last year? Or have they continued to improve? And I think they've continued to improve. I don't see another team beating them, not even Fury. So, uh, But that means the onus is on your Furies, your Jalitas, your Diwals, et cetera, to, to somehow change that narrative. Uh, well, we've actually got Mentalist here, so we can start chatting to him a little bit more and get some insight. Uh, Mentalist, I'm sure you probably heard the back end of uh, our conversation there. We kind of we started waffling after a little bit. I do want to get your thoughts at the moment. You know, you guys are. I mean, you've won every game. Granted, seven three seven fours, so it's not it's not like you're absolutely smashing these teams out of the water. But from my perspective, it looks like it is comfortable, which is a strange thing to be saying. Uh, you know, six days in. Um, I think fundamentally we're stronger than these teams just with our experience alone. So mm -hmm. to answer your question, yes, we can win comfortably just because we can do our defaults better, we can coordinate with them better, our fundamentals are stronger. But I think today, for all, all intents and purposes, today should have been a 7-0. And the fact that we dropped it all the way to 7-4 was, I'm not happy with the way we won. And our attack has a lot of problems like today that we can sort out. And to be honest, if we play like this today, they like today in playoffs, we're going to lose. Like teams are going to be more prepared. They're going to counter strat. Like we're not going to be able to deal with it. I think, yeah, I'm just really upset with the way we played on tap today. And hopefully we can fix that. But otherwise, if we can do everything properly, then beating every team shouldn't be a problem. Mentos, unfortunately for Asia League, going from two slots to one does put a bit of pressure on all of the teams. And there's a lot of good teams vying for that one spot. Do you approach the playoffs a little differently this stage compared to, say, last year when there were two slots? Do you feel like it might be more pressure on teams come playoff time? Um, of course. Like before, there was the safety net of, you know, you can always be on the other side of the bracket or you can always win out in the loser bracket. But now you've got to be everyone, right? Straight up. Mm -hmm no second chances. So of course, there's going to be a lot of more pressure on every single team that's involved in qualifiers. For us, our goal has always been to just beat everyone in Southeast Asia no. um, and make it to the qualifiers. So our goal doesn't really change. And at the end of the day, not having that safety net doesn't really change our mindset. We still have to go in and just get ready to beat everyone. Um, speaking on the mental impact of uh, the, the game today a little bit more in terms of round to round, obviously the late rounds were very, very close multiple times or Jolita were clutching rounds, etc. How do you, as a team, continue to reset and continue to go again? I know you've mentioned it should have been a 7-0, but you did close it out in the end. How difficult was that in the moment inside of the server? Uh, it was pretty difficult, honestly. It was like a 1v2 that we threw and then 2v4 and then we almost threw 1v4 at the end. That was just completely horrendous. And... To be honest, I think it's just us, like, at the end of the round, we're not really communicating as much as we need to. Maybe our individual players are, like, um, have to drop down a little bit, not calming enough. But yeah, that's definitely something that we need to look back on the comms and see what happened and fix it individually. But yeah, I do think, at the end of the day, today, we didn't come in as prepared as it can be. So hopefully tomorrow, we'll get that fixed. And by the time when the playoff comes, this will happen. Now, look, uh, on the broadcast, you guys are pretty much nigh untouchable. Whenever we br mention bleed, it's pretty much synonymous that we're mentioning victory or something, uh, you know, positive in that light. But you have mentioned the comms. Do you feel like there's anything outside of that that, uh, you know, you have identified or, or as a team you've identified needs to be changing moving forward? Um, I think fundamentally, our teams uh, are pretty solid. There isn't mm. anything the ground up that we do need to change it's just uh like every when you come to become a decent team all the little improvements come from all the details and it is important to first recognize these details know what you can improve and just day by day improve on them um mm. so yeah patience is going to be key but for us this time i don't think that is the reason it's just uh, 
maybe a few of us has our B game or C game today. So we're going to see like yeah. what happened and how we can help with that. God, that's terrifying. You shouldn't be saying you're bringing your B or C game and you're still doing that to a team. God <laughs> damn it, mentalist. Uh, anything you'd like to say before we let you go? Uh, not much. Just thank you everyone for supporting. Uh, hopefully we'll keep our, our form in the playoffs and we'll smash it. Mate, thank you very much for joining us and best of luck for the rest of the uh, BO1s. It's pretty terrifying. I, I think everyone would agree. Uh, if that is what you look like on your worst day, clearly Mentalist is not happy about that, Guz. Clearly he's quite... Shaken might not be the right word, but he did look quite shaken in terms of, you know, his frustration levels. If that's what you're still doing to teams on your worst day in the league thus far, I don't want to see their best day. I, do, I don't want to see it. Yeah, I think he's being, he's being quite harsh, but also reasonable and fair on his team's performance today. Um, if you are a top team, you realistically shouldn't be allowing a lesser team back into a lot of those unfavorable rounds in which they were able to clutch up. So as he mentioned, they'll look back at that and try to identify exactly what went wrong, whether it was communication or you know, position or a read or whatever the case was. And as long as they refine that going forward, um, any improvement is going to be massive for this team who are already at the top currently. So I, I liked what we heard there from Mantle, some really good insight and um, clearly not taking this position for granted and know that the job is far from done. It is so far from done, it's not even funny. Um, and there's definitely, yeah. I think, probably a bit of um, reflection as well on, on last year. We all know what happened where they bombed out and they don't want a repeat of that this year. Look, I think it's very similar to the conversation we had uh, about Odium and Bliss back in uh, on Monday for the OS League, Jake, whereas, you know, it's it's kind of good to get these out of the way, right? It's good to to realize that, you know, you are you you might be the indomitable force in the league, but you still have your weaknesses. Yeah, and I agree with guys. I think Mentalist was a little bit harsh, um, but good to be harsh rather than soft and just kind of brush these performances. They understand there's a lot of pressure come playoff time and um you know performing not quite at your best uh does then allow weaknesses to creep in interesting we see turd there as the mvp statistically the lowest rated player on the team coming into tonight not that Wild. he's far behind he's, he was still like 1.08 but i mean that performance tonight and he actually to give him a bit of a spotlight has continued to improve as the stage has gone on started a little bit slow uh, but I think he's actually peaking at the right time and certainly uh, gives Bleed another avenue. Asfi was the one who was a little bit poor tonight, typically a player who is quite strong up with Reaps and Hoven, um, but they had Turd that was able to kind of fill the gap. So a really strong performance from Bleed once again, taking down a yeah, decent Jolita team. So I think Bleed will uh, obviously be a little bit unhappy with that comeback, but nevertheless should be happy with the win. Yep, nigh flawless at the moment for Bleed Esports. They've still got two more games to go in their best of ones, as we still have two more games left for the night. Join Dev and Mandy on the desk as we return from the break.
have waited five long years for Siege to come back to Brazil. Now. The Gimnasio do Ibirapuela is the home to the hammer as we get set to write the next chapter in R6 Esports history. This is the Six Invitational 2024. Vamos para Samba Ruyo! Six Invitational 2024 starts right now. Thanks, Clan. W7M. Vamos Vamos and it's all falling apart for W7M once again. But it is happening for FaZe. round away from cementing themselves. W7M respond. You wanted to fight him! We cannot. We know we can't have this fight. It's a red time. He can't finish it. He's no brother. Infinite overtime is upon us. And we get it. We get it. This is how legends are created. Is this the moment where we can crown? champion a new dynasty to be created and yes we will yes we will Welcome back from the break. We're now into the second half of the night, which means we get some uh, some nicer faces on the desk. Thank God, some more kind and gentle people to work with. Uh, you know, you can only work with them for so long. That's all I'm going to say. But uh, Dev, uh, a very very interesting final match that you got to cast there. A little bit of a strange mm. round. Yes, very strange ending to that game. I, as I was saying to you off air, was convinced that Jolita had won that round. Yep. I was as bewildered as you guys, but it was a great game regardless. 7-4 uh, was weird. Like, the first couple of rounds felt like it, it should have been like a 2-2 or something like that. Uh, ended up like a 4-0 start uh, for 5-0, in fact, for bleed. Yeah, weird game. Jolita won a ridiculous amount of clutches and almost clutched it to keep the game going, but uh, yep. alas, bleed locked it in. Mentalist, really, in his interview, I think was quite telling how disappointed he was in the team. It shows you like bleed are insane but their expectations are so much higher and if that is like the b grade or c grade roster um of bleed like i would l shudder to to imagine what they can achieve uh, when they're on their a game yeah it's always good to hear uh players be humble about their performances but sometimes even then you've got to say well you know <laughs> still as close to being a 7-0 mate so <laughs> it can't have been that bad we move on to a team at the moment that seems to be going through look 
I, just a stage. That's all I'm going to say. Knock, knock. They come into this game with only one win on the board. Negative 11 round differential. Mandy, it, it, it's obviously a very difficult conversation when it comes to uh, the bottom three teams at the moment because they are, I mean, they're all neck and neck essentially, but it really, it, it just doesn't look great for them there. Uh, no, it certainly doesn't. The only team that I believe that Nokorok has actually defeated is the other South Asian team of Hasid Warriors, right? So ultimately, these guys are trying to battle their way out of elimination. Now, they've, they've gotten their way out of eighth place at this stage, but can they get out of seventh? That's going to be the question for these guys. And honestly, I think it's going to be pretty tricky for these guys to do. Not only do they have to take down the Dire Wolves here, but then they've got Fury as their next matchup as well. And then Jolita following from that side. So they've got pretty tricky opponents from here on out especially losing out to daystar early on uh, definitely doesn't help their cause either so for me yeah. amongst their three opponents that they now have to face direwolves are definitely the weakest ones which is this current yeah. matchup going in i think for knock knock if they want to escape that seventh place position this is a must win for them it uh, honestly i couldn't have put it any better myself this is the only game this is really the only three points out of the next nine points that could potentially even walk into the realm of conversation direwolves have had a, a rocky stage as well you know they they've beaten uh daystar and hasib warriors and outside of that dev they just haven't been able to get the uh the the points on the board that i'm sure they would have hoped for yeah, and they're currently in fifth place, so they are in theory like in danger of elimination. However, with how Knock Knock Daystar and Hasib Warriors have been playing, I think Direwolves are probably safe. However, if this game ends up a loss for Direwolves, uh, maybe we'll be having quite a different conversation. Uh, mm. And yeah, these guys really need to try and get their, themselves together, fix up their act, because they should be realistically like contesting for the top. Once upon a time, Direwolves were the best team in this region, right? Like, yeah. Do you have to look pretty far back to, to <laughs> those good old days, uh, about a yeah. year and a half ago? Uh, at least. Uh, but yeah, Souffle and Pika are still on this roster. Uh, they've got an, a new, very formidable pickup in uh, in Joe Gore. As you can see, his KD is insane. A very <laughs> strong up and coming player, uh, but it hasn't been enough. Like you have to be a well-rounded roster. And uh, yeah, we just haven't seen that yet. I want to hedge my bet and say that's probably the most outrageous stats worldwide at the moment. Oh, I'm... just you wait until the next graphic, mate. <laughs> well, let's go to it, shall we? Let's go ahead and BM them, Dev. Oh, <laughs> so, right here, what we're looking at is the best player in the league in Joe Gore and the worst player in the league. Oh, Dev. Oh, so, no. the, the number one highest rated player in the league right now is Joe Gore. He's a rookie. He's, it's his first time debuting into the, the pro, the tier one scene. And like you can see from the stats, he's actually been insane. Like, particularly, he's just, he, he gets a lot of them kills. Like, his cost isn't, 80% cost is good, but that's not like a crazy number, not like a 2.0 KD. Um, his entry is also pretty insane, like 27% of rounds he's getting the opening pick. That's nuts. He's a real mean Dokubi player, as we've seen, and he backs up on defense. Uh, unfortunately, beat. I know this is a very like shallow surface level analysis, right? Like they're not necessarily the same role or anything. The beat has really been struggling. This guy's been on the scene for quite some time here in South Asia. Like he's a, a bit of a veteran player. Uh, and yeah, he does take some more supportive roles, but he's been really struggling yet to find an opening pick. KD under 0.5. Uh, it's been real rough. And I think the, the most scary stat for a player like Beat is the fact that his cost is below 50%. Uh, even if you have a low KD, it doesn't really matter if you get your cost up high, because it probably means you're planting the bomb a lot or you're surviving a lot of rounds, but uh, or, or getting traded if you die. But yeah, like Knock Knock have really struggled. Now, while they are currently outside of elimination, uh, if they lose this, there's no guarantee that they'll stay that way yeah it's uh look uh, toward the end of this stage it, the conversation for these bottom three teams is going to get incredibly rough and we could potentially be saying bottom four should knock knock be able to even even get a point off die walls tonight and die walls might even enter that conversation of the bottom four teams rather than the top five i know that sounds like a like a, it's, it's the same thing right top four bottom four versus top five bottom three the fact of the matter is direwolves are on that uh, they're on that edge at the moment given their experience in uh souffle and pika mandy it does feel like we should be maybe expecting a little bit more considering you look at the the stats in the league and i mean you know as as dev's already perfectly mentioned jogo's just on another level 
To be frank, I don't know how much I agree with that. I think something that Dev and I identified pretty early on about this team is that like, yes, you've got these big names, historic big names, in fact, but what you don't have is you don't really have mature players, you don't have very good leaders, you don't have strat makers, right? And, and what Zywolves have been struggling to do in the last year is like bring in good support players and bring in good IGLs, right? We've like rotated in and out Songla, who was a support player, then they magically got on Jogor, it's probably not the medicine they need for their problems, right? And I think as a result, the team dynamic for this Direwolves roster just isn't really falling into place. And mm. yeah, I, I think I think ultimately, like, yes, you've got all these big names like you've been mentioning, but does that make the hallmark of a good team? Probably not. Well, to be frank with you, Mandy, I agree. <laughs> uh, we had to shout out. start calling you Frank at this point, mate. Uh, honestly, that's uh, you just you had the style on me. Look, I mean, that's that's why you're the analyst, and I am just but a mere host. Uh, unfortunately, this is now going to. I think this opens the game up a little bit, Dev. I mean, more than happy to hear your thoughts on this, but I do feel as though yeah. Chalet might open things up a little bit to maybe start that knock knock conversation. Yeah, nah, I don't reckon. Uh, Diamonds love this map. Uh, this has been the map that they've played in all but one of their games. Uh, they have uh, already beaten Daystar and Hasib's Warriors pretty convincingly on it. Uh, mm -hmm. And while they did lose to Fury, it's Fury. Uh, and I think yep. that kind of where we're at at the moment is that like, there's a the top four teams, and then there's Dire Wolves, and then there's the bottom three teams. Um, and potentially it's like there's the top four teams, there's Dire Wolves, Daystar, and then there's the two South Asian teams at the bottom. I think that's kind of how the league is at the moment. Uh, and yeah, for Knock Knock, like they have played this, they lost it to Bleed. They got three rounds off of them, which is great. Uh, but I'm not convinced that this is going to be uh, an achievable one for Knock Knock. Uh, Die Wolves, they, they love Chalet. The only chance I would have here for Knock Knock is if they have bodied the ever-living crap out of Chalet and watched all four <laughs> of the games, well, three of the games plus one that Die Wolves played in the ECS. And you know, they know exactly how they play. And they've come in with like the craziest counter strats. And Joe Gore's PC crashes every round. That's the win condition <laughs> for Knock Knock. You know what? I'm I'm even going to throw a win condition in there. If you are a stats man, you will know that Dire Wolves have an insane entry uh, statistic at the moment across their entire team. Shut down the entry, maybe shut down the round. I'm kidding. Knock Knock are going to go up against the David, uh, or as David in this Goliath battle. Let's go across to uh, Jake and Guz. Yeah, well said Thanks, from Frank. the desk. Very much just alluding to the fact that it's going to be a difficult match, clearly, for Knock Knock. I think regardless, though, uh, for Die Wolves, I think it's all about how much they win this by. I mean, I know that sounds crazy, but round differential is going to matter over the, the coming play days, going into the playoffs, for seeding. You want to be able to have as best round differential as you possibly can for the better position, for the better seeding. So this is the kind of game that they should be winning. As Dev mentioned, they've played it in all but one of their games in terms of Chalet. I don't know how this map has made it through, but it has. And so Die Wolves, for me, go into this as the extraordinarily overwhelming insanity favorites. The insanity favorites. Yeah, the insanity, is, like, insanity that is a light I have favorites. not heard before. Like, <laughs> galactic favorites. Galactic? Universal? I mean, Universal. I don't, go, I don't even go any bigger than that. Um, the multiversal favorites in this match. <laughs> the multiversal. Um, but no, look, I mean, I know we're joking a little bit, but it is at the end of the day very very one-sided matchup that's the expectation heading into this and as you mentioned round diff actually could be relatively impactful uh, with jolita just losing against bleed divers will jump ahead of them with a regulation win and they are of course trailing by a decent amount in round diff to jolita they're also trailing fury as well who had a dominant victory already today so if there's a world in which later on maybe an ot result here or there but for whatever reason points are drawn round diff could be quite impactful so divers need to go in especially starting defense go in with the idea that they are not going to lift the pedal at all throughout this match every single round be as dominant as you can yeah and adding even on to this conversation rather to the importance of the round differential for dire wolves they have the lowest round differential out of the top five so even more importance than to to really bump that number up for uh, Die Wolves, they also play Jolita and then Elevate for their last two play days. So, I mean, it, it, it's going to get a lot harder. They, they get their, their last win here against Knock Knock and then you move on to some pretty important games. So, you pick up the, the round differential here and then you get the points and from there. And, and in terms of why you probably want to, and where you want to finish right now, second or third is very much where you kind of want to finish. Avoid bleed as long as you possibly can. 
Um, and so you end up in the uh, the quarterfinals. Six is going to be very difficult to fall down to. So if Die Wolves hold this position of fifth right now, what that would mean, or even if they only go up to fourth, is they're on the same bracket as Bleed. And that, that's quite a daunting task going into the playoffs for the semifinals to come after the quarterfinals. Uh, Die Wolves also starting on the defense first here. Now, I had a very quick look at the last time they played Hasib Warriors on this map for a bit of a reference point from one South Asia team to another. And Die Wolves did actually start on the attack, had a 4-2 half, then defensively won 3-1. So even on a map like Chalet, which by the way, 60% defensive sided inside of Southeast Asia. Yeah, I think Die Wolves should start well here and every emphasis that they're going to have a really good half. Yeah, as alluded to on the uh, desk at the conclusion there, Rob mentioning that the entry stat for Die Wolves is quite favorable. And so Doc Doc will need to try everything they can in isolating that early pick. The defensive lineup here from Dive was suggesting they're going to play very aggressive and free flowing with the likes of the Legion and the Alibi. There'll be a bit of structure in place with the Mamai to help lock down positions. And Joe Gore, of course, has been a phenomenal player so far, so we'll be keeping a keen eye on him. Obviously, running MP5A Cog as well. So, the Spawn Peaks are going to be uh, on the table as well. And he's probably going to get one here. Oh, he's watching it, though. No. Ooh. Well, that's good present to mine from Knock Knock, right? Like, those are the kind of entry battles where if you just give away something for free, you set yourself up for failure, but having the conscious mind to be ready for that. And they also have a read down below here. So this is actually quite a decent start from Knock Knock, if they're able to capitalize on this. Yeah, a lot of sitting outside of the map, though. And I think very much expecting Divals to get overly aggressive. But to the credit of Die Wolves, not getting disrespectively aggressive. Even this little peek here, I mean, that's nothing too crazy that we're seeing from Joey Gore. Jittery, though, watching and does get that kill. Opening kill goes the way of Knock Knock. And in the end, well, patience pays dividends. They get themselves an exterior kill before looking to eventually make their way in towards the site. And a good kill as well. Saw Dev Mata obviously on the desk highlighting before. Joey Gore is the top rated player at the moment in this current stage. Fortunately for B, on the other side, for Knock Knock, the lowest rated player in the stage. Good start so far for Knock Knock. Over 90 seconds still remaining. Bit of bulky control. It has just been a lot of this posturing outside. So the map control is well, not a lot. Very much slim to none. But they lose one from West Main. Push is beautiful from Felux. While they get some pressure onto the player in bathroom. And that is Kit that will need to be retrieved as well. Yeah, B getting slammed on that angle. Really good shot there from Felux. And with Diffuser isolated, that will need to be collected by Knock Knock, who haven't actually gained a whole lot of map control. That's unfortunately the position they find themselves in now. Despite winning that earlier pick, they haven't then converted that into a lot of pressure in towards the map itself. Still players on the roof, still players on the exterior. I don't even know if Library's been taken. Rattler's just... Almost locked himself down, but survives. Library control now chipped away at Sandy able to find that pick. So they are finding kills. In fact, they'll double down. So late map control here may not be to the demise of Knock Knock and Felix down below has been spotted. And Pinky getting aggressive, pushing over towards Ego Belk. Has one outside on that balcony. Low health Rattler could be the way back into the round for the two man direwolves. Great start here for Knock Knock. Pika, though, swings successfully. Gets the kill onto Jittery. Holding this half wall position. The little creep in from Rattler, but in the end, Sandy gets the double kill and Knock Knock get the opening round. And David will throw the first punch against, against Goliath. And uh, honestly, I'm a little surprised. Die Wolves get aggressive. They look to try and go for peaks early on. Jogor roaming big garage. Gets caught, loses his life. And from there, Knock Knock doing a good job of just kind of finding picks throughout the round. A good start here on Chalet. Yeah, we didn't really get to see how those, especially the, the double pick late in the round, was actually isolated there by Knock Knock. Um, for divers in this match, it's important that you balance confidence and greed. If you disrespect your opponent too much and expect every single position you play to be favorable and every single fight that you enter to be one that you're going to win, kind of like that one there, you are going to find yourself in trouble in the long run if you're not careful and if your late round doesn't uh, make up for it. So there were some good players. I mean, the Felix pick West Main. That got the Diffuser down. Eventually, though, Pika was left on that island. He tried as best he could to try and salvage the round, but it, yeah, it didn't work out. So it's important that Divers, yeah, they have to be confident. They should be confident in this matchup. But if you go over the line, 
into overconfidence, you can find yourself in a bit of trouble. And I'm only saying that, yes, it's one round, but again, the round differential story could be really, really important. So every round does matter in this match. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good observation as well. We kind of mentioned already coming into this game for Die Wolves, it's all about round differential, the kind of game where the heavy favorites must win and win big and to lose our opening round. Yeah, not the best of starts. Good news for Knock Knock though, that they were able to find an opening round that they can maybe snowball off. Can you find a way now to just keep that momentum going? Find a second, then a third. Suddenly the pressure is really on Direwolves. Every round just so vital. Ed was spotted and eventually take it out by Pika. The upside down repel from MB unsuccessful outside of library. Mezzanine hold with the mirror facing in towards top library. Cash, uh, so, cash. Games is, of course, the site. But a, a better example there of a more favorable contact fight where you've got the mirror for info, you're running the ACOG. So, as long as you pre fire the right position, it is a favored fight. Better example there compared to the dry peak from Joe Gore earlier on, on the off angles. So, yeah, good work there from the defense. Better from Divals early on. We're going to see Drago once again roaming around Vigil Shotgun, the boss G. I feel like we've seen it from him already at this stage, so we'll see if that will be effective. Meanwhile, Jittery droning out Library, so Knock Knock, I believe, will look to contest for some Library control. They have the player position outside on Ego Belk as well on that double window to try and pinch Pika. So a bit of pressure on the castle here to hold position. Attackers dropped. And he gets another one. Eventually traded though by the Nitro Cell of Seal. Still trying to clear this mezzanine position with which Pika holding. Gets rid of that drone. Only four now remaining for Knock Knock. Smoke through from Rattler just to block off Sightline through the library hallway. Makes the entry in towards Big Window Mez and well, was momentarily obscured in terms of vision because of that F not mine and did lose his life to the player holding mezzanine in Pika who finds his fourth kill of the game. Likes going over towards Mudroom. And Jittery has got control of the Mezzanine with 50 seconds remaining in this round. B and Jittery now as a duo versus the three-man Direwolves. I mean, they got library control. A little bit of drone work can go into this as well. Rotero's still that can be utilized. Three more available for Beat to open up the Mezzanine floor. And Jittery immediately heads straight towards Big Window in towards Games. One still in towards Barstock. That does need to be cleared. Only 20 seconds remaining, and as that duo got to now put the pressure on to Direwolves, force them to move, you've got to clear them and their position. Jittery goes deep, doesn't clear Barstock. Seal could swing at any time. There's the drop down from the hatch, but it's pretty good from B. Lovely headshot. Kit in the hands of Jittery, now putting it onto the floor, in towards Bar. Does it catch them off guard? No, it does not. Instead, they've just lined up. Souffle able to get the double. You can kind of see what they were trying to cook, not go for the more conventional plant. The player in Barstock certainly could have aided in trying to deny any pushes, but unfortunately both lining up and it's a opening round now for Direwolves. They get their first round on the board. Yeah, some decent problem solving in the late round there from Knock Knock in the two versus three and trying to work the objective. There was no mirror in backstore. And so they were able to clear that, although then got timed, as you mentioned, kind of go, kind of tried to attempt the, the off meta plant position um, as half four would have been risky if they lost vert control, which they did. They kind of just had to back themselves in that die was we're going to throw ones, which ultimately they didn't in the end. Uh, beat was unable to cover and would have been uh, traded anyway, so it didn't really matter. Much better from die good start to the round, the entry, the hold up above was good, leaning into the likes of the Fenrir util, which wasn't cleared. And then, uh, yeah, life made easier in the late round. So, good work from Tybulls. And we rotate back to bedroom, I think. Yeah. If I saw correctly, or maybe it was done. No, it's bedroom. Okay. Bedroom. Yeah, good response from Tybulls. <laughs> but also, I think even for Knock Knock's sake, the fact that it was a round again where it was honestly for the taking. Two versus three, not impossible. You had kit, you had time. I think it was about 50 seconds with top library control plus mezzanine. Certainly a winnable round. It's only early days, but it has been good signs from Knock Knock. Especially from Sandy. Playing the sedge Sledge in this round. Picked up quite a few kills.
will be a solo side push though from knock knock pressure pretty imminent early on trophy stands from pika we'll just hold this position close by no nitro salt i'm not sure if that's being expended or just pre-placed i think it has been thrown and has missed entirely double repel actually at the moment on solo now the frags are trying to dislodge this position and the fact that it gets a kill well, that's honestly a little bit poor from Pika in this day and age. Dying to frag grenades in those kind of positions, you should be able to fall back. Maybe feeling the pinch. If you push back down trophy stairs, could be someone holding that trophy window. And another opening kill for Knock Knock puts them in a good position in this third round. Yeah, elsewhere, Envy's getting to work on the Rotaros, so there's probably you two getting cleared as well at the moment. And I'll have a good read over towards Solo. Feel like it's down below contesting though, so it could disrupt, but needed to land that shot. Fortunately, he doesn't. Does have line of sight for the vault, but he still loses that fight. That was pretty bold from Jittery to go for that. But the vault animation in his favor that time around. Good work. The attack now with solar control. And pressure on the likes of Joe Gore to find himself in the game. Top rated player, but yet to find a kill. Yeah, yelloping information as well, but... Right now, Knock Knock just suddenly looking like a team that could maybe cause a big upset tonight. Lovely swing by on the repel from Jittery. Gets the kill onto Joe Gore. Well, early days, and only early days, but so far, really good signs from Knock Knock. It's all about capitalizing here, looking for their second attacking round. Again, I brought up that statistic yes, uh, earlier about Hasib Warriors on this map against Iwals. Only managed one attacking round. Well, Knock Knock, in just side of three, are looking for two. And Seal now, the one in a one versus four. Good swing, gets the kill onto Rattler. Has information on another player over towards Piano, but B is gone and got that head of seal. The lowest rated player highlighted by Dev on the desk. And so far having a really good game. Feels like he's taking that personal. And so far, a two to one lead for Knock Knock is well, putting Die Wolves in a really bad position when we talk about round differential, more so than just winning or losing. All of these rounds will make their life so much harder throughout the rest of the stage. Yeah, I mean, that was a really impressive uh, display again there from the attack. I'd say that was probably their best round yet. Able to chip away at Solar nicely. The uh, need clear stairs was clean. No catch response from Diabulls. Then we saw Joe inside of that closet position. I started to get a little bit scared for Knock Knock in, in how they were going to be able to clear him out because we know he has that multi-kill potential. But then it was pretty simple. They just leaned into the double window, which is very default. Landed a nice shot. So good work. And again, we, we see that final player left in a 1vx situation, 1v3 on that occasion. And uh, Knock Knock doing a good job to convert. So they're very much not playing like a team that uh, has all the odds against them in this matchup. With everything on paper pointing towards this being a dominant Diwolves match. Unfortunately, defensively, they have not been very sound so far. And their star player is yet to find a kill. Yeah, I mean, this is honestly... Not the die walls, what I think we expected for tonight. A bit of a slow start. Opening round, maybe set the tone as well for them. A couple of ego peaks. Thinking that they could just play denial down below. Try and go for some early spawn peaks. Didn't work. They got shot back. Knock, knock. Took it straight to them. I mean... For all intents and purposes, Diewolves are a very experienced team. These guys have been around a long time. Jogal though, Omen 3. He hasn't. He's the new kid on the block. These are the kind of games you start bad. Can, can he mentally find a way to keep himself relevant? It's hard to say how many poor games Jogor has had this stage, guys, when he's the highest rated player. I, you'd have to go digging. So it's not often that we typically see four direwolves, the best, quote unquote, best player in the league, statistically start 0 and 3. There's some really concerning signs right now for direwolves. Again, swift entry down Envy through Mez. Activate. Kitchen and dining, so you want to get that bedroom and office control. Jittery already on that repel. Outside of that bedroom window. Castle barricades have been employed over towards piano side. Blocks off a little bit of vision from the repel. Over 90 seconds left. And a player just spotted elbow into mudroom. There's surely no way Souffle hasn't heard this. Is Souffle dead? He's dead. Oh! No way! He gets him! Sandy! He's six kill of the game and Souffle does indeed lose his life. He hears the drones in the hallway, but doesn't to 
even have a moment to think that he's sticking out. Another opening kill for Knock Knock. That was strange. Yeah, Souffle, again, overconfidence is creeping into this match for Dire Wolves, and it's proving to be quite costly. Knock Knock aren't making many mistakes in clearing out players that are overplaying their hand in this match. So Dire Wolves need to stop taking free picks for granted and free position for granted. Otherwise, it's down. going to prove costly. Yeah. Over the wards, bedroom. Over. The round's over. Uh, yeah, bathroom. Drogol can cover this and get the revive. We didn't quite see how that down actually took place. Pika just delaying as long as possible with the Zoto canister holding his cross. Didn't even need his help though. Felix, as soon as he got up, got that kill. Jittery though with one, then a second to follow from Rattler. Three versus two, the Nitro Cell not able to find a kill from Seal's perspective on the Kaid, and Pika's got one. One Nitro and also one Zoto. And Seal with a big kill onto Jittery. Now makes it a two versus two. 15 seconds remaining. And Pika should still be above and hasn't been cleared, as you can see, on that two barrel. Question will come down to what kind of lines of sight has he got looking down, and it's a great one. Straight through that doorway. Seal gets one from above. Pika then finishes the round off. A sigh of relief for Direwolves. That round looked like it was going to go the way as the others before it. But able to hold on, salvage it, find their second round. But so far, these... These rounds have been far too scrappy. Knock Knock have been far too good for Die Wolves liking. 2-2 two, two scoreline, two rounds to go in the half. The Die Wolves have got a challenge. Well, it's showing up to be an intriguing game between the two. And with round five, once again, top four. We'll see how it plays out this time around. Backtracking to the midway point of the round where Sufle got caught in mud. That was uh, relatively intriguing. And then down below, the feed through the dining door. Good vert play from Divals in the end. And yeah, back up above. We'll see how it plays out. Again, for the most part, Knock Knock have been relatively content. And actually playing quite patient on the exterior of the map and haven't been rushing map control. Divals in response typically are contesting that to apply pressure and to find kills. Sometimes overstepping the mark, and when they are overstepping set mark, knock knock, to their credit, are doing a very, very good job in denying that. And then also having good late round. Um, late round has been a big talking point for this stage in, in a lot of the leagues that we've been covering, where teams typically may have an advantage, especially on attack, and then struggle to convert that. Hasn't really been the case in this match so far for knock knock. And at two rounds already, that's even despite being shallow, still a good benchmark for them to reach, and anything from here is very, very positive indeed. Yeah, I mean, honestly, for Knock Knock, this is exactly what you need in a dual die kind of game. At the moment, tied on points with Daystar. But as we alluded to, they don't really get another opportunity. They've, they've already played Daystar. They've already played as Sib Warriors. So you're going to have to find a win against one of these top SEA teams. Well, right now, this feels like their best chance. Essentially, playoffs on the line in this match. But this Souffle that gets the opening kill onto Envy, struggling a little bit. On the dock would be the support roll. Two kills now go the way of Diables. Fortunately, though, for Knock Knock, they were able to get the kill onto Felux, which you know, it does diminish the advantage that Diables almost had. Three versus four. Jittery, though, low. And I'm going to say it, but if Jogor starts to activate, that's going to make life a lot harder for Knock Knock. Need to compound these rounds while you can, while he well, seemingly isn't at his best. 0 and 4. He starts the frag. That's going to give Die Wolves a real injection boost as Pika does get a kill onto Jitter in the run out. Okay. Die Wolves starting to find just a little bit of confidence back again here on Chalet. Going for these runouts. Going for these peaks once again as they did early on in the rounds. This time, though, no response from Knock Knock. Rattler and B. Two versus four. And a lot to do with a lot of utility available for Die Wolves. Two Nitro Cells, one impact. No, make it three. With still 60 seconds in the round, Diwall's in a great position. Well, we'll see then. How do you knock knock try and get themselves back into the round? Double stack over towards Solar and still play on Repel. Diwall's can sort of just sit back and let them feed in. And that's exactly what happens to beat, unfortunately. Stuck in between a rock and a hard place. Zombie Parricade still standing and used to full effect. Good work from Diwall's. They respond very briefly to that uh, push over towards Solo. No real qualms about it in the end. Joe finding himself back into the game as well. 
And this final round feeling feels quite important for both teams, really, because for Knock Knock, they is, you know, them being able to surpass that benchmark and set themselves up really nicely defensively. And if they can continue that confidence, maybe be a shout at pushing OT at least. And uh, for Diables, on the flip side, they don't want to be on the receiving end of that. Shallow, the most played map in the Asia League. 61% defensive Defense, win rate overall. And a map that sees all four bomb sites quite often. By the way, it was uh, an, a TK there on Tefilux. So technically didn't find a kill in that round, did Knock Knock. As I just mentioned, if they can find a third attack of ground, well, that puts them in a very solid position going into the second half because uh, the way that this map should play out statistically is a 2-4 half to the defense. And so for Die Wolves, they can achieve that, which would at least put us on par going into the second half or for Knock Knock achieve a, a, a really solid result. And that's very easy to say it's been a solid result regardless, but... You don't get anything for honorable losses at this point. Win this game, you can very much go to the playoffs. It's not a solidified, locked-in situation, but boy, puts them probably in a much better position in comparison to Daystar. Direwolves, of course, they really cannot allow this to be extended. They need the round differential. They need this to be over and done with as soon as possible. 7-2 is honestly what they're searching for. 7-3 at worst from here. So you've got one team that really needs to win this. As quick as possible, and the other that is just going to fight tooth and nail in every round to just scrag along. Sandy straight onto that library balcony. Jogor top library stairs. Found two kills in that last round. I mentioned it before, Guz, but he he starts to get going. That's going to be very difficult for Knock Knock. Yeah, for sure. I agree. Pretty key role in this round as well over towards that position in which he's holding, but it's a triangle set up here. One inside of the library and Felix as well to cover the double window. One though gets out, able to escape, and Felix applying pressure to facilitate that. So Pika gets back to the objective. That's his job done. Doesn't want to lose his life on the top floor. And so far here, again, from Knock Knock, it's a lot of exterior pressure. No, no one in the map at all, as far as I'm aware. And so looking for those battles to be fought on the exterior. I was not really presenting many opportunities, or at least not opportunities in favor of the attack. Seal is able to get the first. Felix on drone. Mm. Let's see if Knock Knock convert. Well, unfortunately, not. Sandy gets swung. And the trade is late from double window if there was a trade attempt. No, that play is still out on the ego belt. So any opportunity to clear Felix has pretty much now subsided. Yeah, unfortunately for Envy, it's been a really rough half. 0 and 4. A couple of opening deaths as well. Not really helping. And then you lose Sandy. Six and five has been so strong in this half. Yeah, I can, these are the kind of fights that Knock Knock were just capable of winning to begin this half. But unfortunately, in this round, they've got nothing to go their way. Holding these kinds of angles certainly did net them a, a good kill or two to begin catching Direwolves off guard. But this time around, Direwolves uh, far more switched on. A massive response from them to close this half out from 2 2 to 2 4. I think Beat will just take the impromptu 35 seconds. It's been a rough stage for him. If there's ever a time to maybe just save the KD, this could be it. He does have the kit, though. And 20 seconds. Makes his way back into mud. He makes the right option here of actually just going for it. Jiggle Peak from Jogor is strong, though, and does win out. So 4 to 2 in favor of Die Wolves to close out the opening half on their defense. I'm not sure exactly how they would be feeling after that half. I mean, yeah, for all statistical purposes, it's a, a job well done, but you know, I think the way that those rounds initially played out, they'd be a little bit disappointed, but yeah, they bounced back for Knock Knock. Now onto the defense. And they keep the good vibes rolling into the second half, defending against Dire Wolves in a dual die game. Must get all three points. I mean, even one to two points could honestly be a difference maker. Say what they've got on the defense. Attackers have located a bomb. Setting up. So let's jump into it. Things. Uh, let's jump into things here and see how Knock Knock are able to uh, build a p some potential momentum here on defense. It's gonna be very uh, util heavy um, in terms of you know the castle combo with the mirror. 
And so there'll be a lot of pressure on a potential Ash here from Die Wars. I wouldn't be too surprised if they repick into that um, to aid in the util clear and alleviate some pressure. So we've got the Frost to be mindful of as well. So Chap's also in play. Doesn't look like those are going to switch on to the Ash, which could be a little bit concerning. It kind of depends where the mirrors are set up and how Die Wars want to play into them. As it goes without saying, Ash Charge is now counting them directly, but depending on how they're positioned, uh, could be Vert down below. Habana as well to maybe dislodge them as well at, at ankle height. So we'll wait and see. But there's going to be a lot of utils, especially again with these army in play as well. Also no Flores. So it's very gun heavy here from Divers and looking to crowd control with the Docker Beat and the line. Attention all the way over to this library side. I can't imagine Knock Knock's going to get too aggressive here on the defense. I think just hold your positions, back yourself in defensively on site close to it, in the key positions that you want to be holding. If you are going to get aggressive, maybe inside of the map, I, I don't know if taking any kind of window peaks will be a play. Let's see who's nearby. It's an early logic bomb from Jogor, still two minutes into the game, but gets him into West Paint. No noise made close by. There's one player. Over towards dining. Well, yeah, shot from above there. Jogor just... Momentarily, could have easily actually lost his life. There's another logic bomb, so no more after this. Red pig information. Jogo, I think he's going to get really aggressive, but he does lose the battle to beat on the mirror. Finds his fifth kill of the game. 90 seconds left now, and a four on four. Souffle, and if it was Jigsaw, drops down. Could make his way to West Main as Pika going for a little lurk inside of West Main. Understanding that Knock Knock very much playing these floorboard positions and the verts down below. One over on that solar... Repel at the moment for Direwolves, anticipating that they are going to try and make their way through Trophy and up Solar. So the head jab there, that. he can't yeah, get down it down below. No, no impact. Well, he tries oh, to block. Smart. Well, he tries to block it and then run into it. I don't know if he actually did block the angle, but either way, he survives. So it doesn't matter. Beat also able to find Souffle. So four v three under a minute to go here for Direwolves, and they don't find themselves in the best of positions again. Finding still for map control. It's a triple repel at the moment. He can't now, not with three players up. No, he still will rotate, he'll play the stairs. Felix able to get in, but that wasn't well timed. Player on the stairs still coming up. So there's mistakes creeping in here from Dylos. The pressure, I think, is mounting a little bit in this game, or at least in this particular round. One in which they, I think, genuinely could have fought back from. But now in the two versus. Ooh, uh, ooh, two oh, whoa, two Hang on, two, hang actually, on. Actually, no. I mean, there was that split moment if Sandy had fallen with two players down elsewhere, but they do hold on. Yeah, Sandy has done a significantly good job for Knock Knock in this match. Really solid round from them. They're just holding their key positions. And uh, I think also the Vert play, especially into West Main, was you know, very much paramount for them in the round. Yeah, Die Wolves very much looking for that default play. Get one on the big window repel in towards bedroom, one on the solar side, and then eventually try and get some trophy into solar control. But they could just never clear bathroom. Either from the balcony or from West Main. They just couldn't clear it. There was too much pressure as well over towards library side. So they couldn't get library hallway in towards piano. And just credit to Knock Knock. They were just very much immovable at the moment. Three to four. They get themselves a third round. And again, it means for Die Wolves, the round differential just gets worse and worse and worse. Again, coming into this of the top five already, the worst round differential of those teams, only plus two. And they've got two really important games over the last two play days. And the way they're playing in this game, well, doesn't bode well for them. So we'll see if uh, Dylos maybe this time around lean a little bit more into Util in looking to clear things again, like Keeper Barriers, especially in this instance. Also Malusi Banshees as well this time around. So we see them bring the Ash which may aid in that. And also grenades in the hands of Seal. Not every day of the week you'll see an IQ in play without uh, Valkyrie, who was banned out. So we'll see what the thinking process was behind that, outside of the grenades and the comfortability of the primary. Pika's got a good, quick control. And this is a big switch up from what we saw from Knock Knock. We very rarely saw players lurking in and finding advanced positions on the attack. And so from here, Pika will be able to lock down that dining rotation, 
clear that utility, open a path towards the objective, and just ensure that there's phantom pressure on this side of the map. That is very aggressive, and he almost got caught out, but now they know, knock, knock, know that he is posted up here, and they have to be careful. Yeah, and for the second round in a row, Joker has used that logic bomb at the two minute mark, the second one, not even the first one. Yellow ping, Informa wait, does Seal know? That Envy is this close, holding library stairs. He had no idea. Envy finally on the board with his first kill. At least Jogo was able to clear that mezzanine position, but they haven't cleared top library. Not just yet. Double flash, forcing Rattler away. It's been a rough game for him. Just one and seven, but he survives. And honestly, that's pretty good in itself. Beat hasn't been cleared. Yellow ping information. The timing just has to be perfect. Tucked in left side. Does get the kill onto Jogo. Trade immediately from mezzanine. Pika. Double digit kills, but it's a three versus three and another round that is certainly up for grabs with knock, knock while they're knocking on this door. Rattler in towards bar stock, Envy behind bar. Jittery needs a kill and he does find it. A second no, but information as to Souffle's position at library stairs and he's taking quite low. That can be relayed over to Rattler and Envy. Two players though, guys, that are one and seven and one and four. The KDA doesn't matter though in a clutch moment. Round eight, this could be your moment. Yeah, it depends if Envy's position is known. Diwolves should be expecting a player backstore, so he's going to have to hold that. And in fact, Lafitte spotted. Rattler then, he'll probably be the key player in this round. Also, though, in backstore, will Diwolves expect the double stack? That's the question. 30 seconds, not a lot of time remaining for Diwolves, but they do have Kier. Envy just pokes his shoulder out a little bit. Drone shot out from that hatch. Keeps moving forward, but what an angle found. Traded immediately, though, by Rattler. One versus one should know that he was above, but making his way down very slowly now is Souffle. Without the kit in hand, red time. Five seconds left, going slow is his approach, but the Rattler catches him, and with that, Knock Knock will find another round. Direwolves are in disarray. For what was supposed to be David versus Goliath, it turns out it's an even match. It's four to four, and a timeout has been called by Direwolves. Yeah, this has been a really good display so far from Knock Knock. And perhaps a bit of a wake up call for, I suppose, for us and by extension, the league, and more importantly, Direwolves today. I think they very much went into this with a cruise control mentality. And I said before, perhaps overconfidence as well. I don't entirely know what it is, but inside the camp. But I did not expect the result to be uh, panning out the way it has so far. And even if, even if Dai was from here, 4-4, flipping and win 7-4, it's only plus three on round diff. And that could come back to bite them later on with other teams like Jolita, like Hero Elevates, exceeding them by five or more rounds at the moment. So if those two go on to continue to win or be competitive, they might not be able to close that gap. And that's even assuming they win the game, because that's by no means uh, a certainty from here. No, it's so not. it's been uh, a good display from Knock Knock. They're actually playing quite well. Attackers need to locate and defuse as many bombs as they can. Because Knock Knock, all the way back, played A3, took down their South Asian rivals in his Civ Warriors, 7-5. Prior to that, though, was when they took on Daystar back on Play Day 2, lost that. And when they did lose that particular game, even before playing Hasib Warriors, that already would have put a dint into their chances of getting out of the bottom two because it meant they have to then go and beat a Southeast Asian team. Well, on the cards right now, is that very possibility? Four to four, three rounds away. You win this, you go to six points. And dare I say it, they'd actually be on the same amount of points as Direwolves does. Direwolves still to play Jolita and Elevate. But the round differential is quite extreme between Knock Knock, Daystar, and Direwolves. I'm not insinuating that Direwolves could end up in bottom two territory, but I am saying that Knock Knock have every chance of being on the same points as them by the end of this game. And that already is quite significant. So it's a library extension here from Knock Knock that is unoccupied. They have the castle with footholds. And so it means that Daiwas can't necessarily just jump in and get free control on the long lines of sight. 
um, from the likes of Sandy at half four can contest that, depending on how they've configured it, or if anyone wants to swing piano as well. Already two Rateros used very early on here from Pika, likely in response to the Castle Barricades. And so the rest of the attack, I suppose, is likely shaping up over towards Library. Two stuck out front door. Pika actually down below in trench. So he's... I think... Yeah, he's going up west main. Okay, so clearing utility in the site. Bit of information garnered as well. And he could actually look to play off that. Keep in mind, he's... Still one left. Yeah, he's looking red hot at the moment. 10 kills. Drew himself on the floor. I mean, it's not something you see every day of the week, but... Should be able to deal with things like barbed wire and stuff as well on his path to the site. And he can continue to be a bit of a threat. Yeah, it puts a bit of that horizontal pressure as well onto kitchen and dining. Typically extension up above. You do want to take up above at some point. Riteros are done, by the way. So, no more available for Pika. Will drone himself, though. Only has the one drone. Remaining for him. Deal with a bit of presence over towards Ego Belk. There was a hole opened up as well. Near the half wall position. But no contact made. Still 60 seconds, but... No contact. Knock Knock happy to just play ultra defensive. Heavy focus over towards the bedroom and bathroom side up above. Making sure that any kind of kitchen take is going to be yeah, incredibly difficult. But it could open up press pressure onto dining, especially with this west main pressure. Duflay finds a kill onto Rattler. Pika's already in a good position. And Felix is just going to go for the plant inside of the smoke. Pika's in a position where he can trade anyone looking to make their way in. And look at this double kill from Diewolves. Plant goes down successfully. And for the first time in this half, it really does feel like Diewolves have been able to... Well, implement a plan of attack. The Knock Lock have never really had any look into the round. A one versus three now for B. Immediately caught outside on the... Jigsaw balcony is Pika. He would have done that quite quickly from that West Bain position, making his way out of there and then up the ladder. But yeah, certainly a much better round from Direwolves. Into the 10th round, they get themselves back to lead 5-4. to four. Yep, good work from Direwolves. Needed to formulate a bit of response, a bit of a confidence builder now. Only one away from match point. And in terms of what this means for playoff implications, uh, specifically for, for Dire Wolves, um, if they're able to secure at least an OT win, that's 99% top six. And 99.9 .9 if it's regulation. Um, for Knock Knock though, if they are to go on and lose this, they still have a bit of a lifeline, although it doesn't look great for them. It will only be a 41% chance of uh, making the top six if they lose this game. And then looking ahead at Knock Knock's Fixture, of course that's very important as well. They will be taking on both Fury and Jalita. So they have a pretty rough ride home. If there's any game that Knock Knock are going to win, it's probably this one. So we'll see if they can fight back. Ten seconds to insertion. Yeah, and that's the concern. If they don't win this one, this close against the Die Wolves team that has been quite shaky. You look at their last two games. Well, they play Fury tomorrow, and it's a Fury roster that looks in arguably their best form for 2024 and then on the last play day you play a Jalita roster that yeah, maybe could be gettable kind of like Die Wolves today that would be quite literally their last chance being play day seven. Oh, this is so aggressive and quick from Jogor both castle barricades dealt with instantaneously just get that feeling that the pace for Die Wolves has picked up and at times, over the last couple of rounds, that confidence is starting to show once again. But credit to Knock Knock. Every time that confidence has been there for Dire Wolves, Knock Knock have been ready. But this time, no. Jittery loses his life to Pika. Over towards Ego Belk. Just, I imagine, opens up that door and just takes a couple of pot shots. They're getting so aggressive again. Even this from Pika. Sitting behind the window. Goes for the oh. peak. But this time... The aggression will not pay dividends. Rattler finds the kill. Four versus four. So Dremwork then in towards Solo. They will see that the stairs themselves are obviously clear. And Dragor has that position down below. He can look to take some util as well from Vert if he so desires. The Fenrir mine pinged out. You know, 30 still remaining in the round, so a lot of time remains. Daiwa's looking pretty content to shape up for a northern push. 
one spot bathroom. Don't know if they know if there's the second side of hot tub. It's a deployable shield setup, which is pretty intriguing here from Knock Knock. Angle through the slit. So facilitating entry into solar. Maybe quite a little bit of a challenge. Closet as well, now retaken. Line of sight also established by their own hard breach. I think Daiwa's identified that it's going to be pretty risky to go for this just by repelling straight in. They need some stairs control. They've got the flashbangs to clear it. And now they've finally got seal on the bulk. Easy kill for Joker. On to Sandy, who's had a good game so far. Oh, they're second! We started 0-4 for Joker, but now has found seven kills. Seven and three since that poor start. Rattler in towards half wall, default. Unfortunately, though, not really in a position to deny Felix. Still on that repel is Joker. Good position. Rattler not going to go for it. Now into a 1v3 post plant. Immediately shot by the planter. And that is going to be the timeout requested by Knock Knock. Match point has been achieved for Dire Wolves. It's been a hard fought match point to get to. Certainly have been pushed a lot more than we originally thought they would get pushed. But in fairness to Dire Wolves, the response has been great. When the game was on the line at 4-4, four to four, they have just been able to get to a level that we typically expect to see from Dire Wolves. And unfortunately for Knock Knock, they just haven't been able to match them. No, I mean, that uh, peak there from Rattler was really nice. Um, unfortunately, though, towards the late round, we saw that pivot from Dire Wolves. I think they rather quickly identified that sending a strain to Solar was very risky. So we saw the Balk then play, the double window repel, um, the, the flip to the other side as well, very late. And then it meant that the positions that uh, Knock Knock had taken quite quickly became weakened. And they couldn't formulate a response then fast enough. So it was a good adaptation there from Dire Wolves in that round. Probably the best we've seen from them so far in this match and coming at really the perfect time it initiates the tactical timeout from knock knock who are very much fighting now for a spot in the top six unless daystar are to completely drop the bundle later on in the uh in this stage and round diff goes the way of knock knock they may slide down into the bottom two so this is a big game for knock knock and a big or oh, pardon me a big couple of rounds potentially for knock knock and for south asia Well, so Civ Warriors take on Elevate in the game after this. Goes without saying, it's, yeah, somewhat do or die. They do still play Daystar tomorrow. That could be a very intriguing game for his Civ Warriors. But their last game is then against Fury. So I'm going to be honest, it probably is must-win territory for them as well. Two massive rounds for Knock Knock to try and send this one to overtime. That one point could be a difference maker. The best opportunity they've certainly had so far at this stage of taking down a Southeast Asian team. They've been right in this game. Started so well. Die Wolves just in the last two rounds have been able to flip a switch, it feels like. I mentioned Jogor started 0-4, now 7-7. Seven and seven, So 7-3. Seven and three. In response to the poor start, really highlighting the, you know, mental fortitude for this young player. It's not easy when you, you know, you check that scoreboard in your own five. You, you're not quite getting the kills you're usually getting. Again, a very aggressive start, though, from Dire Wolves. Immediately dealing with these castle barricades. Beat over towards Closet. Playing off default right now, just to see if we can get any information towards Solar. I'm going to be honest, though, I think Knock Knock need to probably find a little bit more aggression on the defense because last round they just got completely overwhelmed. Yeah, so two minutes on the clock, and we'll see where Dai was look to posture. It's a top library stairs hold as well here from Knock Knock, so that may complicate things, and there's a lack of lurk potential because down below is castled off as well. Joe Gore elsewhere, though, West Main, so he might look to play from here. He can post up. You might be able to catch someone on a rotate back towards the site. Rattler in bar as the logic bomb goes out. Oh, well, Joe Gore almost timing one. Does he see the elbow? I think oh. he heard him. Initially heard him. Yeah. Good damage. I think as he went for that reload and looked away, he heard him last second and then his immediately put his eyes back into that position. It's been a massive difference maker for Die Wolves that Joe Gore has really stepped up in this second half. You know, Rattler on the move, but is he aware? There's one in towards games. Could be a bit of a disaster for him waiting to happen. 
Well, I think he was going to rotate through Snowmobile, and then there was a, a Lurker down below from the attack again, so he's had the presence of mind to come back up. And now found back inside of Bar. I think Divers have probably given up on the roam clear at this point. One more Logic Bomb now to come through, so maybe this is an opportunity for a Rattler to be under a little bit of pressure, but I don't think that will be the case. Instead, they'll probably just try and cut him on the rotation back towards site. Elsewhere, Solar being cleared, saying to fall back, pick and find the first. And in fact, they will double down here, so Rattler now needs to make the most of this flank. Yeah, unfortunately, everyone else, though, is losing their lives pretty quickly. I don't think there's too much wrong with the flank from Rattler. It's just a little delayed, and he's got no idea Sufle is tucked in on library. And he's going to lose his life, and with that, they're going to lose the game. The Die Walls very much stepped it up, though, when it was called upon. At 4-4, it was looking quite dire for the Die Wolves. But hey, they activated. They got the last two rounds very convincingly. Jogor has got himself a Xenox chair, so I'm a big fan. Die Wolves. Get themselves all three points. Not quite the round differential they would have been searching for, guys. But hey, it's a win against a knock-knock team that we're fighting tooth and nail. And so, therefore, it ends up being a pretty good win for Die Wolves, considering I think that's the best we've seen from knock-knock all stage long. It's not as if they got them in the early couple of play days when they were still figuring things out. They got a knock-knock team that looked like they were really fighting for a win to keep their playoffs hopes alive. Yeah, I mean, I feel like we're a little bit subdued in our celebration here for Dire Wolves, but again, it's a match that we went in expecting them to win. Eventually, they got it over the line, and the question now to be raised for the rest of the stage, will the round diff come back to bite them? The yeah, question has been posed here. Where will we get it answered? Maybe on the desk? I think, uh, Dev, you might have a hand free to uh, give these boys. Do you want to break or that one other? down? I've got the other well, hand as well. I've got we'll one see other hand. hand doing? Hang on. Hang on a uh, second. Both, we'll hands, hand both hands fully visible right now and both hands in the <laughs> prayer symbol and saying, Die Wolves, you're very lucky not to have dropped any points today. That was a, actually a really tough game. I think it was fair to preface it as a bit of a David and Goliath. And I don't want anyone in the South Asian community to think that we're not doing the, the region justice. It's just an unfortunate reality is those teams have not looked so great this stage and historically yeah. the, the results have kind of indicated that but knock knock really stepped up today i think especially you know opening with the opening kill in the first round converting that it, it was a bit back and forth and i think dial was built up that momentum a little bit they got three defenses in a row and if it had ended up like a i don't know like a, a three three split on the attack or maybe even uh, like a four two in favor of knock knock like this would have definitely been points uh, seeping out of dial's favor but yeah unfortunately knock knock just didn't quite have the steam and yeah, two streaks of three rounds in a row from Dire Wolves in the end. Uh, they just could convert that momentum so well. Yeah, unfortunately, I think uh, probably back to maybe it was round three with a three versus five for Knock Knock that uh, for me started to unravel them a little bit. They had that that upper that upper hand which they uh, they lost, and then they sorely lost rounds after that. Mandy, I think uh, yeah. one of the stats that I'm kind of looking at, uh, which just goes to compound the conversation we had right before we threw. Uh, eight of the 11 engagements that we saw or near on that uh, were won by uh, Direwolf. So just once yeah. again, their early round seems to be on point. Yeah, to be honest, that game, as the rounds went by, it looked more and more TDM. Like, um, especially, I think, yeah, we did end up seeing an attacker sided clubhouse. Uh, clubhouse, sorry. Oh my gosh, we've seen so much clubhouse. A chalet um, in the end today. So yeah, it felt like by the time that Direwolves actually got on the attack, it just... It seemed like they were just abusing the architecture of the map really they were sitting out on all these like windows and cutoffs and taking engagements that when you're on a or when you're on a defender rotation and you're trying to make your way through the map try and take that one versus one you're not always going to be winning it out right because someone's sitting there holding an angle waiting for you um to, to take that fight so yeah i think diewolves as soon as they jumped on that attack off i felt like you said it perfectly right after round three it was only one round that knock knock were able to get after that right really so yeah it just looked like diewolves were very much in control of taking the fights that they needed to Dev, does it change the, the conversation for you at all uh, in regards to Direwolves and, and where they sit? You know, going into this game, I kind of prefaced that maybe uh, maybe they lose this, maybe they lose points from this, and we're talking about a top four, bottom four. Do you think that they're still in that top five discussion, or has it changed a bit for you? Uh, I have spun it a few ways. Coming into this stage, I thought that we would be looking at, like, a top five and then a bottom three with Daystar and the yep. two South Asian teams. I... Unfortunately for Direwolves, I'm thinking that we're now kind of a top four, bottom four scenario. And I think mm -hmm. Direwolves are no longer in that top four. I think they're probably fifth place. Um, Daystar being sixth and then seventh, eighth being... Nasib Warriors probably in eighth and then Knock Knock here obviously in seventh. 
Yeah, I I think that Diwolves obviously even being top six means that they'll make playoffs. But yes. I just I do think that like those third versus I, I think it's three will play six and then four will play five is typically how the seeding right. works. I think those matches are going to be sadly quite one sided in favor of the third and fourth seeds, whoever it ends up being, whether it's Elevate or Jolita or Fury. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just think that Diwolves, even if they make playoffs, like they, they need to form up quite a bit before we get to those BO3s. Otherwise, unfortunately, it'll be really hard for them to actually make those qualification games. Yeah, the, uh, the, the game changes quite a bit once we get to playoffs. But we do have longtime Diwolves player, Souffle, on the line. Souffle, how are you, my friend? Hi, <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> I want to I want to kickstart this. Uh, these were this was a really important game for you. The the three points now kind of puts you back into that playoffs conversation and and cements you a little bit. How are you feeling after that match? Uh, I feel amazing. <laughs> <laughs> was it? Let me uh, let me just ask you. Did you expect it yeah. to be so close? No, we we expect to seven zero. Hmm. I think we expected expect that too. Seven, seven. <laughs> uh, Dev, uh, hi Souffle. Your next match, you play Jolita Esports. Uh, do you think this is going to be hard? Do you think that you can beat them? Because in the past, it was very hard for you guys to play No Cap R six. They beat you when they were called that previous name. Uh, so, yeah, do you think you can beat Jolita? Mm, yes, maybe. Uh, Thai game, you know, Thai. Mm. Mandy? Yeah, I wanted to ask you about what the energy is like in the team. We've got a lot of players that are new to the region that we don't know super well. So I wanted to ask you, like, are you guys like a hype kind of team? Or have you got more quiet players on the team? What's it been like for you guys in the server? Mm, half, half. Uh, half, half. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to. <laughs> no, no, half, half. I mean, look, to be honest, Die Wolves are, are currently uh, in that conversation uh, of uh, obviously playoffs, but things uh, things may still change, Souffle. Uh, look, thank you very much for joining us here, mate, and uh, best of luck for the rest of the matches. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Hi, Souffle. I'm going to be honest, Rob. So, I, I feel bad for the guy. I don't think he understood a word of what we were saying. No, no. That's why I tried to keep it as, as simple as I could. I was... Uh, Not his we, fault. We, we, Not his fault. We, we have to test. You've got to test the waters. You know, it, obviously, it's... You know, we're, we're talking about a completely different region here. So, we're going to test the waters with the interviews at the very least. But, look, Souffle has been a part of this team for a very long time. And he's garnered my respect over the many years that we've seen him. So, you know... Man of sh man of very few words. Uh, I think we got uh, seven o yes, no, maybe, and half half out of him. But uh, yeah. you know, it's it's all about getting them on and getting their faces. Well, I was gonna say their faces seen. We couldn't even see. You got to see like the quarter there. of his face. I, yes, I was gonna ask, yes. but like he he had in in his background on his green screen like someone else's face. I it was too zoomed in. I couldn't quite check who it was. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I. He had some spirit, even though we couldn't necessarily get a lot of words out of him. He had a lot of spirit. He did. He did. And look, to be honest, I think that that's always been a, a hallmark of Die Wolves. And Mandy, I think it was a very valid question of, you know, what is the team like? Is it quiet? Is it rowdy? Because, mm. you know, from, from what it seems like in the player camps, it's actually hard to get a bit of a gauge on that. Yes, that's what I'm saying, right? Like, when you think about the old Die Wolves roster, like the one with, like, Jackie Wu on it, those guys were, yeah. like, super hype. They had, like, so much energy. They were really in it. Whereas, like, this iteration of Die Wolves, super hard to get a read on these guys. Like, they, like, really poker face once they're in the server you can't tell if they're having an amazing time or if they're just there and they're i don't know really it's really hard yeah. to tell well i think it's you know it, it probably goes to to show uh and probably speaks volumes as to where they are at the moment maybe dev it feels like die walls are still finding themselves as a team mm. yeah very much so i think that the roster changes have been beneficial in some ways right like joe gore for example absolute machine real fragger uh but I don't think that we've ever seen Direwolves like regain the team synergy that they had back in the uh, the days before Reaps and ED left, and you know, it's been a hell of a long time since then. 
but they've really struggled to like look like a unit ever since then. And every now and then, one of the players has a life game, like PK going yeah. and six, PK. right? Ninety-one percent wow. cost, five multi kills. That's insane. We've had yeah. similar from Joe Gore before as well. But that's not the same as having like a well-rounded team. You know, when you watch Bleed play. You're not expecting mm. Turtle to get 20 kills a game. You're not expecting Reaps nope. to get 20 kills a game. In fact, that one of the storylines we've been hammering on about this stage is how Reaps has actually been quite a quiet player. It's funny because he's mm. meant to be like the, the APAC bolo or whatever. And <laughs> it just goes to really emphasize the point that everyone always says, which is that Rainbow Six is a team game and the best teams don't need hero players. They need to be a unit. And unfortunately, I think Diwolves are quite a way away from that. And it's been yep. a long time that they, like, their progress as a team has really uh, kind of just stalled out and they're cruising at the moment. I'm not saying that's for a lack of effort or anything. I don't know the dynamics of the team, but they are struggling to level up. And I think Jolita is a perfect example. Jolita have been getting better and better and Direwolves, uh, I think, are struggling to catch up. If Daystar start improving, I think Direwolves you know, might even struggle to qualify for playoffs in future stages. Well, it could get really tight, but, you know, for now, they've got two games left. Diables play Jolita and then play Elevate in their last two play days. So they've really got two games left to convince us that the best of ones were just, you know, a bit of a mere mistake in the early opening uh, portions of this stage. However, it is time for our final match. Before we get there, a quick break.
Final match of the night, and uh, this is where I wish I could say things get interesting, but I think we're still going to see somewhat of a uh, replica of how tonight has indeed gone. Hasib, now take on Elevate, and look, Elevate, second place at the moment. They're looking pretty good, Dev. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so this match is the third best team in the region versus the eighth best team in the region. Third best, you say, Dev. Yes, even though Elevator currently sitting in second, they got 7 0 by Fury, and Fury did have a slow start, but I am convinced that Fury will actually overtake Elevate's second seed. Now, in order to guarantee that they get second seed, these guys need every bloody point that they can get, and that includes this one today. This point is not even like, oh, they really need it. This is like a given. It's a failure not to get this point. And then they play Bleed tomorrow, and that is almost not possible to get any points from that game if anyone can do it maybe it's these guys and they got diewolves on their final day they need to maximize their points out of those games because they dropped the ball against fury like the onus yeah. is on them but they're lucky because fury also dropped the ball and only got one point against jolita so the door is ajar to make that second place uh, confirmation the buy in the playoffs there's a chance that they can retain that spot but of course yeah. they need every round they can and dominating in this game is that's just it right like it's it, it's really tough for elevate at this point because their backs are up against the wall but the beautiful thing is when your backs against the wall the only way you've got is forward so they're gonna have to go through Hasib, and then they're gonna have to back it up tomorrow uh against bleed and it's just gonna have to keep on snowballing out of control for them to keep that second spot however Hasib, they really need something to walk away with right now mandy it is not looking good the only team without a single win throughout the entirety of this stage yeah, I don't. I think the other big red flag for these guys as well is even against the the other South Asian team of Knock Knock, they weren't able to um, find the win against them either. So yeah, for her sub worries, it's looking pretty grim at the moment on the standings, and I think that they're still pretty much winless against not only the South Asian teams but the Southeast Asian teams as well. And yeah, I suppose the trend is continuing uh, so far from 2023. These guys have looked pretty down in the dumps at the moment, and I think there needs to be like massive changes for them to even look competitive against a team like Elevate. Yeah, competitive is really probably the the word that I would stray away from when looking at this match. Isn't that right, Dev? Like, yeah, you know, you really are. Th this is a a journey for Hasib that I think needs to start now for stage two. Yeah, very much so. Uh, there's only one direction, which is up. Uh, all there is to disband and, and leave or not qualify for the league next time. That would be pretty devastating. I really hope that the direction that they move is up. Uh, it's been a challenge and this is going to be such a hard game like elevate when they dominate they dominate like when they are playing well they run away with it and we saw that in their opening game against knock knock of course uh Hasib's warriors are from the same uh part of the world as them uh and yeah it was a 7-1 there they also 7-1 day star in their most recent play day last week uh, elevator super fired up after losing the fury and i think this yeah. is going to be a really hard one for Hasib's warriors so let's hope they get a map they want yeah, I mean, what map do they even want? We're going to Chalet, aren't we? We're going to Chalet. We're, oh, we're going, going to Chalet. To chalet. No! no! Oh, God, I'm so sick of this no. map. I am so sick of this map. It is now hey. the eighth time it has been played. Hey, if you're Hasib's Warriors right. right now, you've got some balls. Like, you just saw Elevate <laughs> 7 Damn. 1 Daystar on this last play day, yeah. and you're like. Yeah, yeah, we're going to ban Clubhouse, which, by the way, is, like, not the greatest map for Elevate. And we're actually going to, yeah, I don't know. I, I think this is an absolute throw from Hasib's Warriors going to Chalet instead of Clubhouse. Like, Clubhouse is Hasib's best map, but they did really struggle against Jolita. So maybe they just, like, got absolutely, like, shafted by Jolita 7-2 <laughs> last play day, and they're like, no, 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 we can't go to Clubhouse. Let's go to Chalet, even though we also lost that to Die Wolves. Just, you know, the week before. Oh, and Elevator, insanely good on Chalet. This is going to be a massive, massive task. And uh, yeah. I'm going to call it 7-1. Elevate. Mandy, quick one. 7-1, seven, 7-2. One, seven, what do you call uh, I reckon it could very easily go 7-0 here, to be honest. Um, yeah, I think this is pretty grim, this one. Uh, that is well, all. Uh, Elevate yeah. look good. <laughs> Yeah, Elevate do look good. Jeez, the desk has no hope in this game. Hopefully we can find some on the casting desk. No, no, there's no hope. In fact, right now, 7.6 million channel points to just 1 million to Hasid Warriors, which is, I guess, their loyal army. Um, 
Unfortunately, you know, this, this is very much being a stage where, like Asia League playoffs, yesteryears, the APAC South years, it's been utter dominant in comparison to South Asia. This is just yet another test for a South Asia team to see if they can get an upset, which would be a monumental one, especially now over to Chalet against an Elevate roster that has certainly though been a little up and down when we think that they're looking great while they go and get 7-0'd by Fury. Then we think they're vulnerable and then they go and demolish Daystar 7-1 on this very map. So why aren't we going to this very map? I've got no idea. And Sib Warriors have elected. And Sib Warriors are like, you know what? That 7 1 game against Daystar, fluke. They're, they're a shocking shallow team. Let's go back there and, just, and see how we go. I, I just don't understand it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, ultimately, I think at the end of the day, map in a matchup like this, where, where it is a mismatch of sorts, it's probably not going to be that relevant. Um,. So, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't read into it too much. And I think, honestly, but going into this kind of game, both teams are focusing very much on themselves as opposed to directly countering their opposition at this kind of portion of the league anyway. It's all about uh, self-improvement and uh, extracting what you can from this particular matchup. Now, in terms of bands, we see the Brava and the Montang off the board. I don't know if this has been mentioned by anyone throughout the night, so I apologize if this is a repeat, but... Actually, during the most recent bug patch last night, Shields have actually been given a pretty significant buff um, in an attempt to fix the melee damage which was lower than it should have been um, they've now buffed that and so you could two tap anybody with a punch and barbed wire can now be two tapped as well so something to keep in mind as we go forward especially if we see the likes of a blitz or a fuse shield in this matchup but uh, yeah fun time to be a shield player although we are frequently seeing it banned out so maybe not Yeah, I mean, to be fair, it's either banned out or used, right? So, we'll see if that's going to be impactful. Not in this game. Montaigne gets banned out. Could still see the Blitz. Attackers need to locate Does sometimes get used on Snow White. We've got a bar. And games to open things up in this opening round. Hissed Warriors on the defense. Now, they have played Chalet once before this stage. Not too surprising, considering everyone, I think, at this point, has played Chalet once this stage, it's been by far and away the most played map. They played it all the way back on Play Day 2, lost it out to Direwolves. They also started on the defense in that particular game, only getting two defensive round wins and then only able to find the one attacking round, losing at 7 3. So, already a bit of a change up as well for Alibi. Maybe not anticipating bar games to be the opening round. They change it up the whole way through. And we'll bring the Habana along with the Thatcher in response to the uh, Kaid. Little spawn peak from his oh. Wow, that was sharp, though. I mean, that's one way if you're gonna maybe set the tone nice and early for Hasib Warriors. And Haikal losing his life on the line, so no E1Ds and a great opening kill. And that was yeah, incredibly sharp and quick. Yeah, good uh, shot through the tree line there. And Haikal not given an opportunity to mount much in the way of a response and not uh, a tradable position. As, of course. Hasib able to escape quite quickly. So pressure now on Elevate. Um, we'll see how they fight from behind. It's often a challenge on attack to find win conditions, to isolate picks. Can't be as reliant on trading early on. You really do need to find a dominant part of the map that you can exploit. So we'll see what that ends up being. Uh, MC has the diffuser over towards the library bulk, but eyes elsewhere on speak easy. A play who certainly a couple of years ago, we'd be sprucing up to be the one to find a pick back. And while he may have cooled off a little bit in that department recently, still a phenomenal player with a lot of experience. Information spotted library stairs. Speak easy may try to creep in and cut that off, but needs to be mindful of dining. Line of sight established, as well as the proxy, but it doesn't matter. Still wins the fight. Taha down. And there is the 4v4 equilibrium established. Only seconds remaining in the round. Already a bit of library stairs control as well for Alivate and... With the sentry from Speakeasy over towards the mezzanine. No one in towards office. Default take it out. And top library in control. Quite a bit of time as well remaining in this round. But Ape loses his life. Templo Doctor. And still holds a nitro cell inside of Barstock. I mean, this actually gives the Sib Warriors a, a really big part in this round. That, that needs to be cleared out. And he has a big piece of utility. But his Sib wants peace over towards dining. Losing his life to Speakeasy. Going for a flank. 
Not the worst kind of flank. Once Mezzanin top layer rip control has been established for the attacking team, it can be very influential for a defender to get themselves into a, a back facing position, but loses his life. Good awareness from Speakeasy. Imagine they had a, a flank watch drone, of which only two drones remain. MC and Shed both with one apiece. And another player over towards the dining side, spotted. Shot through the wall, 38 seconds. With that, they have the information. There's only two on site. One in towards Barstock. And it's a double kill. They know the last player's in dining. It's a three versus one. You can get plant half wall if you want. I don't think they're electing to do that. They still had more than enough time to get it over to a default plant position, but they will happily just put it down in towards Bart. And Elevate have done a really good job of honestly taking this round, unless Edux can honestly do something quite miraculous in a 1v3 post plant. Retake, flash available still for Shed on the Habana. Over towards fire place, one to the doorway. It is Shed. And Elevate bring back the round. Yeah, that's why you just kind of count them out of those rounds. Um, yes, a really good spawn pick off the bat from Hasib, but then speak easy. So I would creep fireplace, get one back, um, despite, you know, the line of sight and the proxy still wins it. So then 4v4, they then isolate pick so elsewhere. They identify that there was a player off site towards dining. So they flood the site, win those ones, force the retake in the 1v3. Uh, there's never going to be a, a Hasib round in that post. So good work from Elevate. And it does... I guess induce a little bit of fear that, that if Hisip don't win the entry or don't get a spawn peak or don't win the early fight, that it's going to be much more difficult, even more difficult for them to find rounds. Yeah, I mean, the opening kill was great. How many times can you do that, though? That's the, the question for me. Hisip wants peace. I mean, he hits a really nice shot. They get an opening kill. They also got another really good kill on site, courtesy of Doctor. That got them back the band advantage. Tried the double flank from dining, didn't quite work. Elevate were, yeah, switched on. Player in bar stock eventually couldn't get a kill, which is a very big power position on bar games. But really well worked from Elevate, especially at that disadvantage. Didn't have the lion at any point. And so we go towards kitchen and dining for this second round. Extension up above. Tuber out, Mirror, Castle, Barricade, Maestro, and Valk. I mean, across the board, it just says we're going to bunker down. If there's going to be a room, I'm not too sure of where it's going to come from. Maybe the castle, once you place those proxy alarms and the barricades. Taha as well, I guess. Anyone with utility that's pre-placed and, and then shut up shop and, and rotate off. Barricade, I imagine, will be you know, on this bedroom window, then in towards piano. Claymore towards trophy. So far, no opening kill for the Sib Warriors this time around. So you two being a chipped, uh, chipped away quite nicely here by Elevate to kick things off, five versus five. And so now we get to test Hasib's proficiency with uh, all 10 members alive still inside of the server. Good drone work. I'm assuming it was in Heikel. I think we've got the uh, the card bug. So might be a little bit more challenging to work out. Either way, definitely him on the repel currently. Elsewhere Shed. Frag grenade onto that castle barricade. Deals with a bit of utility. Able Ooh, to good swing. swing. Good pick. And Zedux down, but a good trade. Decent work there from Taha. But two picks elsewhere. Again, Elevate able to steamroll these small advantages. Now there's a Sib and Dini in the, in the two versus four. Yeah, still have info. So Valkyrie's still up. You can see Doctor and Taha both were on those. Unfortunately, though, Hasib wants peace. No info towards Trophy Stairs. A little... Bit of a slow push there, and Diddy now just kind of on an island down below in the hallway position, waiting. I imagine for someone to either come through hatch or push down trophy stairs. Trying to see if he can just time them on the peak. I mean, doing the due diligence that MC doesn't have to solo push this. Has got one more Candela available. They know he's deep inside a kitchen. Yellow pink information. And it does spot a leg. Honestly, had every kind of chance up close with the super short. It does find one, but and high Kel. Clearly able to just overpower this position in towards kitchen and they find themselves another round win and a tactical pause called immediately by Hasib Warriors. Not happy with the way things have started here against Elevate. Now remember as well, guys, as much as we still think of Chalet, has always been this kind of map that attacking teams can very much find rounds. This region, it is 60% defensive sided. So already Elevate have been able to amount the amount of rounds they've really needed to get, which is two. And they've still got four more rounds to add on to that. 
This may be the earliest tactical timeout in the history of uh, Rainbow Six. No, it's probably not. It definitely wouldn't be, but... Uh... It definitely isn't. <laughs> <laughs> but it does feel very, very early into the piece. Wait, there was almost one the other day that, that was called before the game started, if you remember. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I mean, I, I don't dislike it. I feel like, especially defensively, if you get off to the, a poor start and lose the first two rounds on arguably the two primary sites, it, things are already starting to look quite dire. So you may as well send a bit of a Hail Mary now, have the tactical, use the minute to quickly talk about what everyone's thinking, feeling, what, what's been going wrong. Uh, maybe they've, you know, g gone astray from whatever their game plan was and they need to correct course. You may as well do that now. There's no point losing four defensive rounds and a half and then calling it or waiting until even the second half. By then it's far too late. I mean, the, the numbers, if we're purely going on numbers, indicate that two rounds on attack, generally speaking, is the benchmark. So his sim need to basically be the roadblock from this point onwards and we'll see if the tactical timeout is enough to salvage this half. Yeah. And competitiveness is still key, I think, for Hasib Warriors. And we... I remember saying, at least at the start of the stage, that this stage in particular was always going to be rough for Hasib and Knock Knock especially. And I guess it's turning out for Daystar as well. That you're coming into a region that's already quite developed, that has quite a very good top level. We've seen what Fury Bleed have been able to do internationally, and now there's only one major slot. It makes things more tense, tighter, tougher, and the playoffs are going to be such a, a different level. But this should be considered a learning stage for Hisib Warriors and Knock Knock. I know they've played against these teams. We've done plenty of Asia playoffs before, but to regularly be part of this main league, it's still quite fresh. And I think that the goal next stage will be to make playoffs. This stage is really about what can you gain. In terms of that learning experience, pressure from Hasib. Top library, drop down, makes his way out of game safely. It's always going to be very difficult games though, and yeah, proven again here as the elevators started really strong on Chalet, looking for their fourth win of the stage from five games. It's been a really solid stage for this new look elevate roster. Yeah, and I definitely wouldn't discount Elevate from entering that playoff bracket as being a little bit of a dark horse potential. I don't think anyone is going to go in ahead of Bleed as the favourite, unless something dramatic were to happen. But they could certainly pitch themselves as a team to... I mean, there's even a world in which they uh, finish second, get that favourable seeding as well. That could make things very, very intriguing. In fact, if they are to win tonight in regulation, they have more than half a chance. It's two-thirds. Um... And I think it's actually ahead of Fury by you know, quite a significant margin, in fact. So that would be intriguing. But as for this round, in isolation, minute 30, so at the midway point. Long, vertical lines of sight established off the back of the Boogie Auto Breacher. Flank caught, so good work. They had a read on that. Arpe over towards the Piano Belk to find that one for free. Got to find a response. Uh, at this point, you probably do go for a flank roam and see if you can get a bit fortunate, catch someone a little bit off guard and bring it back to a four on four, then maybe play sight. Especially when it's Snow Wine, you do very much want to roam above, get bodies up above, deny the vert, go for flanks, especially through main lobby and then towards fireplace stairs. The Sib wants a piece, kind of just stuck in blue and high cal over towards bot library. A lot of droning as well from Elevate, getting as much information as possible. I mean, they are expecting some kind of flanking position. Again, more drones going in towards that dining and Doctor shoots one out. Which honestly, that's pretty good. That's perceived pressure here from his Sib Warriors and Doctor. Shoots it out, it says to them, hey, there, there is someone actually lurking, dining. Got to be mindful of a back push. Shed going for the plant, flash out from speakeasy to just try and block the mirror window, but Doctor's push is unsuccessful. Harpe was watching the whole time, slip in towards Snow from his Wants piece out of blue, but caught at the shelf. And the round continues to just fall apart. They cannot even win a single gunfight and high call. That was a clean shot from Bot Library stairs deep into blue. Does lose his life to Z Ducks, but then traded immediately from Shed. Three rounds for Elevate off the back of the tactical timeout from his Warriors. Unfortunately, no real change in the way that these rounds have looked. Yeah, they're just looking clean and consistent on different parts of the map and at different phases of the round as well. They're not really making a ton of mistakes that can be exploited. 
I mean, there was the spawn peak round one in isolation, but they recovered from that. Since then, again, in that most recent round, free kill, flank watch, a lot of the vert established, then good pressure and timing in towards site. And it does spell a pretty disastrous game now for Hasib, unfortunately. We know the numbers around tactical timeouts, teams um, all across the world at all kinds of events typically get a relatively significant boost in, in some instances, op opportunity or chance uh, to get success in the following round. So third round there, off the back of the attack, we're expecting Hasib to be able to produce a result and a sorely needed one for that third round rotation doesn't come through and now it really amplifies the rest of this match as being very difficult for them to bring back and at any point if they gain momentum and elevate feel uncomfortable they'll just be able to uh bring out their tactical timeout to store and it's difficult we want to try and play devil's advocate and try and find at the very least, some positives for you know, Hasib Warriors and, and Knock Knock in the previous game were honestly far easier to find those uh, positive comments considering the way that they were actually playing. It was 4 4 scoreline. This looks a little bit more one sided to begin with. Unfortunately, we'll see if uh, they can turn it around. Still three more rounds in the half. Did once piece you can see. I think to me, pretty evident has been trying to find opening kills has been trying to get involved the only kill he found was that opening round spawn peak since then though shut down four deaths in a row and high cal nicely done on the bed bedroom repel and elevate have got themselves yet another opening kill and another advantage here drop down from z ducks just try and get away from position did he call from behind unfortunately this is turning into a bit of a massacre here in chalet and sib warriors just at no point in these rounds have been able to Offer much of a challenge. Elevate have looked really clinical. Well, Doctor to shoot out the Candela, and that may help him hold this position for a little while longer. But the plant going down, his flank being watched on said repel. 3v5, 40 seconds on the fuse here for Hasib in what feels like, again, another very important round for them, and they might be able to win it out. Whoa. 2v3. 1v3. What? And it's a team effort as well. Down to just end high Kel gets one, two to go in this retake situation. Taha off of the defuse once again, not it, but now dead. And Z Ducks with a nitrosol. He's going for the counter defuse instead. Could have tried to throw that out. And high Kel should spot him. Double tap, headshot on the second. A 1v3 post plant win for N high Kel. And you just have to wonder. Was there a world in which Hasib Warriors could have played that a little different? There was a Nitrosol available. There was three players up in that moment. Were they rushed for time? Could have easily Nitroed the play on the Repel and won that round. Instead, a lot of focus on just trying to stick the counter defuse. Yeah, Taha was on it for a pretty extended period of time. I'm not entirely sure how long was left um, when he fell off. I think it would have been about two seconds. Could he have stuck it? Uh, potentially. It was a pretty rough angle to land. Uh, we'll have a look at the replay package. I mean, the fact that it was even brought back to a winnable situation was insane, considering it was a 5v3. So here we are. Taha sticks. Three seconds, two seconds. He gets lit up. Yeah, so he couldn't actually stick it in that scenario. If he did, he was pretty much dead to rights. Zedox, they had to cover with a gun. And you mentioned Nitro in pocket. That Nitro there had to have been expended. There is no world in which that Nitro should be left in the pocket of that defender um, with the round concluded. Oh, well, that was certainly an opportunity. Good fight back from the Sim Warriors, but unable to go the distance and get themselves their first round. Nicely done from N. Heikel on the repel. Very easy to panic in that situation as well, but yeah, honestly, looked very, very calm. Hold his repel position. Never even looked like he wanted to make his way in. Understood he had very much the right spot to be in. And the spawn peak attempt for Hasib Warriors, Taha, outside piano window. We see the glass. A couple of smokes as well. I do wonder if this is going to be a dining side push now from Elevate in the fifth round.
So we'll see the Glaz brought out then for this one, and uh, with Smoke's Pocket, we'll see what kind of an impact that may have. Flores as well, in combination with Ash for explosives as well, so good counterplay on to the likes of both the Castle Barricades, the Fenry Mines as well. Speak easy. Already looking to deal with said barricades, and that's early pressure in towards office. It looks like it'll be a sweep across from Library for Elevate. Relatively uncontested, so it's pretty simple control. Fully reinforced off from that piano hall position is the defense. MC the first to look to break that. He's got the hard breach on the thermite, just mindful of his flank at the moment. Elsewhere, we can see in the bottom right in the pip as well. Flores Rotero drones being used to chip away at util barbed wire west main, so that flank watch potential opened up. The talk about opening up the round, it's speak easy again. Z Ducks, one of the star players for Hasib. He's had some really good moments, some really good matches in the stage so far. Hasn't been able to find himself in this game yet. In the 90 seconds, and again playing from behind. It's been a common theme, unfortunately, for Hasib wants. I was going to say Hasib wants peace. Well, he's not the. The whole team, as in Warriors. And down in towards main lobby and trying to see if they can get themselves any kind of information on the dining side. Take easy already at fireplace, trying to just see if there's anyone close, and there is. There's an easy pressure point though, once you open this up with the exothermic, as long as they can uh, deal with the mute jammer. Okay, just slinking down below, so if he does go for the hatch to get out, then he's going to basically die. And this will deal with the jammer and the sidewall with Selmers too. 40 seconds. The simple one's piece takes a big chunk of damage. I imagine through that drone hole. It's all the shots there. Good POV. Hatch being watched as well down below. We can clearly see our fate right down there. But no one tucked in on the right side. So no hatch exit. It has been cleared. 25 seconds left. Smoke goes up. This is the big win condition now for Elevate. Off the back of the glass. And Enhai Cal does open up his account with a double kill. One up above. Uh, F not mine though. A little bit tricky there for up and Does bring it to a three on two. No denial onto MC. The plant has been successfully put down. And with that, Hasib wants peace. Is now also going to clear back up above. Elevate have got themselves the vert. And he's just straight onto the side though. Aware. And basically saying to Dinny, you're going to have to win this by yourself. He does put himself into a good position to challenge the glass. And Haikal falls all the way back to the mezzanine. Smartly done, doesn't take the close contact fight. He drops, knowing that the glass is no longer in position. Well, wow. the glass is in a position to shoot you from the dining side. Just drops down completely thinking that the glass, what is he gonna do? Just stay in library? Yeah, I mean, that was really well played by Enheikel. He certainly gets the plaudits in that round. He played a critical role up above while the plant was going down and the smokes were deployed and covering that and protecting the vert. While the plant was going down, and then the post as well. Played that role really well. Peeled off immediately after the first contact. Sense that he wouldn't be able to win that fight. And he knew that he had the additional condition of then playing top five play stairs, having the angle in towards the objective. Then was able to execute that correctly and get both kills at the end. So really well played from him. I don't know entirely how much of it was facilitated by the Glaz. There may have been an impact up above. Um, depending on if the smokes were deployed, I think it was hard to see. But certainly positionally, um, really mastered that round. And... Uh, yeah, it's now a 5-0 lead for Elevate. Yeah. Defense is ready. Hard to imagine that Hasib Warriors are going to be able to bring it back from here. That Zedox or is that Nico? Five seconds to He's also got some house issues. <laughs> 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 well, it's been a great game from Ed Heikel. He's been the, the clear standout, 11 and 2. Has not really put a foot wrong. Neither has his team, though. There's a hole for Elevate. To find their fourth win of the stage. We put them certainly in a great position going into the final two play days ahead of the playoffs with this win. It's always a bit of a danger game. You never know how these South Asia teams are going to operate. And clearly, they've just been far too good on Chalet. Bar games. For the final round of this opening half. Again, this is a 60% defensive side map in Southeast Asia. And Sip Warriors so far unable to find a singular round on the defense. Dini tucked in on the library side. Now, there is the Kappa Tout. So he can get certainly flamed out of this position if MC can get himself into a position. And get an incendiary over to there. Taha taking a fight towards dining. Here comes the bolt from MC. Now, 
Don't know if I've seen it. I don't know if N. Hykel's on the other window to watch for the cross. He is. There we go. Frag grenade's thrown. It does make a drop down. In that moment, do you need the frags and the incendiary? I feel like one is fine. The other to then watch and said no one had their gun up. So he makes it down the hatch. Mm. Do, they, do they even know? Well, he's been droned out now. Now they know. Uh, no one had their gun. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess at least at minimum they flushed it, but... Kill would have been a nice addition. Elsewhere, Util dump over towards the library stairs. That deployable shield vacated quite quickly, and so Elevate have this immediate control already uncontested, 5v5. Now they're lurking in dangerous positions, so Hesip have to be really mindful here that they don't uh, expose to these angles. Unfortunately, they probably have a read on them, at least not immediate information. They do those have that Fenry and Legion combo in play. Once again, another opening kill for Alivate. Took a little longer though. Only 60 seconds remaining in the round. Doctor's low. So is Taha. Nice kill again from Shed. Su in this round. Both kills have gone his way. An incredible individual effort, but so far it's the team of Alivate that looks so strong. He does come that little mid-round fight back, but it was a very short-lived fight back. Only the one kill. Nice to dump Doctor Bot Library stairs to get the down to Shed, but Ape was above, and it's six to nothing. You did say at the very beginning of this night, guys, maybe we would finish before one. Not far off it. 108. <laughs> and this one is looking done and dusted. Yeah, if it wasn't for Direwolves having a bit of an off night, I think I would have actually unironically been right. But that's, uh, yeah. I, didn't, I, I genuinely didn't want to believe Mandy on the desk before when she said 7-0. <laughs> I kind of chuckled to myself and I was like, okay, man, you're trolling right now. Like, you, you, you're just BMing her sib. But, um, I mean, there's everyone in which she is correct, especially with Elevate now transitioning over to the defensive side here on Chalet. Attackers Outclassing their opponents. Big bolster for round diff as well. So, something to Attackers very much keep in mind. Elevate are now trolling. <laughs> No, nah, no, nah, they're good. They're all good. Oh, no, then it's a lot of rehosts. They are literally trolling. That's why I said they are trolling. Yeah, I know. But I'm just saying they're all, they're, they're going to start now. They're fine. They're not that trolly. I hope they miss out on top two by one round because they lose this round because they trolled. Wouldn't that be a storyline? But maybe that's a little bit mean to say. I think it certainly is a little bit mean to say. You can't say that. Kind of thing. Sorry, I'll take that back. I don't want to be too negative. Yeah, just retract that statement. I retract it. Oh, this is a... Pixel of an angle from Shed. <laughs> Gonna get motion sickness. Oh, spots him. Headshot. Oh, that down. was sharp. Oh, yeah, clean. Yuck. Can you find another one here from top library? Is anyone oh. gonna get in the building? That's the question for this round. Does anyone What's get inside? What's the over under on getting inside the building? Well, you could just uh, run inside. He's got the RAUs. Did he take the fight? Oh. No, he also loses that one down to two, two players left. remaining. And Taha trying to win this on the glass. Surely he does. One on the roof, one outside in the snow. And honestly, at this point, wouldn't be surprised if Alivate just start vaulting windows and go running around. There's another kill. So Zedux has the solo to take the battle. Over towards bathroom. There is that vault out from Alpe. It's like a classic ranked experience now. Everyone's just going to start sending it at the solo. <laughs> No one stepped inside the building yet. That's the again, that's the big storyline in this round. Will anyone make it inside? Looks like his sim will get rezzed. I think they, they have, do. They have plenty of time. Surely. I'm still taking this fight outside. Oh, here we go. Into mud. Into mud? Oh, oh. On the rebel. They're teasing us. Just get in the building. Elevator just backed off. Not quite swinging these. These windows, look how worried they are, though. Library, entry, drone. Sib wants peace, of course, very low on health, so... Any kind of entry does need to be scanned pretty carefully. z Ducks to oh. make entry into top library. There's no one here. Oh, oh. And he's in. Oh, he's in. Bravo. He is in the building. Two versus four. <laughs> and as much as we meme, certainly a, a round that can be won. It's going to take a mighty effort, though. Gonna take everything that Xenox has got, along with her Civ One's piece. 
Elevator just backed off. They like are they even in the server? I'm starting to question if Elevator's even in the map right now. <laughs> I don't think they've moved. I don't think they've literally they have moved, not moved for the last for minute. Like a minute. Nah, they're oh, frozen. No. <laughs> we are watching as Sim just clear. There's 30 seconds left. As soon as they drop, they're basically gonna die. It's you know, like hell watching in kitchen. They still haven't moved. The question will be now is like, will <laughs> elevate move? Oh, there we go. Oh, okay. Shed Chef. ruins okay. it. Oh, that was a short lived question. One in Harry Potter as well. On the trophy stairs. C Ducks makes his presence known. 15 seconds remaining. Let's see if to check the right angle. Deployable shield. How does he deal with that? He does not. And hi, Cal. MC. And they say GG. A swift 7 0 from Elevate. Close out this game against Hasib Warriors. Making short work of the team from South Asia who still find themselves winless. Bottom of the standings with two play days to go for his Zip Warriors. They now must win their last two games. For Elevate, they collect all three points and are back into second. Yeah, really clean speed run there from Elevate. And I feel like I've been doing this for a long time and I've never seen a I round like that. I have I never seen I have never seen the the statue strat into the spawn peak, into the almost no one makes it into the map, back into the stat, uh, the statue strat. Um, yeah, I'm that sorry, was a game. Sib. I'm just going to apologize. I'm just sorry. Yeah, I, I feel, feel bad really, really bad. That was um, that was rough. Credit to Elevate. Of course, they were far too good, and I'm very curious to see how Elevate are going to perform. Of course, tomorrow they'll be taking on Bleed. That's a well, completely different game, completely different experience. We'll see how Elevate go tomorrow against Bleed. Of course, that's us done for the night. We'll throw it back to the desk, and they can sign things off. Thank you very much for watching. We will catch you tomorrow <laughs> night. Oh wow, that was um, that was a very interesting match. The problem is, it's really like j just to preface this uh, for people watching at home. I know it probably seems like we're being jolly, but there's no other way to be when games like this happen. There is really so like there, there is no words that can describe it in a broadcast manner that will help digest any of this information but we've got to try at the very least yeah. i mean let let's let's keep it elevate based for now um hasib warriors obviously we said that you know that they, they really need to be looking to stage two now that's they need the competitive experience against these teams so that's good they're going to be able to continue to do that for two more play days uh but really dev elevate just completely on another stratosphere yeah i don't think i've ever seen a game that dominant before Especially by the end of it, like not even getting in the building, basically. Pretty close to the most dominant game of Siege you can possibly have. Um, start, there were some okay moments. That 3v1 defuse was pretty shameful, uh, really rough. Like, yes, Enhaikul played it really well, but it's a uh, really hard watch for poor Hasib Warriors. And I, I, I'm kind of on the same wavelength as Zenoff does. Like, I just feel bad for him. Um, but yeah. yeah, they need to get points against teams like Knock Knock and A Star. Maybe even Direwolves, but yeah, I don't think that's realistic. On the flip side, as you said, for Elevate, right? Next match is Bleed. That's one where they could themselves get 7 0 Like, they really yeah. need to be on their best behavior <laughs> for that game because we know yeah. what it looks like when they're not, uh, when they got 7 0 by Fury. <laughs> a lot of 7 0s, a lot of 7 1s uh, in, the, in the Elevate camp at the moment. And of course, Elevate round off things with Direwolves. Um, at the moment, Elevate are basically fighting Fury for second place. And because both teams will probably lose to Bleed, like, I'm just assuming that Elevate's not going to beat Bleed um, and that they will get zero points from that game. That means that all Elevate actually have to do is get the full three points out of their Diewolves game and they guarantee top two, which means they will jump in the bracket as well in playoffs. So uh, Fury losing their match uh, to Jolita at the start of the season is really going to cost them if Bleed... Uh, sorry, if Elevate continue their form. So that really needs to be their focus, just hacking it out, Continuing their form like that and taking down Diewolves, hopefully even get some points off lead. Mandy, this is, uh, look, you, you could do a Xenox and just say, what is that question, Rob? But uh, I, I do, I do want to ask you this. If you were to uh, just encapsulate tonight in terms of, uh, you know what? Actually, don't even worry about it. We're going to an interview. We'll do this afterwards. Because okay. This is the interview is going to be far more, far more enjoyable than that. Let's welcome in Speakeasy, my friend. Um, for my word uh 7 and that that looked like what happens when i jump in the rank sessions with dev it just doesn't end well uh what a performance i mean that's that's got to feel good
Yeah, it does. I mean, it felt good. Like, um, we obviously prep against them. Like, we know Shelly is, is a map that we can go and, you know, we can be better on the map. And, yeah, yeah I think it shows on the result. Look, Martin, I was going to go and just like full meme it and be like, oh, how did you beat those? That was a really tough game. But actually, instead, I'm going to throw a serious one at you. Next game, lead. Tell me about it. What do you feel? What are you thinking? What are you feeling? What's the prep like going to that game? Realistically, can you get a point off them? What's the likelihood of that happening? Like, would it, what's it going to take for you guys to rock up on the day? Uh, Bleed, if you saw, uh, you know, Mentalist today, he actually said that he was pretty disappointed with how they played, despite them nearly 7 0 in their match as well. So, give me your thoughts. How are you feeling about playing the big dogs? Uh, well, um, basically, tomorrow I think we are fighting for second, first, you know, a, a better seat in the playoff. Mm -hmm. So, it really means a lot for us. So, I think we're, we're going to go out tomorrow, like, pretty, pretty hard. Like, we're not going to hide anything, I think, uh, for playoff. Um, obviously, I can't tell much now, but um, you'll see tomorrow. Hopefully, it's not a very disappointing like show, like Fury. You know, Fury. You know, this this stage Fury always goes back to our mind, like how. But yeah, so yeah, I mean, yeah, please have good players, mentalists, good SV, good Rips, good Hoven. Yeah, you know those those four insane, and uh, yeah, we'll see. What <laughs> not Tetsa. <Tester. laughs> Sorry, ah, he be mean, he right? Deliberate. So, like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Tertster just doesn't get the call out. Everyone else is good, but not Tertster, hey? <laughs> Maybe. Uh, I think I'm going to throw a serious one at you, so I'll uh, speak easy, but on a different vein, I think. Um, so Sando, your coach, mentioned that in your role in the team at the moment is very much like in towards the more tech operators. It's like your specialized operators dealing with specific problems. Not only that, but you've, pick it, you've picked up some of the calling as well for your team. My question for you is, one, have you ever done a lot of calling for your previous teams? How has it felt like going into a more strategic role? And two, at the moment, there are a lot of tools in the game to try and solve these problems. Do you think the adjustment in this current meta has been like easy for you to, to keep up with and keep pace with, or has it been quite challenging? Um, well, calling-wise, it's, it's normal for me. Like, back in IG, back in Nights yeah. as well, like, I was calling as much as I did now, so like, it's not really a change. But like yeah, I agree. Like the matter now, you have to bring more ops, and it's more much diverse. Like it's not really one whole strat that everyone runs right now. It's uh, very very different. So yeah, I think to answer your question, not not much change, but yes to the questions about the ops ops changing. Yeah. Now uh, look, I, I'll keep it short and sweet because I'm going to say that we're going to speak to you one more time before the end of this stage, and that is going to happen whether you like it or not. Uh, what would you like to say before we let you go? Um, thank you for the fans who support us. No true and true. And also eight Mubarak guys. I mean it's uh high raya today as well in Singapore. So yeah. <laughs> thank you. We love it. Well, uh, congratulations on a uh, a big 7-0, mate. It must feel good. And uh best of luck, and I mean this, best of luck in your game against Bleed tomorrow. Thank you so much, guys. Well, if uh, anyone's gonna do it, if anyone's gonna do a number over bleed, uh it honestly in my opinion is going to be elevate mandy and it's probably going to be on the back of a day like today yeah i think so as well elevate they look really serious to be honest i know that's like such a random comment to be making about a team that's like eyeing for top two but they look like a very genuine team to contest i would say even for that top one spot to be honest i think they've taken a little bit to get their like their boots running but i think yeah. now that they're in it they look like they're taking it really seriously not just that but off the back of today's game with bleed and the tone that mentalist set i reckon they've got a real chance at tomorrow and i think if they go into it with a clear mind they could definitely do it now that was actually going to be my question to you, Mandy. And now I'm going to okay. pose it to Dev. <laughs> Dev, do you, like looking looking at back at these games? You know, I I, I don't just want to run over the Fury uh, Daystar or Diewalls game by any means because they've got their own merit. But when we're talking about a boiler pot, when we're talking about tomorrow night's games, the big one that's going to stand out is the Elevate and Bleed number one versus yeah. number two. Yeah. And given what we've seen tonight, is, is that possible? Is it actually possible that we see Elevate come in and, and shock us and stun us? Yes. Uh, I think if anyone's going to do it, it's probably Elevate. I, I think Fury got a li little bit unfortunate like with their slow start to this stage and playing Bleed on Playdate 2. I think maybe Bleed like at the end of the stage, like if Bleed were playing, uh, sorry, if Fury were playing Bleed tomorrow, I think Fury might have a shot. But yeah, of all the teams left, there's no doubt it's only Elevate that's actually got a shot at... Uh, 
at taking a hit at the Kings. Uh, but the thing is, Rob, that like there's, there's such a huge round difference already. So like, for example, right now, Bleed is plus 16. Thank you for yeah. the timing, guys. Bleed is plus 16. Elevate is, uh, is plus 14. Okay, I was looking at old stats, so never mind. This in theory means <laughs> it is possible for Elevate to actually take number one spot. Now, I'll just say number one versus number two doesn't matter a lot. It just depends, like it just affects which third or fourth place team you end up versing in the bracket. But it would yep. be pretty cool for Elevate. It would be a huge boost to morale if they can end up in number one spot. In order to achieve that, all they have to do is get three points from Direwolves in their final game and also get three points from Bleed in their game. Oh, tomorrow. yeah, now, no biggie. All they have to do, right? <laughs> And assuming both of those things happen, then unless if Bleed has like a really good final game where they end up with a better round difference against Daystar and Elevate struggle, um, then yeah, Elevate will be first place. Now it, it probably will come down to round difference if Elevate ends up getting the full three points off of Bleed, and it really yep. could go either way uh, in terms of you know who ends up with better round difference between Elevate playing Direwolves and Bleed playing Daystar. Uh, but yeah, I really wouldn't count Elevate out. And that's funny because I, I really thought that Fury was going to be in the top two this stage. But I, at the moment, I just don't think they've got what it takes unless if Elevate fumble the bag. Like really at this point, it's on Elevate. If they don't make top two at the end of the stage, it's uh, it's absolutely on them. I'm going to make a very quick caveat to that conversation and say that Fury, they've got the best run home possible. Elevate, obviously tomorrow, that's the big test. You beat you beat Bleed, the whole league goes up in flames. The, conversa the complete conversation changes a lot around what Elevate might be able to achieve, Mandy. But it, it does feel like now, I, I think we came into tonight with a top five and a bottom three. Is it fair to say that it's shaping up more like a top four, bottom four? Yep, absolutely. I think it's very much shaped up that way, especially I think with the form that we have seen Direwolves in at the moment. Yeah, yeah I, th I think they do fall into the bottom four, just unfortunately. But I think the flip side of that is that the top four that we've got are like tremendously competitive. I honestly, it's really hard to point to one of those top four and say that they're going to go to the major. I really felt feel like this is going to be a super tight contest once we hit that semi final part of the playoffs because it really feels like on any given day, any team could take it. Also, by the way, well, sorry, side note, but please. we just had Speakeasy, and I forgot to say to him, but congrats on finishing his national service in Singapore. Oh, well. yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, yes. it's, that's uh, quite a big hurdle as a Singaporean player in esports. Yeah. It's, it takes a lot of people out of it. So just, yeah, congrats to him. That's actually a big accomplishment. Yeah, that is, uh, that's absolutely huge. We, uh, we obviously know players that have to come and go as, uh, as those uh, you know, national service uh, calls start to get made so it, it's incredible to see speakeasy back in very very good point to end on mandy because tomorrow night is a big night for elevate a big night for speakeasy they could potentially do the one over on bleed but that's all we've got time for tonight thank you very much for joining us please take care stay safe and good night